Block 3. Something wrong? She quickly shook her head. No, nothing's wrong. Kelly gave her a look. If you don't want to talk about it, that is fine, but please don't lie. Kairu's first impulse was to protest and say she wasn't lying, but she quickly squashed it. Instead she turned away from Kelly and sighed. Okay, maybe something is wrong, but how? Kelly interrupted her. Did I know? Easy. Whatever it is has you unbalanced enough that your mental barrier is slipping. I'm feeling your emotions. She flushed, and a check realized it was true. Somehow Kairu had let the mental shield protecting her mind relax. That was embarrassing. Made worse by the fact that it was an implant responsible for that. Which made her wonder why it was suddenly dropping on her. Things had unsettled her before, and this hadn't happened. With a thought she asked Megumi. Easy. It responds to your subconscious. Deep down, you wanted Kelly to feel what you feel. She immediately protested that, but no further response came from the ship. Suddenly she felt tentacles rubbing her back. Looking over her shoulder, she saw Kelly, who said, I don't know what has you feeling both unsettled and embarrassed. But it's okay, if you want to tell me about it. I'll listen, I promise I won't tell anyone about either. Something told Kairu she was serious about that. But Kairu was not sure where to begin. Kelly did not even know about Megumi, much less her own past or any of what bothered her really. How the hell was she supposed to even begin explaining that? After a moment, she decided maybe she didn't really need to explain everything. Maybe just a little. After more thought she decided to explain only the headset. Kelly had seen it before, but she had told her nothing about it. Um, well you knows that headset I like to wear at night? Yeah, I've seen that strange item what about it? I'm not sure I can tell you how I acquired it, but it's a Solian artifact. It contains a virtual school, and I've found going there rather eliminating. She began, as she moved towards explaining her problems. Kelly listened attentively. She was silent for a few moments after finishing, and then she said, Sounds kind of fun. Think I could join you in there? I don't. She trailed off. As Megumi suddenly informed her it was possible. Then she said, You know if you had asked me, I could tell you exactly why you are regressing back to high school. I'll tell you the details later. But the short answer is your classmates. That told her nothing. But she put that aside. Um, maybe you could. Just why would you? As I said it sounds fun. Besides I've never seen a Solian. It will be interesting. She figured that was fair. Besides it might be interesting to share the experience. Then she remembered that failing grade she had. Her skin flushed, and after a moment she made a mental note not to let Kelly find out she had scored so low on anything. Sighing she changed the subject. I guess we should get that last inspection out of the way. Kelly nodded. Yeah we should. By now the younger children are likely in bed. Not that they actually want to sleep. They never do. Just like the last house. They headed for the door of the last house. As they neared, Kairu could hear some loud moaning coming from the building. She looked up. There was an open window on the second floor. In fact there were quite a few open windows. That was a little unusual. From the sound of it, someone in there was enjoying themselves. Another round of moans. And she commented, Sounds like we have a pair having fun up there. Kelly smiled. It does. Bit of a shame that we have to interrupt, but we have to get this done. A moment later, Kelly knocked on the door. Something Kyra normally did, but it seemed that Kelly was more willing to do it lately. Perhaps some effect of what Megumi had done to her. She could dwell on that later. She had to get this over with, and tomorrow they had things to discuss. Announcement. Enjoying my work? Leave a favorite, a comment, and perhaps even join me on Patreon. Your support helps me produce more content for you. Do consider checking out my other stories as well. Speaking of other stories, I have a rewrite in progress for Dimadag. Do check out the poll if you haven't already, and patrons have the option to join me on Discord for early access to the rewrite. 24. Chapter 72 A Chat Overdue Kairu made her way up the stairs. Kelly was back home, and by home, Kairu meant waiting for her in Kairu's own apartment. K wasn't at the apartment, apparently. She had a visitor, and hadn't been able to get away. Kairu had checked in with her, apparently. She was at a diner not far from the apartment right now. As for May, she was on her way back but planned to be back at the resort early in the morning. Honestly, Kairu wanted to be back in bed, but Megumi had called her up to the roof. She wondered what for. Nothing weird had happened with the inspections. Well except with the last one, which had a pair of lesbian lovers, and a broken air system. Thankfully it wasn't in the middle of the hot season, so the temperature was not that bad, especially since the place was well ventilated. There had also been a lack of children in the house. As it turns out the one lesbian lover did have a three-year-old, but due to the air issue she wasn't home. 
The little girl had been with her grandmother, who lived in a different neighborhood. Something about that seemed to bother Kelly, but what she cared not to share. Kairu didn't press her on the issue hoping that she would tell her later. Reaching the door to the roof, she slipped through. The roof seemed empty, but she knew better. Kairu put her thoughts aside, and strode toward a seemingly empty section of the roof. After a few steps, the air seemed to shimmer, moments before a shuttle suddenly appeared before her eyes. Having seen the phenomenon before, she knew that she had just passed through the ship's extended cloaking field, extended so she could find the door more easily, and precisely calibrated so that nothing seemed amiss until you actually passed through the cloaking shields. The door was open, but protected by a force field. She hadn't noticed it at first, and bounced off it. Sighing, Kyrie raised her shields, and did what she had been taught, allowing her to pass through the door with little effort. As soon as she was inside, she was greeted by Megumi who bade her to sit in a chair. Megumi's avatar was seated in another chair on the other side of a small table. A quick glance showed that the rear compartment here had been configured into a cozy little nook. Kairu settled into her seat, and noted Megumi's expression. The ship sighed, I'm afraid there is no easy way to say this. So I am just going to say it. I'm not sure I can reverse what the Anira have done, and even if I could, I don't think I should. Kairu shot her a look. What do you mean don't think you should? They are messing with our minds, and stealing our children. Megumi shook her head, and let out another breath. It's in their nature. Do you condemn the snake for eating the rodent? That is entirely different and you know it. Megumi seemed slightly amused. Not really. They share the same common roots. Although if you want something else, we can take a look at the Nivera. She frowned. The Nivera? Who are they? A race of spider-like insectoids. They have a sort of hive mind with only the females of the species truly being individuals. Not surprised you don't know them since they aren't native to this cluster. Well native at least in the way a created race is. Anyway what is important is how they reproduce. They bite the females of other races. Any race that produces live young would do. But they prefer humanoids. This bite allows them to steal the subject's eggs, and implant their own in her ovaries. Kairu gave the ship a look. That was horrifying. Please tell me such a race doesn't exist. They exist. Anyway as I was saying, they use the females of other species to reproduce, but they can also return the eggs they steal, something they sometimes do. They were also known to brainwash the girls they use. All of this is in their nature, evil perhaps, but what they are meant to do. Do you condemn them for it? Or do you condemn their creator? Kairu didn't hesitate, both. I was afraid you would say that, thankfully for the Nivera. The Solian people thought different. We condemned their creators, and helped the Nivera. We removed the darker compulsions inflicted upon them, and created a whole new species to live in symbosis with them. Neither species can reproduce without the other, and both can contribute to a strong society. To my knowledge, that solution we enacted has worked for ten millina without incident. Kairu's frown deepened, she wasn't sure where this was going, but something told her she wasn't going to like it. She was proved right a second later. The reason I mention this is because I think something similar needs to be done with the Neku and the Anairai. We were doing just fine without them. Megumi sighed again. Yes, but they need you, more than they want you to know. To remove them is akin to genocide, a severe violation of my moral programming. Especially since that violates one of the central tenets of the Solian Moral Code. The idea that life is sacred. Kairu blinked. That was kind of surprising. A warship not allowed to commit genocide? but you can kill. I've seen you do that. How you can you not? Killing and genocide are entirely different. One is sometimes needed, the other is almost never right. Many animals hunt and kill to survive. Are they condemned for it? No. In war, you often don't have the luxury to spare your enemy. Anyway that isn't important. Not important. Yes, not important. I called you here to discuss what to do with the Anairai. I almost have all the data I need, and I certainly have enough to start considering a course of action. Since you are training to be my next captain, I brought you here to discuss this. Kairu took a breath, and settled herself. I appreciate that, just I don't like how this is going. I want... Megumi slipped out of the chair at that moment, and pulled her into an embrace stroking her head. I know, and I'm sorry I can't give it to you. If you aren't ready to discuss things further, we can continue this discussion later if you like. Kyra nodded. That sounded nice. She needed to think. She told Megumi that moments later, and when she was released made her way back to the apartment. Kelly was waiting for her, and curling up in bed next to the quirky Inira sounded nice right now. 
A part of her was tempted to skip tonight's class, but that might be a good distraction. Not to mention Kelly wanted to join her on a lesson, and that might be interesting as well, Xide, sighed, and then looked towards the Anira girl who had dragged her out to dinner. Zala was a rather forceful young woman, and thanks to her she was once again following Anira dress code, which meant she was naked again. Not too much of a problem for her. Honestly, she more trouble with her damn tail, although not as much as May did. Zala leaned forward slightly, pressing her uppermost set of boobs against the table which had been cleared by the waitress moments before. Dinner was almost over, and had Tuck's relief been a fairly silent affair. Well, cutie what did you think of the food here? Pretty good isn't it? K nodded, and replied. Yes my fish was very well prepared. She was not sure why the question, and her confusion must have been evident in her tone. But thankfully Zala didn't say anything. Instead what she said next caught a little of guard. Say, K cutie, are you seeing anyone you like? She frowned, then sputtered, huh, what, how is that relevant to anything, Zala giggled, don't tell me a cutie like you is actually a virgin, K blinked, of course she was a virgin, she wasn't even a year old, and wasn't as adventurous as May was, not to mention her training on sex never got past theory, if any of her sisters had experience it was going to be May, wah, what gave you that, idea, beyond how flustered you are? And that blush, Kwa wasn't sure what to say in response to that, giving Zala plenty of time to interject. I'm so glad that I found you first then. It's so much fun teaching young girls like you how to have a great time, and I for one would sure enjoy having some fun with you. Something Ink screamed at her to retreat. She started to do just that, only for a hand to suddenly land on her shoulder, pushing her back into the seat. It was the waitress, who had come up behind her. Zala chuckled. I didn't say you could leave yet, cutie. We aren't done talking. So what do you say? Care to have some fun with me? Um, I, uh, I, I can't. Replied as she was trying to figure out what was going on. She had expected to be pressed, but not like this, and certainly not about sex of all things. The way Zala was moving to emphasize her admittedly cute set of boobs just screamed that she was interested, and flirting. Even if she was being rather forceful, and direct about it. Too direct you might say. Zala, began to play with one of her own breasts, and giggled. Ah, don't say that just yet, you don't know what you are missing. Girls like you really need to relax, and have fun. Let me show you. K wasn't sure where this was going, but that something screaming to retreat had gotten a whole lot louder. Alarms were going off in her head. She was in danger, just not in the way she had expected. K wanted to run really, but with the waitress right there, she was afraid of hurting her. Instead, she said, I'm, um, not ready for that. Zala just sighed, and gave her a look. Just consider it okay? You will really enjoy having some fun with me. It seemed Zala wasn't backing down. K wasn't sure what to do or say. She clammed up, and after a few more moments, Zala pouted. Fine, have it your way, cutie, but you really don't know what you are missing. Or maybe she was? K still wasn't sure what was safe to say. Zala then interjected. Anyway, I really enjoyed this. But it's such a shame you are so shy, K replied. It wasn't quite what I expected. Oh were expecting me to grill you more on the school incident? K nodded. Nah, I got everything I needed to know about that. Your sister coming home with young Kelly you actually answered quite a few of those questions I still had. K blinked. Then why did you say that you wanted to continue the conversation? Cause, you are a real cutie, and I enjoyed talking to you. Most neck you are so much easier to read and that makes you far more intriguing. Great. She was interesting to this forceful Inairai girl. That didn't seem to be a good thing to her. Some part of her was still screaming at her about this girl, even after she had backed off. I, um, see. Zala looked away. Well, I guess I better get you home. But I really think you should reconsider rejecting my offer. Then again, maybe not. Announcement. Enjoying my work? Leave a comment, like the chapter, and consider supporting me on Patreon. In other news progress on the Damodag rewrite is going well. I should hit my target in time for the December reveal of the rewrite. Look forward to it. 27. Chapter 73 Hallway Encounters and a Shared Experience Kairu turned the corner. She was just coming back from her meeting with Megumi on the roof. It seemed however she wasn't the only one returning as she noted K standing in front of the door with Zala, as she noted their presence. She also picked up what Zala was saying, and her posture. It seemed she was aggressively flirting with K, whose bare skin was now flushed a rather vibrant red. 
Kairu was tempted to cloak, and get closer, but instead she simply ducked behind a conveniently placed plant and listened in. With an exaggerated pout, and leaning forward to emphasize her six boobs, Zala said, Are you sure? Not even a kiss goodnight? You really don't know what you are missing. K just shook her head, and darted into the door without a word, closing it behind her. It seemed Kairu had missed the juicy bits already. A bit of a shame, it could have been interesting. Although she wasn't too late for the fireworks, the door slammed behind with thunderous force, and Zala stared at the door for a solid minute unmoving, her eyes wide, as if she had not expected what happened. Finally, she seemed to process it slumping to the floor with an angry pout, slamming her tentacles into the ground several times, as she expended her energy on the floor. She didn't seem to be taking rejection well, and Kairu had the feeling it was best to stay put for a moment or two. The loud thumping of tentacles against the floor may have been a clue, but that didn't last much longer. Suddenly she stopped, but she was still pouting on the floor. A moment after that she started asking the air about when she went wrong. Now that it seemed much safer to go out there, Kairu hesitated for a moment before stepping towards the Anairai. She felt a bit of relief about a lack of response from Zala towards her approach, and she picked up her pace quickly closing the distance. Without a word, she knelt down pulling Zala into an embrace and giving the Anairai female a head rub. After a moment, she seemed to calm, and then Kairu noted that her eyes were a little puffy with some moisture leaking from them. It seemed a little rejection had her quite upset. She said nothing as she had nothing to say, and words didn't seem right. After a minute or two Zala pushed back against her, and half muttered, What did I do wrong? Kairu sighed. That was a hot question if she had ever heard one. She hesitated a moment before replying, Well, I only saw the end of it, but I think you came on too strong. She pouted, Too strong? But, but, that, always works. I've never had a girl turn me down like this. Kairu suppressed a chuckle and replied, yes, but with other girls you can get in their heads, K not so much, right? Zala nodded, it's part of what makes her so intriguing beyond being so cute, Kairu smiled, this was clearly more than just an idle crush, Zala must have fallen hard for the blushing biomic, Kairu considered her response, when Zala mentioned, it's the same with you, but Kelly already claimed you, and I like more anyway, please tell me how I can, Kairu cut her off, I think you should slow down, try a few dates, and get to know my sister, rather than using the come on strong, in Ira approach, try the Neku approach, you know how that works right, um, I know a cute pair of twins that are dating each other, does that work, Kairu thought about it, I guess you could ask them, just make sure to make whatever they tell you your own, said Kairu, with a strong feeling about exactly what she would actually do, Zala smiled, and suddenly turned, kissing Kairu on the lips, stunned, Kairu didn't resist as a tongue slipped in playfully, it lasted only a moment before Zala pulled back, and thanked her before darting up, and running down the corridor, I'll be back tomorrow, I have some twins to meet, don't let Kwanda off, I want to get this right tomorrow, she shouted, Kairu sighed, well that was one headache solved, now she had another one, and tomorrow, well, in the meantime, she figured she would head in and check on Kel you glanced up from the floor, as the door to the complex hallway opened again, this time to admit Kairu, she smiled and waved a free tentacle, glad to see her, especially after Kid rushed in all upset, speaking of K, she was now nestled, into Kelly's lap, Kelly was rubbing her head and had been comforting the girl, Kelly wasn't sure what had happened, but it had quite upset, to the point that she had started crying not long after she had rushed into the apartment so noisily, Kairu looked around, May not back yet? I thought for sure she would be here by now. Kelly pointed at a door, she got back about a minute before K did, and rushed straight to the bathroom. At first I thought she really had to go, but it doesn't sound like it. Kairu shook her head, I see. How's K doing? Well she calmed down, and now she is sleeping in my tentacles. Didn't tell me a thing about what happened to upset her though. I saw the tail end of it. It seems Zala is interested in her and came on rather strong. I think she scared Kelly nodded. Ah, I see. Guess that explains why she was so upset. I take it Zala didn't take the results well either. Kairu shook her head. Nope. Looks like they both had a mutual dissatisfaction with their evening. Although Zala hasn't given up. That might prove interesting. Well, for us anyway. Kelly giggled. Yes, it just might. In the meantime, let's get to bed, and then we can do the same. Kyra nodded, and then helped Kelly carry to her room. K didn't seem to notice and was soon tucked in her own bed. 
The pair left her alone and the maid for Kyrie's room. During all this Kyrie did note that Kelly was right. It didn't sound like May needed to go, nor did it sound like she was taking a bath. Kyrie slipped into sleep, and soon found herself in that familiar courtyard. The only difference was that Kelly was here. All around her, she could see young Solian girls streaming into the courtyard on their way to the first class of the day. As usual their style of dress was somewhat unusual and a bit distracting. Some were outright naked. Others were half-dressed, but her eye was often drawn to those girls walking around topless. She deliberately tore her eyes away from them, and made her way to class. Today her first class was history class. According to the itinerary, they were going to start on the Battle of Samar Point today. Kairu had read up a bit on that in preparation for the class during a free period. Honestly, she had to since she often got distracted by her teacher's boobs. It was embarrassing, but she didn't know what to do about it. She pointedly avoided thinking about what happened when her teacher found out, not that it helped, and she ended up blushing at the memory. Some our point was, to her knowledge, a rather pivotal event in Solian history that had occurred long before the founding of the Solian Empire. It occurred during the days of the Solian Alliance, the precursor state of the empire. Although referring to it as such was a bit of a stretch, in that period, the Solians were a nomadic people, with each Solian fleet being flagged by a mighty city ship which was its own state, they were only loosely aligned with each other, and this structure largely mirrored ancient city-states on Neguri, in those states each city was its own kingdom, and they often had ties both political and economic with their neighboring city-states, these cities would even wage war with each other, however, if an outsider came in, they would band together regardless of past conflicts, or even current ones, to fight them off. Her line of thought was broken by Kelly suddenly speaking up. Why are some of them properly naked, while others are wasting time with clothes? Kairu turned, and sighed. They have different values from us. Kelly gave her a look, one that said a lot but Kairu just hurried her step instead of explaining further. She had a class to get to and she didn't want to be late. Reaching the classroom, she quickly took her seat, but Kelly went to mingle with a trio of barely dressed Solian girls gossiping in the corner. Something Kairu tried to ignore, especially after Kelly started flirting. It was hard, and for some reason that irritated her and she didn't know why. Then her teacher came in, and her gaze was soon locked onto her naked breasts. As usual she wasn't wearing a top. Giving Kairu an excellent view of her cute boobs, a pair of boobs she once again found herself staring at for a moment or two. She blushed when she realized it, and pulled her gaze up to the teacher's face. Just in time too, as class was starting, the teacher smiled, looked over the class, and prompted everyone to open their history books to page 9096. Kairu with practiced ease opened the holographic book to the stated page, and got ready to take notes for the class. The teacher started, today we are covering the Battle of Samar Point, one of the more important events in Solian history, can anyone tell me why it's so important, and in what year the battle occurred, Kairi raised her hand and was soon acknowledged, happy that she knew the answer to this, she was glad she had read ahead, the battle occurred on June 24, 4163 SDE. It's most widely known for the sinking of the city ship Columbia with all hands, and marked the start of a century-long conflict commonly referred to as the Solian Crusade. Very good Kairu, missing a few key details, but you got the highlights. She paused, turned to the board and started writing on the hollow board. Her boobs bounced as she moved, drawing the eye. Something Kairu found herself better able to ignore, but not completely. Maybe some good had come of that experience. A thought that made her blush again. She risked a glance at Kelly, but thankfully it didn't seem like the other girl had noticed her embarrassing behavior. Her attention went back to the front as the teacher began. On that fateful day at Somar Point, the Solian First and Sixth Fleets had met each other at Somar Point. As such several famous vessels were present at the battle including the city ships Enterprise and Columbia, some of the oldest ships in the Solian fleet, the Enterprise herself being the oldest operational ship in the entire alliance. At the time, the two fleets had joined together to trade, and then they were going to jointly make a hyperwarp jump to a new galaxy, nothing too unusual, and it wasn't uncommon for two or more fleets to briefly join together and share resources for a jump between galaxies. Back then, a journey between galaxies took several months and drained massive amounts of power. Fleets were often vulnerable just before and after a jump. Now can anyone tell me why this matters in the context of the events at Somar Point? Kairi raised her hand, but no one else did. After a moment, the teacher sighed, and acknowledged Kairu, 
The massive power draw shines like a beacon when a fleet is preparing a jump. As such their cloaking systems can no longer hide their position, and worse, the drain on the power grid also means that a ship has less energy for defense forcing them to power down defensive systems such as the shields and main weapon batteries. Very good, and precisely correct. There is more you could have mentioned though. Can anyone tell me what she missed? This time several hands were raised, and another girl was picked. That massive power draw was what drew the Delcari to attack the Enterprise and the Columbia in the first place. The teacher shook her head, not quite the answer I was looking for, although not entirely incorrect. Can anyone else guess what Kairu missed? A couple more hands went up, and Iris was picked this time. It was common practice back then to engage in drive interlinking. Several ships would sink their drives and outputs thereby magnifying the effects of their hyperwarp drives. This allowed a hyperwarp conduit to be generated in a fraction of the time. Unfortunately while interlinked, all ships involved would be expending the majority of their power capacity on forming the conduit needed for a jump. A task that was especially complex for an intergalactic jump. Very much so. Both fleets had little reason to suspect a threat and were engaging in that very practice then. Both the Columbia and the Enterprise were among the ships engaged in creating the conduit. Not exactly an ideal situation for when the Delcari showed up. Began the teacher as she started going over the subject in earnest. Turning to write on the board, Kairu jotted down her notes, and once again added a freeform drawing of her teacher. At least this time, her notes also contained the important facts. Facts that outlined what a tragedy the battle had been. Solian casualties in that battle had been high. The two fleets had been caught off guard when the Delcari had attacked. The Columbia had been a massive city ship the size of a moon, and with a huge population to go with it, three and a half billion people had died when that ship went down. An utter tragedy. Not only had those people died, but the Solians had lost nearly a thousand capital ships along with that city ship. Some of them were armed combat vessels, but others were not. They were armed, and armored, but only for direct protection. Those other capital ships had been industrial and agricultural ships with sizable crews of their own. As for the Delgari, prior to this battle, the Solians had had no contact with them, and knew little of them. As far as the Solians were concerned this was a senseless, unprovoked assault, one they could not easily let slide. The Delkari on the other hand had an outpost unknown to the Solians less than twenty light years from their jump point. When two Solian elder fleets had suddenly appeared with massive energy signatures near their outpost, the commander of that outpost felt threatened. He launched a preemptive attack with everything at his disposal, never once considering that the Solians weren't about to attack his outpost or anything else for that matter. The class however ended before they got into what the repercussions of the battle had been. Although Kairu had a few ideas on that, especially since she knew it was the start of a century-long war, she hadn't yet learned how it had ended, however, only how that war started. Announcement. Enjoying my work? Consider joining me on Patreon. Also do leave a comment I enjoy hearing the thoughts of my readers. 27. Chapter 74 A Routine Morning Kelly stretched, shifting away from Kairu as she absorbed the experience. It had been really weird sharing that dreamscape with Kairu. It was also somewhat interesting. Kairu had been a lot more fun in that dreamscape, especially with how she acted like a horny teen, and tried to hide it. Although Kelly did notice that Kairu seemed bothered by that, Kairu slipped out of the bed, and placed her headset on the table. Her body seemed a little flushed, with a deep red tinging her skin. It made her look even cuter. Sighing, Kelly said, It's not your fault. Kairu turned around in a heartbeat, a deep frown marring her cute face. Huh? What's not my fault? Kelly slipped off the bed, and said, I take it you didn't notice your classmates. What about my classmates? They were just as horny as you were? Replied Kelly feeling a little uncertain all of a sudden. Kairu gave her a look. Can't be. They're only twelve. Kelly sighed. Like that means much. Many neck you start going through puberty younger than that, and I have no doubt that you know what all those hormones do. Kyra now looked thoroughly confused. So Kelly decided to just cut to the point. Many of your simulated classmates are going through puberty. I talked to both them and your teachers about it. While I was there, I guess you never thought to ask. You should have. Kairu tilted her head, and her confused face looked very cute. Um, ah, uh, apparently Solians go through puberty quite young. An adaption apparently. But not the important bit. They apparently produce very powerful pheromones that signal their readiness to mate and induce it in others. Solians are immune to it, but other races are not. 
I'm in the early stages of pregnancy, which protects me. You aren't, hence the horny behavior. Several expressions flickered across Kairu's face before she shouted. Why? Would they include that in an educational program? I asked that too, although less colorfully. Apparently, Solian programs always include that, they like realism, and it brings more realism to the simulated world by adding that. Kairu muttered something under her breath. Kelly didn't quite catch it. She decided to change the subject. Anyway it's about time we got ready for our day. Thankfully we don't have any inspections today. Which is great, since those things get tiring pretty quickly. Kairu nodded, seemingly happy. Yes that does sound like good news. But what are we doing for the day? Kelly sighed, and felt herself shrink a little. She hadn't mentioned it, but she'd spoken with her mother recently. Um, well about that, Kairu gave her a look. Why do I have the feeling I'm not going to like what you are about to say? May stepped out of the bath and dried herself off. She had gotten up at a reasonably early hour so that she would have time to do this. It had been early enough that she had a nice relaxing soak in the tub. It was a lovely luxury that she liked about this apartment. She was glad that coming down here did not mean giving up on her nice baths. She paid special attention to her tail, arms, and lower legs since they were covered with fur, part of her adaption as a necu. Well, imitation of necu anyway. May was glad that necu fur was typically on the thinner side, and shed water easily. It made getting her fur dry nice and easy. Reasonably dry. She slipped on a protective pair of panties, and a short top. The top was technically a bra of sorts. It was rather short and stretchy. It wrapped around her breasts comfortably and didn't actually do much to hide the shape of what was beneath. In fact it did nothing to do so and wasn't meant to. It only covered about half her breasts, and about two centimeters below her boobs. The upper half of her breasts, starting just half a centimeter over the nipples were exposed, and her belly was also left uncovered. The fabric was a lovely black which she thought went nicely with her hair and contrasted her skin nicely as well. The panties were a simple design, that hugged her pussy and rear nicely. They were also tight enough that she had a lovely camel toe showing, not to mention they matched with the top well. Especially since they were of the same black color, it was kind of a shame that she would have to add a skirt, but the neck you expected one. Well, the ones the Anira hadn't fully brainwashed yet, and someone had to keep interacting with them. She sighed, and grabbed the skirt she had picked out, and slipped it on. It was of a modest length, ending just below her thighs. It went well enough with the rest of her outfit, but it just wasn't quite risque enough for her. In fact, she didn't mind going naked like the others did, but just doing that wasn't quite enough. It made her heart beat just a little farther to push things. She was already doing that with this outfit, but it wasn't quite enough. She really wanted to lose the skirt but wasn't sure she could. Maybe she should ask Kelly. Stepping out of the bathroom, she noticed Kelly and Kairu having a rather intensive discussion in the hall. <clears throat> Maybe not right now. Kairu's tail was moving in a way that indicated she was agitated. And Kelly? Well she didn't think she would be in the mood to talk about that. Not right now anyway. In fact it might be a good idea to just leave, and get breakfast at the diner. It wasn't that far, and May needed to get a move on anyway. She wanted to get back out to the resort, that place seemed like a good source of information. At the very least, she wanted to know more about what they were doing to poor Riku. Even if some of it was pretty clear, although she hadn't yet gotten to the root of why. Only way to get those answers was to go back and so that was what she was going to do. The diner wasn't that far from the apartment so she had walked there. As she entered, it was already somewhat busy, and there were even a few Inairai customers. May outwardly didn't pay them any heed, as most Neku ignored them anyway. She did however note their positions. A waitress spoke to her, and led her to a seat, that ended up being at a table practically next to a pair of Inairai having a discussion. She was given a menu, and the waitress left to give her time to consider her order. Having been here before, May knew she would be back in a couple of minutes. At the table next to hers, she could overhear the conversation that the two in Nairi were engaged in. The conversation seemed normal enough for their kind. Yeah, she is kinda cute. Might be nice to see her out of that uniform. Such a shame she doesn't have potential. She's so cute. Maybe that it will change by next year. A sigh, except I'm not going to be here next year. You're not? Why? I signed on with the military. They had a few openings, and the pay was good. It's a five-year contract though, so there is that. I am, um, see, are you sure that is a good idea? I've heard rumors of entire fleets being lost recently. It seems kind of dangerous. Yeah, I heard the same rumors, and asked around. Turns out it was a fluke event. 
nesting dragon attacked a key stage in ground, and the moron in charge thought it was a good idea to fight it. I do feel sorry for the poor folks who ended up stranded on the local planets with the dragon, but there isn't anything we can do for them. You mean the rumors were true? Apparently, but as I understand it, it's hard to cover up a dragon attack, even for us. Besides, we both know those monsters are a force of nature. Only thing you can do with a dragon is run, and that is just what I plan to do if that does happen. I'm not stupid. Fine, but I don't think joining is a good idea. What would you even be doing anyway? Fighting is for the neck you to do after all. I'll be attached to the medical staff. Officially I'll be a doctor doing the regular checkups and medical care. Unofficially I'll be doing a lot more. Sounding curious. The other said, oh, like what? A few things. I'm not at liberty to reveal it all. But what I can say is that military have a different program from the one being used here on Negri with the local NECU. After all we aren't just building nests out there, we're fighting a war to establish new territory for new nests. Those early worlds are especially prime for them. I'm kinda hoping for a chance to get a really cute early girl. Oh, that sounds interesting. If you do, I'd really like it if you invited me and shared her. That might be fun. At that moment. Her waitress returned to take her order. May having already memorized the menu, and knowing what she wanted gave her order. And at the same time sneakily tagged the military an Irai girl. She might be a lead, but not one May was going to follow just yet. Not to mention that one was likely better taken by an expendable drone. The waitress smiled, noted down her order, and departed. She was pulled aside by the two in Nairai before she got far however, or more accurately the one, as the other was already leaving. The one may had thoughtfully marked. It seemed their conversation and their meal was over. The one still here was asking for her bill. After the waitress left to go get the bill, and May's order going, the now alone Anirai girl stretched in her seat, and then looked around the room, her gaze eventually settling in May's direction. May noticed, and internally felt worried for a moment. Especially when she turned towards her. Hello, aren't you just delectable? You wouldn't happen to be free. May replied. I'm afraid I have a busy day, today. Anything you can cancel? Now a little worried. Not really, but I do have some time in the evening. Why? I was hoping for a little fun. And you look cute. Sorry to have bothered you. A moment later, the waitress came back with the bill, and May had the feeling that she had just had a rather close call. Something told her she might see that in Irai girl again as well. Stirred, and then turned red as memories of last night came to the surface. Along with last night's incident with the overly pushy Zella. For a moment she just lay there, before finally deciding to slip out of bed, allowing the cooler air to brush against her bare skin as the soft sheets slipped from her body. Glancing at the clock, she noticed that it was rather late. She was normally already up at this hour. Thankfully she didn't have anything pressing to do today. So sleeping in, hadn't drastically upset her schedule. The real question was what was she going to do today? Pushing that aside, she slipped out of her room into the silence of the hall. She figured everyone was gone by now, and a quick glance around the apartment confirmed it. The place was deserted. No one else was here. That suited K just fine. And she made her way to the bathroom, and started drawing a bath. While she waited for the tub to fill, she took care of her morning business. She may be a machine, but she was also organic so she still had ways to get rid of. That done, and the tub filled she slipped into the hot water, and let out a sigh. Relaxing into the warm waters felt nice. She lay there a moment or two before she reached for the soaps, and rags. Her mind drifting to consider the big question of the day. What was she going to do today? The only obvious thing was to avoid Zala. Other than that her day was looking very open. 22. Chapter 75 Back at the strange resort, May slipped into the resort silently. No one noticed her entry. Her cloak was already active, ensuring that she would remain unseen. At this hour it didn't seem too busy, but she had a feeling that wasn't the case. May already had a bit of an idea about Riku's schedule. So she headed for the building she knew contained the pregnant girl's lodgings. It was where she had left her the night before. The resort maintained several buildings that looked like inns at first glance. They were clearly a little more than that, but nothing too special. They existed mainly for the girls they were actively brainwashing to stay at when they weren't being worked on. As such, the rooms were fairly simple with few amenities. Riku's room was a small one on the first floor of a building not far from the resort clinic. It was fairly small, with a bed, a small sitting area, a couple of stands, and even a terminal. It didn't have closet or anywhere to put clothing. Given the local no-clothes policy, that was expected. The room did have an attached bath though. Something not all the rooms at the inn had. 
perhaps a sign of special treatment, it didn't take her long to make her way to Riku's lodgings. She was slowed for a moment on entry, but it wasn't a large delay. Heading deeper into the building was made much easier by the lack of doors, fitting the style of this inn. All doorways were closed by curtains. May had her suspicions on why, but she did note that it didn't look out of place, as this conformed to the aesthetic they were going with here, one whose origin May wasn't entirely certain about. She'd been too busy to bother researching Neku design styles. May arrived to find that she was perhaps a little late, but not so late that Riku wasn't here. Yuria was already here, though, they had been talking about something, but from the sound of things, May had missed the conversation. As May settled near the doorway, Riku nodded, sounds good. Yuria smiled, that usual predatory grin of hers, great. She glanced to the side, anyway we need to get going, we have another busy day ahead of us. Yuria led the Neku girl out of the room, and down the hallway, May followed feeling like she may have missed something important. The first place they ended up going was right back to the clinic. Riku was taken past the front desk, and into an exam room very quickly, where once again, she was subjected to invasive scans, and they repeated the procedure they had done previously, starting with working on her unborn child before moving on to isolating her womb, and working on Riku's body. There wasn't much of note to say about that, as it repeated the process of the previous day. So when Yuria had left the room, May had followed her, only to find it wasn't anything interesting. Thankfully the procedure seemed to go more quickly this time. Now May was following the pair down a familiar route, it seemed they were heading back to extraction, the place where Riku's memories had been scanned at. Sure enough that was exactly where they were headed. Yuria led Riku into the familiar, if small room, where she had Riku settle into the strange chair. A second Inaira was standing by to assist with hooking up the neural interface equipment around her head, while Yuria readied the monitors and terminals. Once everything was ready, Yuria turned to Riku. Okay, we are going to get started in a minute. We are going to be accessing your memories again, but this time we are going to be actively removing memories from your mind. You will experience some discomfort, and you should also have difficulty accessing your own memories while we work. This is normal and nothing to worry about. During the process we will occasionally ask you questions, and may insert new memories at times. Understood? Riku nodded. I understand. Then she frowned. What are you removing anyway? Nothing for you to worry about. Trust me, you aren't going to miss the memories. Riku nodded. I guess. Is this going to take long? Yuria nodded. I'm afraid so. We are going to be here most of the day. But you do have a spa vist afterwards to look forward to. Riku smiled. That sounds nice. I'm looking forward to it as well. She paused, and pulled something up on the terminal. Okay I am going to start the machine, and it should be a little more pleasant than last time. You may still feel some discomfort as it starts accessing your memories. Yuri activated the machine, and Riku's face twisted slightly for a moment or two before relaxing. Yuri turned. Okay, I want you to try and recall a memory. Don't worry about relaying it. Anything you remember will show on the monitor. Riku nodded, slightly, I understand. May kept an eye on the monitor, but nothing seemed to happen. After a moment or two Riku spoke up, I, I, um, can't remember anything. Yuria smiled, that's okay. It's perfectly normal, and expected, it's a good sign. She paused, all right I am going to try accessing a memory from my end. A moment later, the monitor began to play. It seemed to be a first person perspective of a young girl playing in the sand with a couple of other kids nothing unusual, it seemed very normal, Riku seemed to smile, and spoke up, I remember that, Yuria interrupted her, good, very good, looks like the machine interfaced perfectly, now I'm going to go ahead, and erase this memory, do a test, and then put it back, okay, Riku replied, go ahead, May watched as the pair of Inairai did just that, while taking notes about what she was seeing, it might be important later, if not for her, then for Megumi, and whatever she decided to do. After a couple of moments Yuria commented to the other, Okay looks like things are proceeding nicely. I've flagged this memory and I'm ready. What is the first memory we are removing? The other and Ira consulted something. We are starting in her earlier memories it seems. Start with 227-L73. It should be according to the note be a positive sexual memory involving a boy, one of her earliest. Yuri tapped at the console with her tentacles pulling up the memory, allowing it to play on the monitor. As it did May began to note how it affected Riku, her body responding to the memory. She also noted there was more than just visual and audio data displayed on the monitor, 
the memory wasn't allowed to play long before they erased it. The other and Ira called out the position tag for another memory, one supposedly linked to this one, and when it played it did from the limited perspective seem connected. So did the one after that, as they moved from one memory to the next, spending only a few minutes on each one to confirm it was the right one before simply removing it from Riku's mind. Riku herself simply seemed to be swept along for the ride, not that she seemed to have any choice in the matter. The girl didn't even protest them erasing her memories and they told her they were going to do that. That was how things went for the first couple of hours with them following the rhythm they had set, until finally the second Inaira said, okay, that should be everything for the first pass. Time for a test. Yeria nodded, and manipulated the monitor pulling up a file labeled test memory subject Riku followed by the numerical tag number one, along with a note that said, this is a test memory only, erase from subject after use, do not leave. Okay the first test memory, is ready. The second Inairi repositioned herself, and replied, Go ahead and insert the memory. I'll run the scan and monitor for conflicts. Yeria nodded, and started the process. The machine immediately began to write the memory into her head. After a moment, the scan initiated testing the memory connections, and subject responses. May noted down everything they were doing. She also noted the test memory, which seemed to be a sexual encounter with a girl, but compared to the others it felt off. Maybe that was why the note was there, it might not be finished, but evidently, it was sufficient for this test. As the test continued she noted it wasn't long before a few red flags were raised, something the monitoring in Iri was quick to note, and flag. Each conflict was marked for review, and she automatically told Yeria to remove each flagged memory. Okay that seems to be the last conflict, erase the test, and get ready for the next memory set. She glanced at her notes. The next one is also an earlier memory set. Begin at location 436-BNA27. This one is another positive sexual memory involving a boy, tapping the keys, Yeria repeated, 436-BNA27. The memory came up, and began to play on the monitor, May noted how Riku responded clearly she was effectively reliving the memory not just recalling it. Although May doubted she was going to remember the experience seeing as the Anairai were planning to erase the memory. All these sex memories were certainly getting to the girl though. Her pussy lips were glistening, and twitching a little, and at this point her nipples were swollen nubs. It must be something special going through that, although just looking at the playing memories was getting her a little hot. So it wasn't much of a stretch to say it was likely far more intense for Riku. The second in Iri after a moment of checking the recently brought up memory, confirmed it as the target memory, and they began to erase it before moving on to the next memory in the sequence. Kyra noted that like the last set, these seemed to be a set of connected memories that they were working through, although it was hard to say by a glance about exactly when they were. Unlike with digital media, these memories weren't stamped with time codes. It didn't help that some of them seemed to be somewhat fuzzy, although May suspected that they were working through Riku's teenage years. At the very least it seemed to be memories from when she was actively dating, and hadn't yet settled down with her husband. It took them a while to work through this set of memories as well, but they seemed to progress faster. As it was not too long before the second Inaira I looked up from the notes, okay that was the last one in this set. Load up the second test memory. I'll be standing by again to test for conflicts. The two seemed to have already figured things out, and easily worked their way through the process of loading the memory into Riku's mind, and testing for conflicts. May noted down the memory as it played this second one also seemed to involve a girl, but not the same one as before. It also didn't seem as tame as the previous one, and this time the scan lit up like a year's end festival tree with missed conflicts. Conflicts they had to work through, mark for review in the archive and remove from Riku's mind. May had a feeling that by the time this session was over, Riku was going to have gaping holes in her memory. A feeling that grew when they began on yet another set of memories. This one was unlike the last two. The second in Ira blinked as she reviewed the notes. Oh, this one is a bit special. Before I give you the region, bit of a warning, but it's a negative sexual memory involving a girl. A very negative experience. Yeria nodded, blinked and asked for the starting point. Her tentacles tapped the memory tag in, and pulled up the start of the memory in question. It played very fuzzy on the monitor for a moment or two before clearing up. May noted Yuria did something a moment before it cleared up, perhaps related. May also noted the fuzziness of the memory. That was perhaps important, 
It turned out to indeed be a rather negative experience. It seemed to be like dumping a bucket of ice water on Riku, as she didn't respond to it like the last two sets of memories. May kind of felt sorry for her after seeing the memory. This one seemed like something best left in the past. The connected memories weren't always sexual, but were often just as negative. She didn't seem to have had the best relationship with this girl. That might have played into why they were removing it from her mind. They worked through it quickly, and moved on to the third test memory, which interestingly enough this time involved a man. It was even framed in a negative light. May noted that down, as it certainly revealed a few things about Inari intentions. It was hours later after working through numerous memories that they finally turned the machine off, and the second Inaira removed the interface. Yeria leaned over Riku a bit, who was blinking. How are you feeling? Head hurts. What's going on? Yeria smiled. The disorientation will pass. It's normal, nothing to worry about. To answer the question we just finished deleting a few of your memories. You'll find some gaps in your memory if you try to think about the past. Don't worry about that. It's normal, and temporary. Riku nodded. I think I remember. What did you delete? Yeria smiled. A lot. But nothing you need be concerned about. We will have to get back into your head again tomorrow for more removals. I see. Um. Shifting her stance Yeria said. Don't worry about the gaps. We are going to fill them back in later. With altered memories of course. That should sound good to you. Does it? Yes. I think I would like that. Good. I look forward to it. Anyway. It's about time for your spa visit. Feeling up to it? Riku nodded and with a little help she got up out of the chair. Yeria led her away, while the other Inairai remarked that she was going to finish up here. May hesitated for a moment before following the pair out of the room. The more interesting things might just be out of this room. May made a few more notes as she followed the pair to the spa. Announcement. Enjoying my work? Now is an excellent time to join me on Patreon, where you can enjoy a fair number of additional chapters. 20. Interlude fun before the work. Yeria made her way down the hall. Today was going to be a little busy. She was kind of looking forward to this. Especially the trip to the spa. But before that she had some work to do. Yesterday they had scanned and copied every little memory in Riku's head. Now that they had that. They could get started by deleting unwanted memories while others coordinated the creation of approved memories to replace them. That wasn't going to be too difficult especially since prior sessions had included preparations to ensure she wouldn't be resistant to the process. Although it was going to be a rather lengthy process regardless, they would be spending days going through the marked memories, and erasing them. Additional ones might even be added to the list as they are working. At some points during the process, they would be filling in the gaps created with altered memories, the majority of which would be added when they are done. If everything went correctly Riku would be unable to distinguish the altered memories from her own. At the moment she was allowed to be aware it was happening, and that was okay since they would need her to confirm that she can't tell the difference. Of course she wasn't going to be allowed to remember her stay when she leaves. Not all of it anyway. Yeria was hoping that she would have Riku's unconditional trust by then. Especially since she was supposed to maintain a relationship with Riku. That wasn't undesirable though especially since Riku was so cute. Not only was she cute, but Riku was going to give birth to a cute little girl that was going to be Yeria's to raise. That was something she was really looking forward to. A part of her couldn't wait to meet baby Miku. She'd had that name picked out for ages, and now she finally got to use it. Of course. It had taken a bit of doing to get Riku to hand over the right to name her child, but as Yuria saw it Miku was hers not Riku's. So this was only right. With a bit of luck and quite a bit of effort, she could get a few more children to raise out of Riku. That was going to be a lot of fun, but at the moment all she really wanted to do was have a little fun with Riku. Oh, well a lot of fun really, but she was going to have to be careful. Yuria didn't want to harm her little Miku by accident. Slipping through the curtain, she found Riku was already up and had found the terminal. She was browsing through the local library but hadn't picked anything yet. The resort kept a few programs to entertain the guests being brainwashed, and they carefully curtailed their selection. It was all in our approved or created content, just one more way they worked towards molding the guests. Although Yeria had in mind something more fun than anything in that library. Something they both could enjoy. She smiled, hey, Riku, sleep well? Riku looked up, I did. Did you come to wake me or is my day starting already? Yeria closed the curtain behind her. We already have your whole day planned for you, but you aren't expected anywhere until late. So I'd say we have a little time. I went ahead and ordered room service for you. Up for a little fun before it gets here? Riku tilted her head, her ear twitching cutely. 
What did you order? And what do you mean about a little fun? Using a tentacle she spread her lower lips a little. This kind of fun, and as for the meal, don't worry about it, just trust me to pick something good and healthy for you. Riku blushed a little. I am um, C, I guess, but I'm not sure how I feel about doing that. Yeria giggled. Ah oh, come on don't be like that, it'll be fun. Riku still seemed a little uncertain. That wouldn't do. So Yeria took a couple of steps forward, and pulled her into an embrace. In the same motion, she began stroking her head. After a few moments, Riku nodded. I guess I could at least give it a try. Yeria smiled and slipped one tentacle lower. Quietly she whispered into Riku's ear. I'll make sure you don't regret it. Just relax, and let me show you the path. With that, she suddenly brushed the tentacle lightly against Riku's bare pussy lips, eliciting a gasp of surprise at the sudden sensation. A moment later, she used a different tentacle. Again she left the touch light, and gentle. Yeria hadn't found why yet, but she could sense that something had placed some resistance against girl sex in Riku. Thankfully it was rather minor, as it had obviously been caught earlier. No one had told her about it. But whatever memory caused this was evidently suppressed. In any case she had little doubt that the source of this would be among the first memories deleted if not the first. Although the Neki mind can be fairly complex so they might have to remove a different memory first. Yeria put that all aside for now, and instead focused on her prey. Feeling Riku relax a bit in her grip, as her tendrils penetrated deeper into the pregnant Neku's mind. Slowly she teased the other's girl's sex, keeping her touches light and never staying long. With her other tentacles, she attacked Riku's boobs. It wasn't long before her light touches began to elicit a real response. Her sex slowly began to glisten. The folds twitched a little, as her nipples hardened. A soft moan escaped her throat. Yeria took that as a signal and pushed her tentacle inside. She moved slowly, triggering a gasp, and a moan. It seemed she was ready. Yeria picked up the pace, and with another tentacle, she flicked Riku's clit. At the same moment, she tugged on a nipple, while rolling the other one with two of her other tentacles. Yeria was taking full advantage of her six tentacles and was using the last pair to knead the Neku girl's boobs. Her breaths began to heat up, and her body grew warm, as lightning surged through her mind. Yeria felt each and every little surge herself, and her own nipples hardened in response. The sensations both guided her and encouraged her. Yeria repeatedly pulled and slammed her tentacle back into Riku's folds. Each time it slammed back in, Riku moaned. Sticky fluid gushed, coating her tentacle, some of which also dripped onto the floor, unnoticed by either as Yeria lost herself in the sensations roiling through Riku's mind. Yeria moaned as a surge of lightning ran through them both. She flicked a nipple with one of her tentacles, sending another burst of heat up Riku's spine and then she wrapped another around her little nub, the very touch sent a shiver up Riku's nerves and set off a small explosion in her mind, nearly bringing them both to the edge, she rolled the little nub, and thunder crashed her vision turned white, and the world vanished for a moment, she came down from the higher moment later panting, but she resumed her movements, quickly building the two of them back up to a glorious climax, thunder crashed again, and she gushed in pleasure enjoying the sensations rippling through her from the connection she currently shared with Riku. The world vanished again for a moment in a surge of white light. One that crashed all too soon, and she came back to the world again. This time, she resumed her movements at a slower pace. Teasingly she moved her tentacles, rubbing Riku's swollen labia. Each little movement elicited small breaths and gasps from the now very aroused kitty. Any hesitations and uncertainties about this had been forgotten as her mind relished in the sensations every little touch brought, a tentacle brushing lightly against her swollen nipple sent a strong surge of lightning through her, and Riku walked back into Yuria. Yuria gasped slightly as she felt the kitty press into her own breasts, her nipples rubbed against Riku's back as well sending up little ripples of sensation. Yuria savored them deeply, enjoying the little touches. Yes, Riku was very much perfect. They were going to have so much fun together, unfortunately, she knew they didn't have too much longer, however, she wanted to savor this just a little longer, she let Riku press into her a moment or two longer and then slipped out from under the neck you, Riku allowed her to push her onto her back, and Yuria knelt above her, positioning herself so that she had a prime view of Riku's glistening sex, the swollen labia twitched as moisture bubbled from within, Yuria leaned in, and her tongue slipped into the other girl's folds. As she tasted the juices of her delightful prey, she lapped slowly at first, but quickly picked up the pace. Her tongue darted up and down the soft folds, in and out, and even flicked her nub a few times as she left no inch of flesh untouched. 
The room filled with the sound, and each movement did Riku panting deeply, almost begging for more. Suddenly she flicked a nipple, and lightning surged bringing them both to the edge one last time. Then she gripped Riku's clit gently with her teeth and rolled it with her tongue. Riku screamed, as thunder crashed her vision turned white, and her muscles spasmed. Yuria followed her over the edge a moment later. As the high crashed, she rolled over onto her back for a moment to catch her breath. It wasn't long before the food arrived. Two plates, one extra large specially chosen by Yuria for Riku to eat. After all she needed to make sure that Riku ate properly. Which is why she picked something with everything she knew the little kitty was going to need. Especially given her condition. The food was placed on a table, and the server left to attend to others. Yuria watched them go, enjoying the sight of the naked kitty as she made her way out of the room. Turning to Riku, she said, food's here, better eat it quickly. You have a very busy day ahead of you, Riku nodded, and after a moment pushed herself up. Yuria stayed near her to help her to the table, and the two of them settled down to eat breakfast. As they did, Yuria commented, Now see didn't I tell you that you can trust me? Wasn't that great? The food will be just as good, trust me? It was, I'm glad I decided to let you do that. 21, Chapter 76 A Visit to a Nest Hand Kairu stepped off the platform and looked around. She had never been here before, but she already knew that this was where Kelly grew up, something she had only learned this morning. Kelly's childhood neighborhood was located on the far side of the city from their apartments. As far as she knew, this area hadn't yet been investigated by anyone. Although she idly recalled that there was a new clinic that had opened around here. Some kind of fertility clinic, as she recalled. At least that was what the people talking at the diner had said about it. There was likely far more to it than that, it was something she wanted to check out. But she was only in the general area, it was still a fair distance away, not to mention she was rather stuck with Kelly at the moment, especially given why Kelly had dragged her out here, maybe she could check it out later? It was only a short ride away from here, it would be fairly easy to make a stop there, especially if this didn't take too long. Kelly joined her a moment later. A tentacle wrapped itself around the wrist, and pulled gently. This way, can't stay here sightseeing all day. Especially not with my mom expecting us. Kelly shuddered, and Kairu sighed. She wasn't entirely happy about this, but apparently, it wasn't all Kelly's fault. During their discussion about this matter earlier Kairu had learned a bit about what happened. Kelly being rather excited about how their relationship had been going had started talking to her mother about it. Nothing unusual really. Kairu would have done the same honestly, the real problem was that Kelly's mother became very insistent about meeting Kairu, in fact that was the reason they were out here. Kelly's mum had arranged this whole visit, reluctantly she followed along, but she was rather worried about this whole thing, she especially wished that Kelly had at least talked to her about this earlier, giving her some warning, rather than springing it on her. As Kelly knew this was going to happen late yesterday but hadn't said a word, part of her however was willing to forgive Kelly, she was rather young after all. And this had happened quite recently, not to mention, Kelly couldn't exactly say no to her own mother. As such, here they were about to face something that Kairu had little doubt would be a bit of an ordeal. Putting that aside, she paid attention to her surroundings. Like the rest of the city there wasn't a man in sight. Girls of all ages were around. Young girls playing games, older girls flirting with each other, a group of friends gossiping at the corner. Nothing too unusual in this city other than the fact that everyone in the area was naked. A pair of pregnant Neku came around a corner, and then she noticed that half of the friends gossiping at the corner also appeared to be pregnant. Looking around she also noted that someone seemed to be watching the young girls at play, and she too seemed to be pregnant. The person keeping watch also happened to be an Anirai. Something Kairu took note of, something she found more interesting however was that there seemed to be a high spike in pregnancy rates around here. She blinked then glanced at Kelly about to ask a question, but the perceptive Inairai girl predicted the question, it's normal around here, the Neku around here don't need men to reproduce anymore, and have already been through the full training program, well some of them anyway, the others grew up in this system, this neighborhood is after all the oldest nest in the whole city, she looked around a little, so, in other words this is basically what you're trying to do in that other neighborhood with those inspections, Kelly sighed, and gave her a look, me and the other girls hired for the task, yes, something wrong, nothing I'd care to talk about right now, I see, well, talk to me when you are ready, she smiled, I will, Kairu found that cute, but a thought occurred to her, anything I need to know about this neighborhood, Kelly frowned, um, 
Well aside from the obvious thing about the dress code, the girls around here are generally uninhibited, that is one of the goals of the training program. You neck you often have way too many inhibitions, they rounded the corner, and as if to underscore the point she noted two girls kissing by the side of the road while an Anira girl was groping them, no one acted as if it was weird or even gave it a second glance. Not far from there, she noted a building with a sign in large bold letters, she could read the following feeling horny, can't make it home, and don't want to do it in the street, come on in, we have rooms just for this, private and public venues available for purchase, for pricing details talk to the receptionist. Obviously it was a hotel, one of those hotels. Right next to it however was a game shop, and across the street was a bookstore. Not exactly the kind of spot you would normally see for one. It didn't even look seedy like they usually did. The building gave a downright respectable vibe. After a moment, she noted the two girls that were kissing being dragged inside by the Anirai. Kelly noted her gaze, and commented, Those are everywhere and I would suggest you avoid them. Any Nekya who goes in is expected to engage in sexual activity. I see, I'll keep that in mind, she replied. As they made their way down the street, passing several shops and businesses before they entered the neighborhood proper, the neighborhood proper was where the people actually lived around here. The streets were now lined with houses, and the occasional park, there were still plenty of people walking around here. Some Nekya, Others in Irai, and Kyra noted quite a few of the Neku and even a few of the Anirai seemed to be pregnant. She didn't see any kids playing just yet. The kids she had seen earlier had been at a playground and were likely there being watched by the Anirai while their mothers were off shopping or something. It wasn't long before they came upon a park. As they passed by she noted it was filled with young girls playing games, and a few couples having public sex. Kairu even noted a few Inari keeping a watchful eye on the little girls in the park. Speaking of the little girls in the park, she noticed that there was a clear mix of both Inari and Neku children. Not far from there she could even see an Inari girl with her tentacles wrapped around the head of a Neku girl about the same age. An older Inari was nearby, and seemed to be giving pointers on whatever she was trying to do. Kairu glanced back at Kelly. So what is with the lack of Neku watching the kids? Kelly replied. Well I think I mentioned it before, but Neku aren't exactly seen as the best caretakers, there are exceptions, usually in private, in public all childcare is the domain of Inairai. She gestured at the kids, it isn't a school day today, but that doesn't mean the mothers are free. Many of them enroll their kids with the Inairai caretaker service, and an Inairai keeps an eye on them for the mother while they are busy, Kyra nodded along, but remembered something else, not all of these kids would actually be allowed to see their mums. She knew at least some in Iri had a tendency to take young kids away from their mothers, something she didn't exactly approve of, and she knew Kelly was starting to realize wasn't as good as she had previously thought. A good sign, she felt, perhaps others of her kind could realize it as well. I see, she said before glancing back over the park, her mind wondering about how many of those kids actually know their mothers, and how many don't. It looked pretty normal aside from the total lack of clothes, but she knew that facade hid something dark, nefarious, a flash of an earlier conversation and her mood shifted, how many of them could Megumi actually help? The rest of the walk went by quickly, and thankfully nobody stopped them on the way to Kelly's childhood home. Her childhood home turned out to be a cozy looking traditional with a large front porch with a raised wooden deck, the trim was stained to give it a natural look, and the walls were polished stone. The roof was polished clay tiles, and looked well maintained. The house itself was also a bit larger than its neighbors with three stories. It also had a lovely and sturdy old tree sitting in the front yard. There were a few chairs on the deck, but the front yard seemed deserted when they arrived. Kelly slowed her pace as they came up towards the front door. It was polished blue wood, a rare wood in these parts that had a bluish tinge to it. It looked nice in contrast to the rest of the building. For a moment or two Kelly stood before the door hesitantly before finally ringing the bell, they had barely stood there half a minute before an Inairai girl answered the door, she looked a lot like Kelly, if a little older, she had the same expressive purple eyes, and the same pale green skin, her eight boobs had the same general shape as well, her figure was excellent and lies just like Kelly, the Inairai was incredibly cute as well, she smiled when she saw them, a glint of recognition in her eyes, or oh, Kelly, glad you could make it. She turned towards Kairu, and said, and you must be Kairu. Kelly sounds absolutely enchanted with you. Do come in, I'd like to get to know you. The older Inairai stepped aside, and opened the door wider allowing them to enter the house. 
The foyer area was furnished with a few cozy chairs, a sofa, and a couple of tables. The walls were decorated with a few photos, all of them depicting naked girls in natural settings. None of the photos seemed lewd, a few were posed, but others were clearly taken in the moment sort of deal. Despite the lack of clothing they seemed surprisingly tasteful. Who was in the photos varied a little, she noted a few neku, and a few different denarii in the photos. One of the photos even looked to be a younger version of Kelly. Kairu was pretty sure it was a younger Kelly, as while her mother looked a lot like her there were subtle differences. Just enough to tell them apart, and they weren't just related to age. Her gaze didn't linger on the furnishings however, as she soon noticed two little faces poking around the corner. One in Iri, the other Neku. Both of them seemed quite young. She flashed them both a smile, and was greeted with giggles moments before they ducked around the corner vanishing. Kelly's mother turned to her and smiled. I see you noticed my younger daughters. Don't mind them. They are just curious. Anyway I haven't introduced myself. I'm Lelu. She glanced at Kelly. Could you look after your younger sisters for me? and keep an eye on the nursery as well. If I hear crying, you are getting a spanking, got that? Kelly shuddered, nodded and ran off, leaving Kairu alone, and not sure what just happened. Lelu turned back to her, that should be good practice for her, especially since she is expecting a child of her own. Kairu watched her go, I know, she is utterly ecstatic about it, but why punish her for a little crying? That's what babies do, Lelu sighed. Yes Neku babies cry, but only to get the attention of inept Neku mothers, and in Iri, if she is paying attention, can sense a baby's needs often before the child is even aware of them herself. So naturally if I hear crying, that means Kelly wasn't paying attention to them. Anyway that isn't why we are here, she gestured to a seat, please sit, and would you like anything to drink? Kairu shook her head, and settled into the indicated seat, Lelu settled into another and smiled. I see why my daughter likes you so much, you must have quite the talent since you are blocking me, but I guess you don't have much training, or perhaps you just don't have much experience with kids, have you had a kid of your own before? Kairu sighed, no, I've not had one myself, the Anari woman nodded, I thought so, raise any pets? Kairu frowned, I had a few growing up, why ask? She leaned back in her seat, raising a pet and raising a child are not entirely dissimilar skills, now don't get me wrong. There are differences, but the skill sets have their parallels. In many respects, raising a pet prepares you for raising a kid, Kyra nodded. I guess it does in a way. Although that isn't a comparison I would have made, Lelu giggled. Most wouldn't even think of the comparison. I guess not, Lelu shifted, her demeanor suddenly more serious. I don't suppose I could convince you to stop blocking me? Kyra shook her head. I've had enough of people in my head. I see, guess we will do this the old-fashioned way. Tell me about yourself, I'd like to know what kind of woman my daughter is dating. Kairu blushed slightly, but wasn't that surprised by the statement. She shifted herself to make herself more comfortable and settled in for a long conversation. There were some things she couldn't share, but that didn't mean everything she said would have to be a lie. The best lies had a grain of truth in them after all. Although she had no idea where to begin with this announcement. Enjoying my work? Consider joining me on Patreon leaving a comment or just leave a like, also do consider checking out my other stories such as CS, which has nearly 20 chapters published here on Patreon. 19. Chapter 77 Kelly's Childhood Home I, Kairu stretched a bit in her seat, it had been a couple of hours since she had started talking with Lelu, they had spent that time getting to know each other, and she was beginning to get a little more comfortable, although she still wished she hadn't been ambushed with a visit to Kelly's childhood home. Then again, Thinking back, she remembered her own mother could be a little forceful at times, especially when she was dating someone. Kairu also realized what meeting Kelly's mother meant about their relationship, but she wondered how well that applied with the Anairai. She already knew from her previous conversations with Megumi that the Solians were pretty casual about their sexual relationships. From what she had seen and discussed she knew the Anairai didn't quite think like her own people did either. Yet she had a feeling that meeting the parents still had a similar meaning for them as it did for her own kind. Lelu suddenly asked her a question, one that caught her a little off guard. Has Kelly told you anything about raising an Anairai child? She blinked. Um, what? No. She hasn't. Why? Lelu sighed. I was afraid of that. Well it's her first child, so maybe it just slipped her mind. Kairu frowned. Is there something I should know? The Anairai woman nodded. 
If you are to help raise my grandchild there is a lot you should know. Raising an Anirai child isn't the same as raising an Aku child. She paused for a moment, possibly considering her next words before continuing. I guess I should start with the obvious, Arshanic ability. We are born with limited telepathy. As we get older that telepathy becomes stronger and more potent. It also has an impact on our mental development. It allows us to pick up concepts more quickly but more importantly, it allows for mother and child to bond on a level that your kind normally cannot. There is nothing more intimate for a mother and her child to share than their own thoughts and feelings for each other. Kairu shifted, her mind linking dots. I see, that explains why Kelly wanted a child so badly. Lelu giggled, all in I desire to have a child of their own, and share that kind of bond with their own daughter. It's a very fulfilling experience, one that some may use questionable means to obtain. Although that is not a subject for today, Kairu idly noted that statement down, but said nothing. It was certainly something to follow up on later. It had implications, some of them rather concerning. After a moment the Anirai woman continued in a more serious tone. Anyway, what you need to know most about us, is that not only do we match you more quickly mentally, but that we do so physically as well. Kairu blinked. What do you mean? How old do you think my baby Kelly is? Kairu was silent for a moment. She had the looks of a young woman, and often behaved like one too. Although she did occasionally behave childishly. Um, late teens? No older than twenty. Lelia laughed. She isn't quite that old yet. Her ninth birthday is in a month. Kairu didn't know what to say and just stared blankly for a moment trying to picture that. Kelly didn't seem like she could be that young. A lump formed in her belly as she realized what that meant. Something Lalu seemed to pick up on. It's not like that. Age is just a number and what applies to one race doesn't apply to another. Where an Eku takes about 15 years to develop from infancy to maturity and an Iri takes only 5 years. In effect, she is equivalent to 20 years of age for an Eku. Pushing the lump down she replied, I see. That did make things better, and the idea wasn't entirely alien to her. The Academy had an entire course on this subject. It was well known that different species matured differently. Although that didn't mean parallels couldn't be drawn between two races, the concept of legal age became rather complicated when multiple species were factored in. Even more so when you considered the more unusual species, as some of those unusual species made things interesting. Very interesting in the more peculiar alien species out there some of which were so alien it was better for your sanity to not think about it, and others so weird you would swear the gods that shaped them must have been perverts with questionable morality, and tastes. Thankfully races like those were quite rare. Most sentient races were similar to the Neku in terms of their physical and mental development, although that still left plenty of room for variance. As the Anirai seemed to demonstrate, it sounded like they were on the fast growth side of the curve, whereas her own kind were more solidly placed on the average growth rate part of the curve. Lelu stretched lazily. Anyway, growth rates aside, the only other big difference to note is that we have tentacles rather than arms. It certainly makes things a little different, but I think Kelu can teach you about everything that entails. A question occurred to Kairu then. I see, but why are you telling me all this? Wouldn't Kelu want to do this all on her own? Lelu gave her a look. Of course, she would, but sooner or later she will need to learn to take advantage of what assistance she has available. Close friends or lovers that you can trust are good picks. At the moment Kelly trusts you, and having talked to you I can see why Kelly likes you. Her mood shifted suddenly at that moment, and Kairu felt a shiver run down her spine, but if you hurt my baby girl, I will hunt you down and make sure you regret it. Objectively she knew Lelu could never hurt her. But that didn't make her any less intimidating. Kairu had a sudden understanding about a few phrases she had heard about mothers over the years. They certainly seemed to describe what just happened really well. Almost as if what just happened never did. Lelu seemed to flip a switch. Her mood returning back to the previous one. Also, if you two need it, you know where to find me. I'm right here if either of you need advice or assistance. Kairu replied. I'll keep that in mind. Lelu glanced at a clock, and then she stood up. Anyway, we should check in on Kelly. We've been talking a while, and she might need some help. Not to mention it's almost feeding time for the little ones. That reminded Kairu. Lelu had mentioned a nursery. She had also seen two young ones, little kids that seemed to both be around eight, maybe nine. Although with what she had just heard it seemed that the Anira kid was likely younger. A lot younger. Kairu also had to wonder how many kids were here, 
and how many of them were Neku taken away from their mothers. She nodded, Kelly might appreciate the relief. With that, she was led deeper into the house. The exit from the foyer led into a hall, and an open door showed her a kitchen where she could see both of the girls she saw earlier. They were happily chowing down on some food, but it seemed Kelly wasn't in the room. Lelu glanced around the room, and with a satisfied look said, This way, Kelly seems to be in the nursery. She nodded, and then asked, Out of curiosity how many children do you have right now? Five right now. Those two in the kitchen and three little ones. Most of them are Neku I'm looking after. But Talu, the Anairai girl you saw, is my youngest. She turned three just recently. Kairu frowned, and couldn't help but ask, Do any of them have contact with their birth mothers? Lelu blinked, gave her a look, noticed the tendency of my sisters have you? Relax, I'm not like that. All of them have regularly scheduled and supervised visits with their birth mothers. A child needs to bond with her own mother just as much as the caretaker after all. Kairu blinked. Maybe there was hope for the Anairai race? She was about to reply but Lelu continued, not all of my kind share my beliefs though. Most believe that once they remove a child from her mother's care, she should be kept away from her mother for years. Honestly only one year is sufficient and after that supervised visits is enough to establish a natural bond rather than creating one artificially ten years down the line. Kairu gave her a look, so you keep them away for a year? Lelu nodded, just long enough to ensure they bond with me, and make sure the bond is strong, although most prefer not to bother with supervised visits, especially younger in Iri who see any child they take as their own, regardless of who birthed them, I noticed. They forget that we are here to help you neck you as much as we are for ourselves. They think that just because we are the superior race we have the right to do as we please. To a degree that is true, but we can't forget our purpose. And what is that? Lelu gave her a look. Something to discuss another time. Although you seem to be a very smart and perceptive girl, I'm sure you will figure it out on your own. And what kind of mother would I be if I just gave you all the answers? <laughs> Kairu hadn't expected that answer, but it was worth a shot to ask the question. Before she could reply, Lelu paused at a door, and opened it. During the whole conversation they had gone up a flight of stairs, and down another hall. A couple of open doors showed bedrooms, and one bathroom that they had passed on the way here. Looking into the room, she noted its contents. It was clearly the nursery with three baby beds set up, a few tables, a playpen, and a bathroom in the corner. The bathroom was open to the rest of the room, and clearly designed for little girls. It had a tiny toilet, and a tiny tub. There was also a sink next to the child-sized toilet. A fancy-looking fence controlled access. That bathroom area was also where Kelly was standing at the moment, her tentacles helping a small girl sit on the tiny toilet, a girl who looked a little too young to be using it. In the playpen another girl, perhaps a year old, was playing with large blocks. A rather normal and innocent scene. At least until you noticed that she was completely naked without even a diaper. The last girl was in her bed, and she too was completely naked. No diapers? Lelu giggled. Haven't been around many Anairai caretakers, have you? Kairu shook her head. We don't use them. No need. As they are quite unnecessary. At that moment Kelly looked up from where she was helping the youngest girl, and added her own two cents. We don't really need to use them, as we can sense when a child needs to go. Not to mention that thanks to our telepathic ability we can start toilet training much earlier than a neck you can. Kairu frowned. That works? Kelly nodded, and Lalu elaborated. It does, with enough patience. Babies don't like just letting it out wherever, but the muscles needed to hold it are unused when they are born and therefore weak. They need to be taught how to exercise them and build them up. It doesn't take too long to teach them though. Only a couple of months on average. After that they are potty trained. Kairu hadn't expected to hear that, yet, perhaps she should have, it seemed telepathy had advantages she had never even thought to consider, if she had, maybe she would have thought to ask Kelly about things like this earlier. So I take it you already potty trained these three, Lelu nodded, I have she replied as she moved towards the one in the bed who seemed to have noticed her presence and was reaching up, clearly wanting to be held, even if she wasn't vocal about it, Lelu picked her up and the girl quickly found a nipple and started sucking. Honestly, it was kind of cute. Lelu smiled, and glanced at Kelly. I think she is about done. Clean her up and put her in the pen. I'll be a while. So why don't you and your friend head downstairs and get something to eat? Kelly nodded, and with a tentacle grabbed a rag, wet it in the sink, and wiped the little one down. She was gentle but thorough about it. It only took her a moment, and then she lifted the little one up, and carried her over to the pen. 
As soon as the girl was down, she motored it to join the other girl playing with the blocks. Everyone in the room watched her as she crawled the distance to her sibling playing with the blocks. She reached the other girl and grabbed a block already giggling. Her sibling smiled and handed her a second block. It was a remarkably cute sight. Kairi wanted to watch a little longer, but Kelly dragged her out of the room. Announcement. Eager for more? Leave a like, a comment and consider joining me on Patreon, where the next part is already up. 18. Chapter 78 Kelly's Childhood Home 2 As Kelly led Kairu down the stairs, Kairu couldn't help but ask Megumi a few questions. She couldn't help but wonder about what she had just been told. Especially since it raised a lot of questions, Megumi replied quickly. The effects of telepathic interaction on young children are well documented by Solian Medical Science. I have numerous studies on file in my medical library. So you can verify the veracity of her statements? I can. She isn't wrong, but there is a lot she left unsaid. Telepathic interaction between mother and child at such young ages stimulates neuron development in several key areas. This accelerates the mental development of the child allowing the child to pass critical developmental markers earlier than they would otherwise, such as the development of complex language skills. This allows them to pick up concepts faster and to communicate more effectively at a younger age. Such interaction also allows for more complex learning to occur at a much younger age which has numerous beneficial ramifications. Could you define that for me please? I could. I'll give you a basic rundown. At such a young age the brain develops more quickly and can learn more easily. Being able to start complex learning earlier is a significant advantage that sets the child up for success later in life. Not only that but on average children stimulated telepathically from birth exhibit much higher intelligence than they would have otherwise exhibited. We aren't talking about a small increase either, as it's 25 points on average compared to a non-telepathic baseline, although some cases have been as high as 100 points. Furthermore such children are more likely to exhibit advanced shinnik ability later in life. That was a lot to take in, and Megumi hadn't even really covered what Lalu had said about early potty training. She still had some questions about that, quite a few questions. So she asked. Teaching the concept would be the easy part, the real challenge is the fact that the muscles are not quite developed, and there are a few other factors at play. Still what she said is believable, and no doubt it took months to achieve. I doubt those girls can hold it very long at their age, but long enough perhaps to alert their caretaker and make it to the toilet. So on the mental side of things they are at least potty trained. The physical side may need more development, but that comes with time and patience. That was interesting and answered a few questions. Others were raised, and some were just left unanswered. Unfortunately, it seemed she no longer had time to ask, as she had already reached the kitchen. The two girls, it seemed, had finished eating and had found some playing cards. It was kind of cute watching them play. Kelly let go of her hand, and headed for the pantry. Mom bought some nice fish for today. I'm going to start preparing it, and she'll join us in a little bit when she is done feeding the little ones. Kyra nodded. I guess she might. Need any help? Kelly nodded. Mom would expect you to help, anyway. Kyra replied. Yeah about that. Any idea where exactly I stand with your mother? Kelly turned around. Well my mum, like most in Iri, see Neku as inferior, but I think she recognizes that you are special. Kairu blinked and then glanced at the two kids playing cards. The Inairai girl Talu seemed rather frustrated in fact, not to mention entirely focused on the game. Kelly noticed her gaze and preempted the question. Are them? Don't worry about those two. They aren't even listening to us. I see. Is that a good thing? Kelly nodded. Yeah, I think it is, as she'll treat you more like an equal than she otherwise would have. Kairu replied, that does sound like a good thing, guess I'll see. Kelly entered the pantry, and said, anyway we should get started. The fish mum bought is in the fridge, middle shelf. You can't miss it. Kairu acknowledged and made for the fridge. She found the fish easily enough, three fresh looking specimens. They weren't even filleted. Each one was wrapped in paper, and placed on a platter. She carefully removed them from the fridge. Thanks to her physique she hardly noticed their weight, but something told her that it should have been heavy. It wasn't something that was a little surprising since they were large and prime specimens. Kelly had retrieved a number of veggies while she was getting the fish out, noting the amounts. Kairu commented, are we expecting company? This seems a bit much for just the three of us, it still seems much even if we factor in the kids. Yeah it does seem a little much, but this is what she told me to prepare. Kairu frowned. I thought she just said to get something to eat. Kelly nodded, she did, but as we were leaving she gave more specific instructions. 
Kairu read between the lines. I see, she then glanced at the three large fish. So you don't know why we are preparing so much either? Kelly shook her head. No, but if I had to guess Nana, my other mother is coming over. I hope I'm wrong about that. That didn't sound good. Should I be worried? Kelly was quick to dismiss that. No, I'm sure you will be fine. It's just Nana can be. Kelly trailed off, and shuddered. Kairu decided that she really should be worried. Unfortunately, it didn't seem like Kelly was ready to tell her what was bothering her. They ended up working together mostly in silence after that. The admiral made her way down the corridor. She wasn't entirely sure what the research division wanted to see her about, but the director sounded very excited about something. Unfortunately she wasn't willing to say what over the lines. So here she was, at the fleet testing grounds and heading to see the director about some breakthrough. That did not mean she had no idea about what the director might want to show her. They had been working very extensively lately on several projects, all of which were based on the data brought back from the precursor warship they had found, although to her knowledge none of those projects were even close to producing anything worth calling a breakthrough. The Admiral didn't bother speculating however, since she would know the answer soon enough. It just wasn't the time to waste on pointless speculation. So rather than think about the immediate problem, she decided to think about her other problem. The war with the Nekia had changed rather suddenly. The Imperium was no longer advancing into a really controlled space, other than a few sporadic offensives here and there. The war had become a stalemate. At first glance this seemed like good news, but she had no idea why their war machine had stalled so suddenly. The changes gave her pause, and the Admiral could not help but feel worried. They had to be planning something. The question was what? More importantly when and where, she couldn't help but suspect they might be planning an attack on the home world itself. If they were, that begged the question. Where was the staging ground for such an attack? It would have to be in a system near Iral, but not connected to the system by the jump nodes. If it was, they would already know about it. As every system connected to the home world by the jump nodes was controlled by the confederated systems, the worlds, the habitable ones anyway, in those systems had long been colonized by the early people, and were heavily defended as a result, there was no system on a direct jump path to the homeworld that wasn't patrolled or defended by the confederated navy. That Imperium didn't use jump drives however, so they weren't limited by the jump nodes. With that in mind, she was left with a few candidates. There were three systems in relative proximity to Errol that the Neki might use. Two of them however, were according to last report, under the control of Eroli forces. That left only one candidate in her mind. It was a lush system with three habitable worlds. But reaching it was difficult since there was only one known jump node into the system. Even the fastest ships would take weeks to reach the system from here. She had found one ship, a cruiser on deep space patrol that was much closer. They would be there in three days. She had told them to be cautious, but if the Neku were there it might not mean much. Still, regardless of what happens, they would know soon enough what was going on in the Nifery system. She put that aside and hit the bell chime for the director's office. The response was immediate, and she was allowed into the office. The director was a younger woman, and she rose as the admiral walked in. The admiral took a moment to take in her attire which was a very skimpy top that only concealed one boob, and left the other completely exposed. Down below all she wore was a simple pair of matching panties. It was a visual reminder that the director had a higher status than she did. So the director had no need to stand on the admiral's arrival. The director smiled. I'm glad you could make it so quickly. She gestured to the door. If you would follow me, I have something game changing to show you. The admiral blinked, and stepped aside which allowed the director out of the room, and started to follow. If I may ask, what did you ask me here to see? A new weapon. One of our new hires proved to be quite insightful. When shown the alien data, she put together something quite interesting. A phase coherent particle weapon. But honestly I think it's best you see it for yourself before I tell you the specifics. We've set up a demonstration using an old Saleran battleship. A Saleran battleship? They had one of those, and they were using it for a practice target? The Salerans were excellent shipbuilders and were technologically on par with the confederated systems in most aspects, except two, they were well ahead of them in terms of hull construction and energy shielding technology. As a result their ships were notoriously difficult to destroy, although thankfully the Salerans were terrible warriors, they often made poor use of their ships in war. As such they had lost the last three wars with the ECS, 
If we have a sailor and vessel, why are we using it for target practice? She isn't what she used to be. Her defense systems are fully operational, but her weapons and engines are completely non-functional. They were slagged by the crew after our forces boarded her in the last war. Thankfully we kept them from sabotaging the shields. It gave us time to study their shielding technology, but there isn't anything left to be learned from the old girl. The shield improvements we implemented three years ago were the last egg that ship had to give us. The last war had been a little over ten years ago. That meant they had the ship for at least a decade. It did answer a few things though. I see. The rest of the walk was done in silence. It wasn't a far walk to the observation blister. The director took a seat, and invited her to sit down next to her. The admiral complied, and directed her view out to the stars. In the distance was the recognizable hulk of a Salerian battleship. It was a massive ship, nearly seven kilometers long. Its sheer size alone meant it was a major strategic asset. Yet here it was about to be used as target practice. That said something. A moment later the director gave the signal for the test to begin. A moment later a short, but intense, beam of blue light raked across the hull of the alien battleship. Her shields flared brightly for a moment or two before they buckled. The intense energy burned right through the hull and out the other side. In an instant a massive ship, a real terror of the battlefield from a race famed for their ships being nearly impossible to destroy was bisected. From stem to stern the beam cut through the hull as if it was wet tissue paper. Fires erupted, and plasma jetted out into space. Something exploded, and all she could do was stare. What the hell was that? Announcement. I hope you enjoyed the chapter. Also Merry Christmas. In other news, the rewrite for Damadag will be dropping soon. Do check it out, and consider joining me on Patreon where advanced chapters will be available. The rewrite will be available here if it is not already. Also do consider checking out my other work Chronicles of Soul 20, Chapter 79 Company. Lelu came down the stairs, already she could smell the fish cooking. She was keeping a mental eye on the little ones, but they should be settled for now. They were clean, they were fed, and they were all playing in the playpen. She didn't plan to leave them completely unattended for long though. That was just asking for trouble. Talu had been asking for a chance to look after her younger siblings lately and this would be a good chance for it. Entering the kitchen, she observed for a moment. Kelly and Kairi were working together making today's midday meal. Watching them work stirred her heart. It was just so sweet, and nice to see her little Kelly had found someone. Kairu seemed like a nice girl, a very nice girl, and with the way she was blocking her, it seemed obvious that Kairu had talent, strong talent. Kelly had done well to find such a desirable partner. Her heart swelled with motherly pride at the concept, especially with how Kelly had already managed to get a child with her. Such genes could only lead to a strong child. A part of her couldn't wait to meet her first grandkid. It would also give her something to brag about since she was the youngest of her own blood sisters, and none of them had grandchildren yet. Although some of her blood sisters had more children of their own. Her line of thought was broken by the ringing of the bell. Both Kelly and Kyrie looked up, but she informed them that she would get it. It seemed the rest of her guests for the day had arrived. Lelu hurried to the door, and used the monitor to check the external house sensors before opening the door. Outside she was greeted with the familiar face one she wasn't entirely happy to see, but she had invited her over. For Kelly's sake, she could bury her feelings for a bit, and not cause a scene. Standing next to her were two cute little Neku girls. One seemed to be about six, the other eight. A third Neku girl was coming up from the truck freshly parked in the street, with a basket in hand. Ah, Mayu, glad you could make it. She smiled. When I heard Kelly found someone she likes I just had to come over and meet the girl. Do come in, and I don't believe I've met these two before. Ah, I took them in after our little split. She gave Mayu a look. You mean kidnap them after we split don't you? Maru giggled. You make it sound so immoral and illegal. Besides, it's only kidnapping if the birth mother was an Irai. Lelu sighed. She didn't particularly want to have this conversation again. Maru's little jab was meant to remind her about the laws. But they both knew that Maru was only following the letter, not the spirit of those laws. Let's not have this talk again. We aren't here to talk about old problems anyway, but to celebrate Kelly finding a girlfriend. Mary nodded. Yes we are, but only if she picked someone worthy of her. Lelu smiled. Oh, I think she has good taste. Lelu just hoped that Mary would agree. As Kelly didn't need her causing trouble and poking into her life. Especially since she knew that Mary would have preferred Kelly hooking up with another in Irai. Mary seemed to look down on any Nekia that she didn't personally raise. Although there were a couple of exceptions, 
She hoped Kairu would impress Maru. Kairu was checking the fish when she heard a bit of a commotion. Looking towards the entrance, she noted three young Neki girls and an unfamiliar Inairai woman entering, accompanied by the familiar face of Lalu. It seemed they were indeed expecting company. The two Inairai women weren't talking, but she had the distinct impression they were communicating telepathically. Not only that, but there seemed to be a tension between them. She glanced towards Kelly who also noticed the newcomers, and her expression told her everything she needed to know. Today was going to be far more interesting than she thought. After her outburst the director said nothing for a moment or two, letting the spectacular sight of so large a vessel being destroyed in a single shot speak for itself. At least for a moment or two. That, Admiral, is our newest weapon. The photon lance. It's based on a precursor weapon described to us in the data brought back from our teams aboard the ISS constellation. In simple terms the photon lance is a particle laser. It fires a highly coherent stream of charged particles and photons. Better yet, it doesn't even use traditional spatial lensing field generators to focus the beam, allowing us to make the weapon smaller. Although it does have some fairly hefty power requirements. Not to mention there is a lot of room for improvement, but then again our photon lance is merely an imperfect replica of the phase lance that was described to us by the data. With results like that, she could believe it, however it might certainly be worth it, imperfect replica or not. A few of those could change the war. Only one question was on her mind, how soon before we could roll these out to the fleet? The director sighed, six months, minimum, possibly longer. Six months, the war could be over by then. If what she feared was true, they needed these things now. I'm sorry, but that is the best I can do. If what I suspect is true that might not be good enough. Her expression shifted. I know, but there is nothing I can do. We need time to work out refit plans, and retool military factories to produce certain components. That six-month figure really is the best we can do. As it is, the six-month plan is going to put a severe strain on our resources to accomplish. I see. The admiral looked back out to the wreckage, in that case, how soon can we have a few outfitted to a small number of ships, a rapid response force, if you will. She looked thoughtful for a number, that might be doable, I can order more components from the same foundry that produced the parts for the prototype, they aren't equipped for mass production, so it will be slow, with the parts we already have, we could outfit one battleship by the end of the week. Any more we'll have to wait. How many ships do you think can be done in two months? Conservatively, about ten. That wasn't a lot, but it was better than nothing. It might not be enough, or it might be too slow. Still, they had to try. She requested for the director to get a move on that plan. I'll get it done, but I hope this effort proves unnecessary. So do I, but I fear the neck you are about to launch a major offensive. Their recent moves only reinforce that impression. I just hope I am wrong, and I'm reading too much into things, if not. She let the end hang. The director excused herself, leaving the admiral standing there, worrying for the future. Kelly sighed, as she picked at her plate. At the moment she wished she could be anywhere but here. Tell you however had wisely gone upstairs with the little ones, leaving her alone with her two mothers. Honestly she knew she should have said no to this whole thing, but Lalia was her bond mother. She couldn't really say no to her mothers, and especially not her bond mother. She glanced at Kairu, tempted to plead with her to do something. Kelly may not be able to do anything, but Kairu could. Part of her wished Kairu would rescue her from this, especially as her mothers continued their never-ending war. It never ended. They were always arguing over one thing or the other, it just never ended. Where was a good pit when she needed one? Mayu glared, I'll admit that she is talented, and pretty, but that doesn't mean she is good enough for my little Kelly. Oh, get off that high chair of yours, Kairu is an excellent pick for her first mate. Well if she is so dead set on a neck you for first mate, why not my little Kiri? Kiri? She's twelve, way too young for that, not a problem. Sure they can't have sex just yet. It just means the two will have more time to bond before things get serious, and Kelly would have time to mature a little more before she actually settles down and has a kid. Kelly slumped in her chair a bit. It didn't help that they were arguing over who she dates. It was her choice. Mother had always made that clear, but it seemed Nana had a bit of a problem with who she had picked. Honestly, she didn't understand it. By every metric Kairu was perfect. She was fun to talk to, beyond cute, and oh so delectably special part of why she had rushed to have a kid with her, something she wasn't sure Nana would react well about. Mother on the other hand, she knew would approve, she glanced back at Kairu who didn't seem to be enjoying the meal any more than she was, 
a part of her once again tempted to ask her for help out of this situation. Kairu suddenly pushed out of the chair and stood. Both of her mothers looked towards the Nekya girl, who spoke. Kelly, could you show me the bathroom? Kelly blinked, and then her eyes widened. Perhaps a little too eagerly she nodded, and wrapped a tentacle around Kairu's hand. Leading her out of the room, and down the hall, she went towards the bathroom of course. But she had a feeling that Kairu didn't actually need to use the bathroom. Perhaps they could have a little fun, and avoid the argument for a few minutes. As the door closed behind them, she kissed Kairu deeply. Kairu was slow to respond at first, but soon their tongues were dueling for a moment. Only for a moment, however, before they broke apart. Thank you. Thank you for getting me out of there. Kelly gushed happily. She was more than glad to be away from her mothers when they were having a disagreement. Kairu scratched her head just behind her ear cutely. Well I had a feeling you were just as uncomfortable as I was, probably more so. Well since we are both here, care for a little fun? It might buy us a little extra time. Kairu smiled. I think that does sound like a good idea. While we are at it though, mind explaining what exactly is up with your mother's? Kelly sighed. Beyond the obvious? Kairu nodded. Well, um, my mothers don't exactly agree on many issues. Especially when it comes to the Neku. Yeah that much I figured out. They also have a fair number of disagreements about me. I hate it when it happens. Kairu started stroking her back. It helped, as she felt a lump she wasn't aware of slowly work itself out from the stroking, something she leaned into. After a moment, she started speaking again, explaining what she knew about this. How her mothers were pretty diametrically opposed on many issues, how they disagreed on the raising of Neku children, and so on. Some of it went unsaid, especially the parts that she herself was uncomfortable with. She knew Nana's feelings about the Neku quite well. Kelly didn't share them, never had, but that didn't seem to mean anything to Nana. Despite her flaws, she still loved Nana, and didn't want Kairu to hate her. So she left off everything that made her uncomfortable with Nana. Perhaps it was wrong, and a part of her was torn about it, yet she had this strange sense that Kairu knew she was hiding something, but Kairu never pried. Instead, when she finished Kairu gave her another kiss, and then whispered into her ear. Her heart fluttered and she felt herself grow warmer. Then she sensed Nana coming. She pushed Kairu down. Nana is coming. Let's have a little fun now. She won't bother us if she sees us having some fun. Kairu smirked. And, 21. Chapter 80 at the spa again. May followed the pair into the spa building. They had only stopped to have a quick bite to eat on the way here before Riku's spa appointment. Probably something the Neku girl sorely needed after spending most of the day having her mind picked through and memories erased. Yeria led the way into the familiar reception area where an Anirai girl greeted them. There was a quick exchange, and then she said, Ah, Riku, right this way. We are starting off with an oil rub. Then we will be moving on to a tit and pussy massage. Yeria smiled, being more direct already. Are we? Yes. She proved most receptive last time. Well enough that we feel we can move more directly today. I see. Might be a little too fast, don't you think? Maybe. But you have her well in hand don't you? I do, but I don't want to move too fast. You know what I mean? The other girl shrugged. I do, but it's too late to rework the schedule. Just stay close and keep her in check. I'll do my best, replied Yuria. May noted that she didn't seem happy about this, though. Not that she was going to complain. If they were moving faster perhaps she could get more answers about what they were up to here, more definitive ones. In any case, it would make it easier to reverse later if they actually knew for sure what they were up to here. The group headed deeper into the building, and were soon led to a small room. It had one of those massage beds in it, and a special shower as well. It wasn't the same room as last time, but the setup was similar. She did note it had an extra table with an array of odd tools on it. The purpose of which was rather unclear, and May didn't know for sure what they were to be used for. She did have her theories, but that was just speculation. Riku was directed to step into the shower, first. It was activated almost as soon as she stepped into the shower. Several moving arms sprayed her down with a light pink fluid. Perhaps the same kind of oil as last time. Automated brushing arms moved in, to rub it in. The automatic shower didn't stop there this time. As the spray arms activated again, and sprayed her down with a second fluid. It was also pink, but of a different shade. Again automated brushing arms rubbed it into her skin and fur. The shower took only a few minutes to complete its work, and then allowed Riku to step out. Where the two in Nairai were standing by to rub her down with some kind of oil. 
they paid special attention to her boobs and pussy, even using those wide area injectors on those sensitive areas several times. Each time elicited a sharp gasp from Riku, but otherwise, she didn't even react or question what they were doing. If anything she was quite docile and compliant. They spent several minutes working various oils into her skin and injecting various compounds under her skin. During which time, May noted Riku's body became increasingly aroused. Her skin grew flushed, her nipples swelled and hardened, and her pussy puffed up, the lower lips begging to bloom and glisten. They even twitched occasionally. Neither Yuria or the new Inairi spoke until one of them grabbed one of the odd tools off the table. It was a short rod that ended in a rounded tip with several prongs spreading in front of it. The design and shaping of the prongs were quite unusual but rather suspicious, they were oddly split in a fashion that suggested they were meant to spread something open, while a second smaller set was meant to grip something. She had an inkling of what it was meant to be used on. Especially after it was adjusted, the words that were spoken a moment later only confirmed those suspicions. Okay Riku dear, I'm going to use this on your clit. You are going to feel quite a bit of discomfort when I do. Don't worry, it's perfectly normal. Afterward, your clit is going to be extremely sensitive, and raw to the touch. That is normal too, and nothing for you to worry about. Understood? Yes, I understand, responded Riku seeming rather dazed and out of touch. With that, Yuria pressed the device against Riku's pussy. The special prongs spread her labia, giving the second set of gripping prongs clear access to her swollen clit. They gripped it holding it straight. Riku grimaced slightly as the device was secured against her sensitive flesh. Then Yuria activated the little thing. The sphere glowed briefly before sending a stream of light into her clit. The instant that beam hit the little nerve bundle, Riku cried out, but otherwise didn't react. Yuria stroked her head. It's okay, I know it hurts. Just put up with it for a few minutes, and we will be done. One of her other tentacles reached out, and picked up a second device. It was also a rod, but it had a different design for its gripping prongs. There were two of them on the table. May had the impression that they were meant to be used on the nipples. Now I'm going to use this on your nipples. It shouldn't be as bad as your clit right now, but it won't be comfortable. That's okay though, and perfectly normal. Nothing for you to worry about. When the device is done, your nipples will be raw and overly sensitive for a while. Okay, Rika nodded, and held back her whimpers. Whatever these devices were meant to do, they were not gentle about it. Not gentle at all. Yuria attached the ones to her nipples one by one. Starting with her left nipple, then her right. Doing so quickly and efficiently, Riku didn't resist at all. When they were activated each one sent a beam of light into one of her nipples and caused Riku to cry out again. Yuria paused to keep her calm, and then while the devices did their work they continued to rub strange oils into her flesh. They were careful however to make sure the devices weren't disturbed while they did their work, a process that ended up taking several minutes to complete. The devices all shut themselves down automatically when they were done, and the Anairi simply removed them when they were done. They placed them aside, and immediately began massaging her boobs, and pussy, no longer bothering with the oils. It was clear now the goal was only to stimulate her, so that it was what they did, bringing the Neku woman to the heights of pleasure again and again. Riku was putty in their tentacles, unable to resist both mentally and physically. They helped her up onto the table before her legs gave out. Eventually, after countless orgasms, Yuria spoke to Riku. Okay we are going to let you rest for a moment. Riku responded slowly. Okay. That sounds. Nice. Yuria stroked her head. You'll be glad to know you are doing great. After you have had a chance to rest. We are going to conduct a few tests. We need some data on your sensitivity and state of arousal. Perfectly normal after a special massage like this one. Riku just nodded. At this point, it seemed fairly obvious what kind of grip they had on the poor girl's mind. Not to mention she had a very strong idea about what they were doing to her here. Especially since she had taken the chance to scan her while the oils, injections, and devices were doing their work. Kairu rolled over and stretched, feeling the lovely feeling of soft sheets against her naked skin. It was wonderful. Opening her eyes, she was greeted with the familiar face of Lalu. She blinked. For a moment she was confused. Last thing she recalled was coming into the bedroom with Kalu after a bit of fun in the bathroom. She flushed as her memories of earlier came back in a rush. Even now she wasn't entirely sure how it had happened, but she had somehow ended up in a foursome with Kelly And her two mothers. Her blush deepened as she remembered how exuberant they had been. A seed of worry however blossomed in her heart, and she couldn't help but run a self-scan. 
Thankfully it took only moments, and when the result came back, she let out a breath of relief. That was one worry assuaged. Unfortunately, it left her with others, mainly about how she felt about the whole matter. She knew the Anirai didn't think much of it, it seemed they were pretty free when it came to sex. They did bond and create intimate relationships, but from what she had seen they were not beholden by them. Apparently, they didn't think much about incest either. Looking around, she noticed she was the only one awake. A quick glance at the clock revealed it was getting late. It seemed they had whiled away far more time than she had planned. Any idea why they don't seem to find incest taboo? A giggle was her first response to the message. But after a moment Megumi gave her a more serious answer. They don't have one for much the same reason the Solians don't. As a species both races enjoy remarkable adaptive DNA. They don't suffer negative effects from generational incest. Even if they did, their rather free nature ensures they maintain a high degree of genetic diversity. In fact, that is part of why they like to mate with Neku. The Anirai are designed to incorporate the best traits from the races they mate with, in a fashion that is similar to, but inferior to one that the Solians possess. What is this about the Solians? Well, it's not too important, but the Solians are shapeshifters. They learn new forms through physical contact with other life. Intimate contact is especially effective. In regards to the Anirai, they aren't shapeshifters, and what traits they acquire from others comes from either the mating itself or being implanted in the womb of another. I see. That reminds me. What is my child with Kelly going to be like? Especially given. I'll leave that for you to find out. Only thing I will say is that she won't be an ordinary child. Suddenly a tentacle wrapped around her and pulled her to the side. Where before she could even really process it, she was being kissed. Deeply. It lasted for a moment or two before the other girl pulled away. It wasn't Kelly, But surprisingly Miu. Miu smiled. I changed my mind. You might just be a good fit for my little Kelly after all. Kairu blinked. Um. Okay. Miu stretched. Just don't make me regret this decision. If you hurt my little Kelly, I'll make sure you live to regret it. Understand? Great. She happened to find the one subject both Kelly's mothers could agree on. Kyra nodded, not entirely sure what to make of this. Maybe this was a good thing. Although she couldn't help but feel that it wasn't. 19. Interlude a glimpse into the life of Kiri. The young girl stretched and slipped out of her bed. As the sheets fell from her frame, the cool air kissed her bare skin. The very sensation helped wake her up a little. She yawned. A glance at the clock told her that she was up a little earlier than normal. It was kind of tempting to just crawl back into bed and go back to sleep, but she knew if she did that she would oversleep, especially considering it was only a quarter before her usual wake-up time. Kiri slipped out of the room, as she considered today's schedule. Mommy Mayu was fairly strict. Something Kiri was quite familiar with. Oftentimes she wished that her mommy Mayu would give her a little more freedom like Lalu's girls had. Speaking of Lalu her recent visit had actually been a lot of fun. Especially after Mayu had joined that noisy sex pile in the main room. As that had allowed her to do what she wanted and really have fun for once. She sighed. Two bad days like that were so rare. Not that complaining about it helped. Mommy Mayu already knew she chafed against these restrictions, but her response was always the same. Kiri tried to put it from her mind, and slipped into the bathroom. She turned the water on, and started drawing a bath. The one good thing about waking up early meant she had a little more time to enjoy a nice bath. A good long soak certainly sounded nice. And at this hour she wouldn't be disturbed. At least not until her sisters started waking up. Once that happened it was going to start getting rather crowded in here. As the bathroom wasn't very big, and she had to share it with two others. Thankfully she didn't have to share it with all her sisters, but she sometimes wished she had a private bathroom. As the bath filled up with warm water she took the time to use the toilet, and take care of her teeth. Her hair and fur could wait until after the bath. By the time she was done the tub was about half filled, she slipped into the water and relished the feeling of the hot water against her skin. It was one of the few luxuries she could freely enjoy which made it all the more enjoyable. As she relaxed in the warm waters her mind drifted to today's schedule. They were on break so there wasn't any school today. That was one thing off her day. Unfortunately it had left more room in her schedule for one of mom's arranged dates. They were often supervised directly by mom. But not always. Mum always made sure she had behaved herself afterward. She sighed. She really didn't want to go on another one of these. Her problem wasn't the dates so much as the girls mom picked. She never liked any of them. Kiri knew why mom was doing this. What mommy Mayu wanted was for her to bond with someone. It was part of her plans, and Kiri had seen it with her older sisters. 
Mary made sure they kept in touch, but as soon as they were old enough they were allowed out for homes of their own, albeit with mates chosen for them by Mommy Mary. Kiri didn't really like the idea of that. Her mind was reminded of Lelu's children. Honestly she was jealous. They had more freedom. They could choose their mates. They did not have any of this arranged dating. Hell they even got to meet with their birth mothers. Kiri never got that luxury. She didn't even know who her birth mother was. She wasn't allowed to know, either. She sighed, and grabbed a brush. The young girl had soaked long enough. Besides she needed to get started on her bathing or she would not be sufficiently presentable. This was such a pain. Another spike of jealousy made itself known as she was again compared how much better things were for Lalu's daughters. She wished she was one of Lalu's daughters. She wished someone would rescue her from this nightmare that was her life. Then she heard the sounds of her sisters waking. With one last sigh, she took her thoughts and feelings on the matters and buried them in the one little corner where they would be safe the one little corner that Mummy Mario never seemed to reach. As she did so, she assumed the dutiful young girl persona that Mummy Mario wanted her to be. After all that corner was only part of her mind that was truly her own. The rest of her mind was open to Mario, and her manipulations. 15. Chapter 81 A Dragon's Day in the Sun Alira blinked and shifted in the warm sun, only to freeze in her movements. When she noticed something carefully, she shifted and glanced down at her own belly, which was currently facing up. There she noted two small forms curled up on her belly. Both of them were children even by NECU standards. Alira had rescued them from a crash transport about a week ago. It had been a supplely transport present when she had arrived to make her nest, and these two had been aboard at the time. From what Halira had been able to gather, they had been taken from their families by someone and were slated to be delivered to the Nekya home world of Neuri. Fortunately for them, their transport had a side trip here first. Otherwise, who knows what would have happened to these little ones. The younger one was only two, far too young to have been taken from her mother, while the older one was four. Still too young. Alira had considered trying to find their mothers, and in fact, with her powers she already had. It was easy to find the minds of a mother if you knew the child, unfortunately, neither mother remembered her child. Memory of these two had been completely wiped from them, as for why, Alira had gathered some information on that, these two had very strong talents, especially for a neku. In any case, Alira had come to the conclusion that it was better if they didn't go home, they were in danger there, so she had chosen to adopt these two, make them her own. But of course, adopting was something special among dragons. Already she could see the signs of it on the little ones. Fur was giving way, slowly to new fresh scales. A good sign really. The ritual had worked, and both of them now had dragon blood. Her blood running through their veins. In many respects, she had given them a great gift. With time they would manifest dragon abilities, and better yet, they would have a lifespan on par with that of a dragon. With a thought, she reached out with her powers, and gently scooped them up, beneath them. The very air transformed, turning solid. She shaped the transformed air, hardening it where needed and softening it where it mattered. She imbued the resulting cushions with dragon fire, bringing a pleasing warmth with it. An instant later she set down two cozy little cushions, topped with the sleeping forms of her new daughters. She carefully shifted her bulk with a grace that belied her large form. With just a bit of movement she lazily settled back down onto the valley soil outside her den. Her new position let her gaze at her two new daughters more easily. She found them quite cute, just sleeping there in the sun. Their skin was a little red, a sign they had been in the sun perhaps a little too long. It wasn't a problem though. With a thought, she focused her energies, and rays of light sprang forth to bathe the two little ones. In an instant, one of her favorite spells had done its work. Their skin returned to a much more normal coloration, although perhaps not quite as pale as it had been. The two were starting to turn a little something she internally marveled at. Healing magic rarely allowed that to happen when used to counteract something like sunburn. Regardless, she took this little inconvenience as the reminder it was. Her little ones had not yet learned how to protect themselves properly from the elements, and were likely still too young to do it. With a thought, she reached into the ground, and pulled forth two small little rocks, and a clump of soil. She quietly bathed the materials in dragon fire, while simultaneously bringing forth the power of the nature element, and star fire. A bit of light flared as the stone was imbued with the energies she was channeling. Its very structure changed as more magic filled it, and changed it. The soil soon transformed as well, changing from simple dirt, and hardening as its very structure was ripped apart and put back together at the most basic level. 
it shrank as it was reorganized, air was added, and changed to make up the lost material. Soon it was reshaped into two perfect little bands of pure silver. She wasn't quite done yet, as she took the stones which had changed into dazzling gemstones with gorgeous blue tones. These stones were now far more valuable than diamonds, and far more useful. She pushed each stone into the bands, at what was to be the front, while at the same time she carved draconic runes into the large silver rings floating before her. A quiet outburst alerted her to someone watching, and she glanced over as she continued her forging. The source was Young Su, one of her new caretakers. One she had been training in her new role. Alira smiled. Curious are you? Su so glanced at the shaping chokers, and asked, What are you doing? It's called Psi Forging, a mystic technique for turning the materials around you into whatever you desire. It's not as easy as it looks, by the way. It takes great understanding to turn simple dirt and rocks into something more useful. The technique isn't easy to learn either, and mistakes are dangerous. I did just reorganize matter at its most basic level after all. Reshaping atoms is no laughing matter. I can sense you are interested. But no, I will not teach you. You are not ready. Perhaps in a century, but not today. So you blinked. But it looks so amazing. Why can't you just teach me the basics? I don't need to start with atoms do I? Alira gave her a look. No, but magic isn't something to be entered into lightly. It's a very powerful tool. It can do just about anything you imagine, but that also means it's quite dangerous if done wrong. So you frowned, clearly not quite believing. Alira set down the two newly formed chokers. They were finished now, although still a bit hot from the process, and needing to cool. Then with a thought, she reached out and plucked Sayu's head off her shoulders, and turned her around to look at her very much intact and still living body with a clean stump at the very top of her neck. Skin covered where her head had been attached. As I said, it can do anything. Congrats. You are now a living Dalekan. Confusion radiated from the girl. What? How? I could tell you, but at the moment it's beyond your understanding. I might as well be speaking gibberish if I tried. At least in regards to how I made you into a living Dalekan. The other item is something you can understand on the basic level. Since your people do some of it without magic, what I can tell you in simple terms, is that Shinix at its highest level is true magic able to bend reality itself to the will of the user. This allows all sorts of impossible things, no matter how bizarre, to be possible. What I just did to you is fairly benign. I picked this mainly for the shock value, so you replied. It certainly was surprising. For a moment I thought you just decided to kill me. Although I'm not sure this is better. Alira replaced Sayu's head on her shoulders, and undid the separation, while saying, I didn't plan to leave you like that. Sayu felt around her neck and sighed in relief when she found nothing wrong. That was a very strange experience. Yes, and perhaps in time you could learn to do equally interesting things. When you are ready, I do plan to teach you a few spells. For now, I can teach you theory but you must learn to understand it or you will never be able to channel the elements, much less do something like what I just did. So you blinked. You will? Yes. Just not right now. Why not? It seems I have a guest. Would you watch them for a bit? I have a ship to greet. Oh, yes. They are going to be hungry when they wake up, which should be soon. So be ready to feed them. So you nodded. Um, sure. With that Alira slipped away. Not without noticing so you crouched down to inspect one of the two chokers she had just made each of them a work of art, and intended for her adopted daughters. They would not only protect them from the elements but harm in general, they were the magical equivalent to a personal shield. Once equipped it would cloak them in a magical barrier that would keep them comfortable regardless of how hot or cold it was, it would protect them from any weather, and keep them from getting scrapes, and bruises even if it did fail, and they were hurt. She had further enchanted it with healing magic, allowing it to heal wounds, a masterpiece that would ensure their safety during this vulnerable point in their development. One she would have to take away later, as it would likely hinder them later. Alira wasn't looking forward to that, but thankfully it was years away. Alira pushed those thoughts out of her mind, and having gained sufficient distance reached out with her power, manipulating the very air around her, she prepared to take off. Her wings worked in much the same fashion as Solian wings, with one difference. Unlike them her mass meant that her wings wouldn't provide enough lift to fly in this atmosphere unaided. As such, she had to use her biological star drive even down here on the ground. With a thought she flapped her wings, as pulse waves rippled off her, providing extra lift. Yet no sound echoed, even after she broke the sound barrier, a consequence of what she was doing. 
It took her only seconds to breach the atmosphere. Reaching out with her senses, she found her guest. A single ship had entered the system, mere moments ago. A cruiser from the looks of things. It was a smaller cruiser, and they were moving into the system slowly. Scanning the wreckage of scattered NECU ships, with shields and weapons active. It seemed they were battle ready, but it remained to be seen if they would prove hostile. The newcomers hadn't seen her yet, and she decided to make sure it stays that way. With a thought, she projected a cloaking field around her large form protecting her from all forms of detection. It was a trick her mother taught her, and one she felt was most useful right now. She wanted a closer look before she drove them off for being too close to her nest. So you ran her hand over the smooth and warm metal surface of the objects she had just seen formed out of simple earth, nothing more than soil, and rock had been used, yet now it was gleaming metal etched with alien symbols, and decorated with a single yet gorgeous gemstone, it was the most beautiful piece of jewelry she had ever seen, it was honestly tempting to try and slip one on, but somehow she knew they were not meant for her, the significance of how they were formed did not escape her. Magic was truly something else to be able to reorder matter on the subatomic level. To reshape atoms into something else like this, it really drove home how powerful her new boss was. If Alira could reshape matter so casually, it made her wonder what chance her people or anyone else for that matter stood against the dragons. Perhaps it was a good thing that they were not like everyone else seemed only interested in their own affairs. She wasn't sure she wanted to see a galaxy where the dragons weren't pretending to be powerful space monsters to be avoided. With a sigh, she placed down the small band of jewelry, and turned to the little girls. She had been asked to watch girls who seemed to slowly be changing into something else. Alira said something the other day about her blood now flowing through them, and at the time it seemed preposterous. Now she wasn't so sure they did have scales and they matched Alira's, not exactly but close enough to seem related. Finding a nice spot, she settled against a tree, and decided to watch them sleep, while still keeping an eye on the area, not that a predator might come. Giant dragons tended to scare just about everything away. Still it never hurt to be cautious, she leaned over her subordinate's console, watching the readings, the dark portion of screen reflected a bit of her own image back to her. She still looked young, a benefit of good genes, but she was a good 30 years older than she looked. That image however was not what she was looking at, no what the captain was looking at left her quite worried. At the moment they were scanning the dead hulk of an Ecu battleship, a three kilometer long hulking behemoth that would have wiped the floor with her tiny cruiser. They just weren't in the same league. Yet something had bisected the Ecu capital ship, with a single strike from the looks of things. Worse it wasn't alone. The system was littered with countless dead ships. It had to have been the largest Neku fleet she had ever seen, and now there was nothing but dead Neku hulks. There was no sign of whoever had bested them. It gave her goosebumps, and just being her sent a chill down her spine. The young ensign at the console looked up, same as the others. Readings inconclusive. I can't tell who did this. What I can say for sure is that this ship was killed a while ago. It's had enough time to completely cool off. She sighed. I don't like this. The ensign seemed to relax a little her shoulders softening, and in doing let her top slip a little, just not quite enough to reveal anything, glad to hear you say that, I don't like it either, we were sent to look for a possible invasion fleet, and what we find is a, she trailed off, a graveyard with enough ships to overwhelm not just the home world, but all the core worlds in one fell stroke, all dead she said, glancing out at all the dead ships, even if they were the enemy's ships, it still set her on edge, it seriously begged the question, who could have killed them, or worse what might have killed them? The answers however might be worse than the question. Pointedly changing the subject, anything interesting about this one? With a sigh the ensign turned back to the console, whatever killed her was quick, and precise. Most of the ship was quite suddenly vented to space, emergency systems may have kicked in after that, however, as I'm reading no escape pods, the crew it seems had time to abandon ship. Also of note, is that most of her systems are intact, she blinked, that was very noteworthy. Run a quick wide area scan, look for anything that might be the area, try not to miss anything. While she had a feeling, an urge saying she should run, this was a chance to change the tide of the war. If they could recover some NECU technology, it would go a long way to possibly saving lives in this war. It was a risk, she knew that, but it was one she felt justified about. Little did she realize that a price would be attached nor did she realize what that would entail. A moment later the report was in, all scans negative, nothing out there but debris. She gave the order, one that was likely wrong, 
one that went against her feelings, one that would exact a toll, but she didn't know that yet, she would, but by then it would be too late. 17. Chapter 82 Dragons and Looting Alira shifted her body, as she maneuvered around a floating wreck, a move that brought her into a sight line with the early cruiser trespassing in her system. It was a smaller cruiser, about 800 meters long, and armed mainly with light particle cannons, along with a few missile tubes, and torpedoes. Her sensor array was however fairly beefy, clearly a light cruiser, specialized for escort duty, and counter stealth operations, among other possible roles that a ship like this could fill. Despite the powerful scanners, that ship still remained blissfully unaware of her presence, and she was quite close, close enough that someone looking out a window would have been able to see her, if not for her own cloak, a fact that made it quite easy for her to learn what she wanted from these interlopers. With a thought, she reached out, and touched the mines aboard the intruding alien ship. They were quite unguarded, making it trivial for her to search their mines unnoticed. It only took a moment for her to learn that they were preparing a boarding party a salvage team to board one of the battleships she had destroyed. These early were not planning to stick around, but before they left they planned to plunder a few trinkets. Alira scoffed. It was not their right to take plunder from her defeated foes. However that doesn't mean they are entirely unwelcome to it. For a price of course. But since she didn't feel like speaking with these early, why would she bother to tell them that? Besides there were myriad ways to tell them there was a cost to remind them of old laws. There was a reason so many cultures, even those with matriarchal tendencies had stories that involved the sacrifice of young women to dragons. A common thread was that a dragon would only accept a young, and living woman. Such rules were suddenly relevant here now. At the moment however she did nothing. Instead, she decided to bide her time, and wait. They hadn't realized that battleship was claimed. She had left her mark on it, but until someone saw it and recognized it for what it was, she would do nothing, well nothing much, she did reach out, and access their computers, it was a simple matter to ensure if someone did think to search her mark that the computer would bring up the relevant information, she would leave the choice ultimately up to them, if they tried to leave with trinkets, and not a single sacrifice, she would make herself known, on the other hand, if they saw her mark and left without any trinkets, she wouldn't care if they left a sacrifice or not, and would allow them to leave, of course if they wanted to earn her favor, they would leave tribute behind before they left. A living girl would be preferred, but she would take any object of value. Regardless, Alira saw this as a test for her new neighbors. One she hoped they would choose wisely. She had made sure they had the information they needed. In fact she had already went and expanded their ship's meager database. It was time to see what they would do. To see which path they would choose? Will they seek to gain her favor? Perhaps they will try to steal from her, and pay the price? Maybe they would seek to trade some of their numbers for a few trinkets? Whatever the path, she was going to let them make the first move. The shuttle settled onto the deck with a thud. With a sigh, she picked up her equipment and double-checked the seals on her all-purpose hardened survival suit. It was a full-body self-contained suit with independent life support, a power pack, personal shield, and thruster pack. The outer layers of the suit were made of hardened polymers intended to deflect micrometeoroids, but they were also quite resilient against other hazards. The result was a suit that was not only perfect for survival in space, but also good for protecting the wearer from things like small arms fire. Ifs was a particular favorite of dedicated salvage teams, and she was quite happy that it was standard military practice to keep at least one for every crewman aboard. It was, after all, the right tool for this job. Certain her seals were right, the young woman activated her HUD. It took only a moment to boot up, and instantly she had a display at the top of her vision that was giving her important metrics such as shield strength, life support status, and remaining power. There was also a metric for fuel supply. All very useful items to have at a glance. She pressed another button to activate her shield. Her suit seemed to shimmer for a moment as the shield activated. Glancing around it seemed the team was ready. The team leader seemed to agree, and the signal was given. The area around the door shimmered for a second before the door silently opened, swinging downward to create a ramp into the airless hangar beyond. It had been left open after the crew evacuated, making it a prime place to enter the wrecked battleship. Well half of one anyway. A different team was investigating the other. She was third off the ramp. Her skin tingled a bit as she passed through the airskin into the bay. It was actually kind of pleasant, perhaps a little too pleasant, as her nipples hardened in response. A fact she tried to ignore as she looked around. 
One of the first things she noticed was a rather impressive image emblazoned on the rear wall of the bay. It featured a dragon clutching three worlds in its claws. Beneath it nude women were depicted living a simple yet happy life. Some of them even seemed to be kneeling beneath it in worship. It was a curious piece of art, very explicit, and highly detailed. She could see the individual pieces of fur on each individual, no two girls were alike, and the artist had rendered even the smallest details. It wasn't even censored either, since she could see breasts and pussy in their entirety, yet it managed to seem tasteful. The young woman took several photos of it, and made a note to have the computer analyze it when they got back. Honestly she would have done it now and simply beamed the images back to the ship, but everyone was on edge because of this graveyard, and the captain had ordered mini milkums. They weren't to use them, unless they needed to, an order she understood, they didn't want to attract undue attention, especially when they didn't know who did this. As she turned away, she noticed the work seemed to be signed, in the lower left corner, were several strange characters below a prominent symbol, one that featured three rings orbiting a red jewel that was grasped in a dragon's claw. It was wreathed with a ribbon that was emblazoned with a phrase written in alien characters. The same strange characters as those below. It was not the Neki language, nor was it any language she knew, but clearly seemed to be the written form of some alien tongue. Something told her this was very important, and she snapped a few photos of that as well. With that done, she turned to the first task at hand, securing the bay, as their entry point into the ship. Already a few of the others were working to restore the local air skin shield. She joined them in the work, a task that took only a few minutes. They placed a few generators in key places, and took advantage of the existing hardware to project an energy barrier meant to keep the atmosphere in. There were a few other places in the hull that would need this treatment as well, and other teams had already gone to do that. In the meantime, her group left to restore life support. Once that was done, they would be able to work without worrying about their air supply. The alien display in front of her shifted colors from bright red to a muted blue. Seconds before she noticed the vents activate, a check of her suit sensors indicated the room was pressurizing. She smiled. Life support had not been too difficult to restore. It had failed due to loss of power, and now that the system had power again, it was running. Although it had taken a little coaxing to get it to actually start after they restored power, but that wasn't too surprising given the state of the ship. Turning to her partner, she signaled for them to head down the hall. She'd noted a weapons emplacement they had passed on the way here. Definitely something to look at for salvaging useful components. Who knows, maybe the entire cannon was in good shape. They were here to gather Neku military equipment after all. Weapons, shields, that sort of thing. Getting an intact cannon would be great. An intact shield core would be especially prime as the Neku shielding was superior. Such an object would go a long way towards bridging that gap. The emplacement wasn't that far down the hall. It was a recessed turret with two plasma cannons mounted inside. The turret was designed to be stowed inside the protective belt of the hull, and could be raised above that belt when needed. This one had not deployed, which made entry inside easy. The room had consoles clearly intended for manual use of the cannons. Silently the two eerily girls pulled out their tools, and got to work. It seemed the turret was designed to make removal of the guns easy, which made their work that much easier. Still it wasn't a quick job, and it took a good long while to decouple the cannons, and get them ready to be moved. By the time the cannons were ready to remove, the ship had repressurized, and the air was breathable, allowing them to open their breathing ports, and switch off their independent life support systems. That was quite useful since it allowed them to conserve their air. Personally she couldn't wait to get back, so she could remove the suit. As useful as they were, these suits felt kind of confining, and they just covered so much that she was kind of uncomfortable in it. She had little doubt the others felt the same, but those feelings didn't stop her from doing what needed to be done. Finding useful equipment to bring back. With the cannons ready to be moved the two of them unpacked the griff harness, and loaded them up. It was going to be a fair walk back to the bay. Thankfully one that proved to be uneventful, and by the time they got back, the other teams already had quite a few items ready to load, including a shield core, and a secondary reactor module. Someone had even brought back part of a thruster assembly. It seemed they might need another shuttle. The ship had plenty of intact military hardware worth salvaging after all, and the more items they salvaged the better. 17. Chapter 83 A Dragon's Test she watched from the observation window as the last of the shuttles was landing in her bay. They were about done, and getting ready to leave. 
her salvage teams had brought back quite the haul, enough to fill up her cargo bay with valuable Nekia technology. Once the cargo from these last shuttles was secure in the bay, they would be ready to finally get out of here. As she was watching, a younger girl came up to her, one of the officers assigned to the salvage crew. The little pip on her breast indicated she was an ensign. It was the lowest officer rank, but not the lowest rank on a ship. The girl seemed a little excited. She pulled out a pad and opened a gallery. We found some interesting artwork over there. One of my team members took these lovely photos of it. I'd have liked to bring it over, but it was painted directly onto the wall. The commander took the pad and looked through the images. It was an exquisite piece of art. The attention to detail alone was astounding. It was so beautiful that no words could adequately describe the work. Every girl was different, and rendered with an exacting eye to detail. All of them were pretty, and it was hard to imagine these girls differently, or even wearing clothes for that matter. The dragon however was the real gem of the artwork, and the way her scales shimmered in the unseen light gave her life. It was easy to imagine that dragon could simply spring to life like nothing else. Art like that deserved a place of great honor where it could be appreciated. Even these photos were of great value, but if she could bring the original back to the capital, that would raise the standing of her entire family. No, not just her family, but those of everyone on her ship. Idly, it occurred to her that they had looted trinkets and left treasure behind she blinked, the mark in the photos suddenly leapt out at her, and she found herself saying, have this analyzed, the ensign nodded, of course, mom, as the ensign ran off to do that, she was left wondering why she had such a sudden urge to give that order, at least for a moment, before she could really think about that, the question no longer seemed important, rather, instead the answer to the other question seemed more important, she needed to know who made that heart, her gaze returned to the photos, it was such an otherworldly piece of art, the artist was a true visionary, and she had a burning need to know who drew such lovely art, for some reason she felt they could not leave before they knew who made the art, the feeling was so strong that a part of her wanted to question it, but she could not bring herself to do that, the why just didn't seem important enough to be questioned, she was in her office when the ensign came in with the results of her analysis, her lip was quivering a bit, and her whole demeanor had changed, um, captain, we um, ah, uh, what? Speak clearly. Ah, uh, well, we have a problem. Why do you sound so uncertain of that? The ensign sighed, and handed over the pad she was holding. The captain took it, and glanced at the page. She raised an eyebrow. So what am I looking at? A problem? Sighing, she started to read. As she did so a dark hole formed in her belly, and the more she read the bigger it was. A chill rippled up her spine, and she suddenly wished she was anywhere but here. They were in trouble, she knew it. This was bad. No, terrible. Gather the crew. We have something terrible to discuss. Nervously the ensign nodded. Um, where? The war room. Where else? It was the only space big enough for the entire crew to gather. Well aside from the hangar, it had a few functions aside from those implied by the name. At the moment, it seemed to be the best place for a meeting of the crew. As the ensign left to gather the crew, her mind drifted to what she had just read. It had been an article, several articles actually, all of them, on dragons. One of them was dragon art, and how despite every failure to communicate that their ability to express art was a sign that they were more than the ship-eating monsters they were known to be. Another article went on about how dragons would display art to mark their territory, and all dragons would sign their work, while the marks would vary from dragon to dragon. Certain commonalities could be used to identify a dragon's mark over something else. As interesting as all of that was. It unfortunately meant that they were trespassing in a dragon's territory. Worse, they had actually stolen from that dragon. Her cargo bay was filled with salvage taken most likely from a dragon's kill. That wasn't good. Not good at all. Thankfully, the dragon that lived here apparently hasn't noticed them yet. But she now felt deeply uncomfortable. Perhaps they could just put the stuff back? No. Their scent was all over the stuff. The dragon might notice. They were going to have to appease the beast somehow. Fighting it was out of the question. Her ship was no match for that battleship, and the dragon had bested it, and an entire fleet along with it. To presume she could fight that thing off would be utter folly. Deep down she had a strong feeling that even if she did get away unskated the beast would somehow be able to track her down, and things would be worse. It was never wise to steal from a dragon. Luckily the articles held a few solutions. 
none of them were all that great. She had a choice to make, but it was one she wished she didn't have to make. If only she had followed her gut, and left earlier. She would have never known about that dragon, and never had to make this terrible choice. She would much rather be facing down a Neki cruiser at this moment, but alas that was not that case. With a sigh, she glanced at the last article. It contained an analysis of folklore from several cultures, along with reports from people who had survived an encounter with a dragon. With it came a theory on how to appease, even gain favor with a dragon. There was just one problem. The best way to do that was to practically offer up poor young women on a silver platter to the dragon. Worse, it had to be a young woman. Nothing else was acceptable. Why she didn't know. A part of her didn't want to know what a dragon would do with those poor girls, especially since they would be alive when the dragon got them. It was hard to imagine it was anything good. Clutching the pad to her chest, she slowly made her way out of the room. Her mind still churning over what to do. How best was she to get her crew home? Safely? Was she perhaps a suitable sacrifice? If so she would do that for her crew in a heartbeat. But she didn't know. There was no real way to know. In any case it was a decision she didn't feel comfortable making on her own. This wasn't what they signed up for. A part of her wondered if she had any right to order her crew to be sacrificed to a dragon? something she tried not to think about. Instead, she tried to consider what they must offer to balance the scales they had taken from the dragon, and now they must pay tribute. Again she considered putting the stuff back. Would that even work? Perhaps. But she had a strange feeling that she would have to leave an offering. What if she kept the stuff? What would she need to do to appease the dragon? Could she offer anything else other than people? The article suggested no, but seemed to imply that an offering of treasure would help balance the scales. She glanced to the artwork, and had a strange feeling that art would be appreciated, especially tastefully nude art. If they were offering people how many would that mean? She wasn't sure. The article wasn't much help as it implied the number would depend on the dragon. Something told her that her crew could afford this dragon's price, how she didn't know, nor did she care to. A number flashed into her mind, if they kept the treasure, and offered suitable art, they would need at least 20 people. Offering more would help curry favor. Another feeling told her this dragon would only accept willing sacrifices. Again she didn't know how she knew, nor did she really want to know. It wasn't long before she reached the war room. Most of the crew was already waiting for her. With a heavy heart she informed them of what had happened, and what their options were. Almost instantly the room had descended into heavy silence. A silence that seemed to drag on forever. Not a murmur or peep sounded from anyone as they digested what she had told them. Her heart sank into her stomach, a part of her waiting for the shouting, the anger, the blame and misplaced hurt. Yet none of it came. Rather suddenly a female voice loudly shattered the silence with two words. Send me. That triggered a wave of voices. I'll go. I'll do it. If it will help. I'll do it. She blinked. They were willing? She was utterly shocked, but it quickly became apparent that she had too many people willing to go. A solution came to her, a drawing was the only fair way to decide who would go. As things calmed, she had the willing write down their names, and toss it into a crate that someone thoughtfully provided. She left it to her first officer to take care of that. In the meantime, she quickly selected a few crewmen and pulled the girls aside. She knew they had creative minds, and had made art before. It was time they made their own gift to appease this dragon with. It didn't sit right with her to just send sacrifices, not to mention she was feeling strangely inspired at the moment. Why, she didn't know, nor did she care, as long as they got out of this intact, she would be happy. She and the girls she selected locked themselves in an adjacent cabin with some supplies, and got to work. Inspired they painted a work that didn't quite measure up with the dragons but they gave their best. They rendered every detail as best they could. A beautiful landscape at sunset soon took shape. In the background the majestic spires of the capital could be seen, and a few farm girls could be seen working. All of them were nude naturally, and nothing was censored or missing from the picture. By the time they were finished with their work, the other item had been decided. Somehow it had been agreed that 30 girls would be going. That was more than was required, but she didn't feel like fighting her crew on that choice. She just hoped they didn't decide to increase it. So instead, as the girls chosen to go boarded a few shuttles, she took their wrapped artwork, and placed it on a shuttle. Once she was certain the shuttles had landed, she gave the order to depart. Idly she looked back, hoping those left behind would be alright. It was as she was looking back that she saw it. The great dragon was right there watching her leave. It didn't pursue, but she felt a shiver down her spine for a moment before a feeling came over her. Her offering had been accepted. She knew it. And then suddenly she gasped. Her chest suddenly burned, 
The pain rippled through her as intense heat centered itself between her breasts. It lasted but a moment however before transforming into a pleasant tingling. With that change came relief, and thankfully the tingle passed a moment after it began. A clattering sound drew her attention to the ground, where a strange object had crashed into the ground. Already it was disintegrating. She ripped her top off right there, revealing her bare breasts to the air of the bridge, yet she didn't care. Instead her gaze focused upon a spot on her chest. There centered between her breasts was a mark. A familiar mark that she had seen before. A glowing red jewel clasped in a dragon's claw, and wreathed in a ribbon emblazoned with draconic characters. Characters she could now suddenly read. Even upside down, the phrase was draconic, but roughly translated it meant something along the lines of freedom must be earned, but the right to choose must be given, and respected for all. What that meant, she wasn't sure. The presence of the mark on her bare flesh however had a meaning that did not escape her. The dragon had marked her. Why she didn't know. But she had a feeling that she would learn soon enough. 18. Chapter 84 After a brush with a dragon She sighed, as she looked at her reflection. It had been a few hours since her brush with a dragon prominently reflected in the mirror was her bare chest with that dragon's mark quite clearly emblazoned between her boobs. The intricate symbol seemed quite at home between her modest mans and drew the eye to her chest. Inviting people to look over her large purple areola, and delicate little nipples to ogle at her light blue mounds of taut breast flesh that was rather uncovered at the moment, and was likely to never be covered again. She'd been in here the last couple of hours since her shift ended, experimenting with different tops. Finding one that worked with her status was proving quite difficult, especially since the mark vehemently objected to any top that covered it. It didn't matter how little it was covered. If so much as a string ran across the place where the mark graced her chest, the top she was wearing would disintegrate, instantly. The pile of ruined tops to her left was a testament to that. A knock at her door interrupted her reflections, and she bade the other party to enter. A click, and the sound of rushing air greeted the other party, a younger woman of lower status. As she came in, the other girl wore much more both up top, and down low, a sign of her status. The other girl was holding a basket, but she paused in the doorway. Her gaze locked on something. The captain knew what. It was her own bare chest. She sighed. Don't just stare at me, pausing while pointing at the pile of ruined tops. Just get rid of these for me. With that, she slipped past the other woman, and into the hall. Already she had plans to talk to someone she trusted about this. She also had to make a report back to the home world. But that was going to have to wait. While it was possible to attempt communications in the middle of a jump, it wasn't advisable. There were a few problems that severely affected the quality of com signals sent from a ship mid-transit, strangely it was easier to receive than transmit, it had more to do with the slipstream than it did the fact that they were moving faster than light. That fact meant that she had plenty of time to have a talk, especially seeing as they still had about four hours left on this jump. After that was a day and a half sublight journey to the next jump node on their current course, she planned to make her report to the home world as soon as they returned to normal space. That was going to be an interesting conversation no doubt, it was not every day that you get to tell your superiors that an enemy invasion was delayed on account of a dragon, of course she was also going to have to detail her own encounter with said dragon. She even bore the mark to prove it, one she was not even allowed to conceal, that mark was also what she wanted to talk about. The captain had someone in mind for that conversation, someone she not only trusted but was quite comfortable having rather private conversations with. That person was her first officer, someone she had known for a long time. They had met years ago, back when both of them were fresh cadets having joined the academy straight out of their acquired schooling. They had been young then, barely 14 years when they joined the academy, and the both of them had interesting stories to tell from that period. Regardless, despite some of their more audacious escapades, they had both managed to pass with flying colors, and join the service as young ensigns. With time they had risen the ranks, each competing with the other, but she had been the one to make it to captain first. Some of it perhaps had to do with her family. They had status and connections, but those alone only got a girl so far. Talent and determination to succeed had done the rest. Helped her impress the right people, and earn her a command. Of course she didn't forget her friend, rival once she had her command, and she had invited the other woman aboard as first officer. She hadn't told the other girl, but she had actually put her first officer up for a promotion. In fact, once this tour was over, she would have to look for a new first officer. The Admiralty had the command lined up for her already. It was a nice one too. A good ship, and she knew her first officer would jump at the chance. 
Perhaps they would even have a chance to revive their old relationship. Pushing those thoughts aside, she adjusted herself, and ignored the way the others were looking at her. She knew why. It was because she was topless right now. It wasn't because being topless was wrong, but rather that her current outfit proclaimed a higher status than she had, much higher in fact, but there was nothing she could do about that. Already she could hear the room a mill working, thankfully she didn't have to deal with it much longer. As she had reached her destination, she hit the bell, and put aside that problem for now, it was one that future her could deal with. A voice bade her to enter, and a familiar form smiled when they saw her. So Risha, couldn't find a top? She giggled. No, Mel. This damn Mark apparently has a mind of its own, and rejected all the regulation tops I have. Mel blinked. Rejected? Surely not. It's just a weird tattoo the dragon gave you, right? Risha sighed. I don't think so. If you don't mind sacrificing a top I can show you what I mean. Mel chuckled. Well I don't see how a tattoo can object, but I guess I have an old top you can borrow. As she said that, she walked over to her closet, and pulled a top out. Risha took it. Are you sure? You don't mind losing this one? Mel waved it off, and Risha stared at the short top for a moment or two. At least until things got uncomfortable, and she slipped it on. Almost immediately after the fabric settled over her chest, the mark glowed, the glow grew bright. Moments before a tearing sound resounded through the silent room, Mel simply stared as the pieces of fabric fell from Risha's frame to the floor. Risha slumped a little, and looked down at the debris. See, I told you, my mark objected to being covered. I, uh, guess you did, but um, how? Huh? Risha shrugged, I have no idea. Might as well chalk it up as magic for all I understand about this. Mel dropped into one of the chairs in her quarters. Magic? Ha, huh? not often I hear that word used seriously, but I doubt you came here to discuss magic. Risha let herself fall into a chair opposite Mel. No, I was hoping you would have a few ideas about what to do about this. With that, the two discussed the problem at length and even lost track of time. Before they knew it, the bridge called, informing them that they were about to return to normal space. With a sigh, she slipped out of the chair, and headed on to make her report. That was a conversation she was not looking forward to. Alira shifted her bulk a bit, as she reached out. Today had been a good day. Not only did she now have a pair of daughters that she had adopted, but now she had thirty new servants, and something far more important, she had a priestess candidate, someone that could spread her will, and work towards her ends for her. Among the younger cultures nearby anyway, the Aureli were her neighbors, and it was good to have a priestess among their number. With a bit of work she could establish a temple. Such a thing would provide her much influence with the Aureli, along with another stream of servants to build her nest with. The Nekia had only provided her with the minimum she needed, it was enough to start her nest, but eventually, she would need more, especially as her brood grew, not all of her servants would be babysitters for her growing brood, there was much that her dragon touched as they have often been called by other races would be charged with. From their ranks, she would raise caretakers, priestesses, and nature mages, it was the third group that would be most important. This world was fertile, and so were her sisters. Fertile enough to support a nest for decades, with a few more to her name, she could assure prosperity for her brood for many centuries to come. Those nature mages would be the key to that, as they would be the ones who would ensure that these worlds truly bloomed with life, as those mages could bless the soil, and stimulate the plants to grow so well that they make weeds look tame. Such mages can help the animal life quite a bit as well, bringing with them the kind of bounty that would be needed to truly sustain her children. No nest could survive indefinitely without a steady source of food, and with nature mages blessing her lions, she could be assured of plentiful game to hunt. Such mages weren't the only agents she could train from the ranks of her servants. With nature mages stimulating the land and bringing life, there were other mages that could help with the abundant magical energies that came forth on worlds with plentiful life energy. Stimulating the flows of the Lee lines, and building a magical nexus that could channel the energies needed to protect her nest from possible aggressors. Those special servants were referred to as primal arch priestesses and were perhaps the most important type of magical servant a dragon could teach. Much of the work they do was something she could do herself, but she alone would not be sufficient for the needs of a growing nest, and certainly not a developed nest. No society could stand on the shoulders of one dragon. Without others, her nest would surely disappear far too quickly. Already, she was considering what to do with her new servants. How to train them, and what skills to teach them. 
It would perhaps depend on their aptitudes, but she would let them pick their path. After a test that would tell her what paths would suit them best. Suddenly she felt another, familiar mind reach out in response to her telepathic hail, and touch hers. Alira immediately shelved her line of thought, and happily gushed about her day. After a moment or two her friend replied, Sounds like you had a fun day, did you receive the supplies I sent? Oh, yes, they showed up just after the ship with my new priestess. Thank you for sending them so promptly, it will be a big help, glad to hear it. I hope the Neku appreciate the supplies, I'm sure they will. Many of them are struggling a bit, while others are doing better, those supplies will ensure all of them prosper. Sounds like things are going very well for you then. Yes, they are, but what about yourself? Last I heard, my investigation goes well. I've got enough pieces to begin planning what to do. A mental sigh, and then she continued, I am going to need your help though. I'm afraid I won't be able to stay here long enough to finish what I plan to do, but since your people are partially at fault for this, it is only fitting that you babysit the recovery. Alira nodded, and sent her affirmation mentally. Yes, I recall from our conversation the other day. I'll be more than happy to watch over the Anairai and the Neku, I might have to call in a couple of friends, but I will make sure they respect the choices of the Neku, and the irony. I will also make sure the Anaira learn to respect the choices of the Neku. People need freedom to make their own choices, or they will never grow. Glad to hear that. A pause. I'll let you know when I make my move. But that really depends on Kairu. I'm waiting until she is ready to make a choice on the direction I take. They are her people after all, and that is important if she is to trust me. Alira interrupted. I know. I understand. Anyway, I have some things to do, so I'm going to let you go. Talk to you later then, replied her friend. With that, the connection broke, and Alira turned her attention to more immediate things. It was about time she found the Neku priestess of her own. In fact, she already had a candidate in mind. But first, they would need to be tested. Announcement. I hope you enjoyed the chapter. Please consider leaving a comment and a like. 18. Chapter 85 Echoes of Lost Memory Kairu followed the group down the corridor. She wasn't entirely sure why she was here, May had brought her along, but Kairu was not entirely sure why. The two of them were at the strange resort and were cloaked. They were observing an Anairai girl named Yuria, and the Neku woman she was. Brainwashing. Moments ago, Kairu had watched them perform some kind of procedure on that woman Riku, and her unborn child, although from the sound of things, that wasn't going to be the case for much longer. Riku's child was apparently growing very well, and they felt she would be ready to give birth within the next couple of days. In fact, they told Riku she could go into labor any day now, and if she doesn't go into labor on her own before the week is out, they would induce. That entire part of the visit didn't strike her as something she absolutely had to see in person. As such, she was following the cloaked form of her sister with no real idea why she was here. Not that she had much else to do. Things had been quiet since her meeting with Kelly's family. At least they had been for her. K had somehow ended up with a date. It seemed Sella had decided to try a different approach. And now the two were going to dinner later this evening. Something was quite nervous about. Why she even agreed to it. Kairu didn't know. In fact, she wasn't sure K knew herself. Of course Kairu was in a similar boat right now, as she had no idea why she was here, and while she had tried asking May, that had proved a little fruitless, but it seemed to her that she might not have to wait too much longer to find out. Ahead it seemed they had reached their destination, as Yuria led Rick into a small room. It was filled with banks of strange equipment, several monitors, and a rather prominent, if weird, exam table, chair. She had seen one like it in the other room, but this one had a few features the other did not. Riku was prompted to settle into the chair, and a second Inairai who had been waiting in the room immediately began to hook up some equipment to her. It only took moments with what seemed like practiced ease for them to fit the equipment around her head. Yuria smiled, Okay dear, we are almost ready to begin. Like last time we will be accessing your memories. You will feel some slight discomfort when the machine starts, okay? Riku nodded, slightly. Yes, that's okay. May I ask what you are doing today? It's nothing for you to worry about. Just a few more memory deletions. The last ones we need to do. In fact, we are also going to start adding in approved memories to replace the ones we've been deleting. That sound okay? Riku replied in the affirmative. Great. I'm going to turn on the machine. It should be just like last time. A bit of discomfort just as it turns on. With that Yuria turned on the device. 
Instantly Riku's face twisted, but only for a moment before relaxing. Yuri leaned in, okay I want you to try and recall something for me. Riku nodded, and after a couple of moments, she shook her head. I can't, I can't remember a thing. Kairu blinked. Why was she so calm about that? Shouldn't Riku be alarmed about that? Great. That's a good sign. Now I'm going to access a memory on my end. The same one I accessed the first time. Not that you recall. Of course. After this, you won't be remembering this one the same way anymore. Sound good? Yes. A moment later, Yuria manipulated the console. Almost instantly the monitor activated and began playing a first-person perspective of a young girl playing in the sand with a couple of other kids. Both of the others seemed to be of the same age. Additional data streamed on a few side monitors. The memory itself seemed very normal. Yet Kairu had a sinking feeling about what was about to happen. Yuria spoke up. Okay everything looks good. Solid connection. Right to what we wanted as well. The other Anairai who was monitoring something else said, Good, I have the replacement memories ready to imprint. You can go ahead, and start by erasing that one. Pay attention to what they are doing. This is why I wanted you to come along. I felt you needed to see what they are doing to poor Rika here. Kairu acknowledged the message from May. The first bit of words. She had bothered to communicate, but said little. Instead, she was watching what they were doing, and was feeling rather uncomfortable about this. It reminded her a bit too much about her missing memories. Yuria manipulated the controls, and the memory projected on the monitor faded away. As it vanished, May commented. They seem to visit this one quite a bit. She likes to use it for tests. And the other day they were asking Riku a lot of questions about who was in it. That sounded suspicious. But it soon became apparent why. The pair quickly moved on to erase the connected memories. At least the ones that remained anyway. Some of them had already been removed, and by some of them, she actually meant most of them. Apparently, they had done most of the prep for this one already, as they had been planning to replace it for a while, but didn't remove it as they often used it for the initial test. Kairu digested that as she watched them work, even if she would rather stop them. The second Inaira loaded something up, and Yuria moved on to imprinting it. It took a moment or two, but soon the monitor lit up with a new memory playing on it. It looked familiar, as it was clearly the same memory as earlier. With a few differences, where previously they had been wearing swimwear, now they were naked. One of the kids in the memory had even been a boy, but now they were a girl. Other than that, it was clearly the same. An innocent memory of kids playing in the sand. As Kairu watched it, Yuria told the other Anairai, I'm checking for conflicts. After a moment the other replied, seems good on my end. You see any? Nope. But I'd be surprised if there were at this point. A giggle. I would as well. I'll get the next memory ready. As it would turn out the next few memories were all from the same period. A fact that allowed her to put together a picture of what that set of memories was about. It was a trip to the beach with her family and friends. One that had been changed. Kyra noted signs posted in a few places that Rick had passed in the altered memories. Signs that said things about no boys allowed, and clothing prohibited. It seemed they had changed the setting of that beach from a perfectly normal vacation spot, to a girl's only nude beach. It seemed that a few of the memories after were altered in a different way, as she saw plenty of men in those, and girls as well. One notable thing however, was a lack of male children in those memories. She also noted that a few of the people in the beach memories seemed to be experimenting with nudity after that beach visit. Those factors seemed to paint a bit of a picture about what they were doing. Obviously they had never done this to her, as Kairu had no memories of experimenting with nudity. That didn't mean they weren't planning to do this to her though. Before she could much consider that, the two finished with the block. Okay, I'm finished, said Yuria. Then she turned to Riku and asked her a few questions. Probing questions that seemed intended to see if Riku could tell that her memories were fabrications. She could not. Looks like the memories check out. She paused. Um, seems we don't need her originals anymore. Go ahead and purge them from the crystal. Yuria blinked. We don't. Don't we normally hold those as reference for a while after completing the alterations? We do. But it seems Riku is the last one in her group. We've already completed the work on everyone else. The entire memory block is no longer needed. Yuria nodded. I see. In that case, I'll purge the original copy. I presume we are keeping the altered archive? Yes. By policy that stays. Yuria smiled, and manipulated the controls. Kairu was very tempted to stop her. And nearly did. Only a word and a hand from May stopped her. As May's hand settled over her shoulder. It's not the time for that. 
but they are about to permanently erase her real memories. Yes, and no, they are about to permanently erase their copy. I already made a copy of their archive, she frowned. When? A few days ago, after one of my drones located the local memory crystal library, Kairu relaxed and thanked me for doing that. It made her feel better about this. Not much, but better nonetheless. It did not alleviate her worries about it completely though. Within moments, Yeria completed the instructions to the computer, and it purged the memory set from its archive. Then they moved on. Okay I have the next memory set, starts about a year after the trip. Location. Yeria nodded, followed along and began implanting those memories as well. Kyra noticed a pattern here, as well. The memories seemed normal, mostly. There was still a lack of male kids in them, but she did notice the experimentations with nudity getting bolder. The same theme followed with the next few sets, with a notable jump in the boldness after puberty, along with some innocent flirtations with both a few boys in her life, and a few girls as well. All the while Kairi listened to them chatter, but not much of it seemed interesting. The entire time, she just watched as what seemed to be Riku's entire life was changed altered to fit the narrative the Anaira had crafted for her. A narrative that suddenly became a little more interesting. Okay this is the last memory set for the day. Begin at location 138-R39. The other Anaira smiled. This one should get her a little hot. It's her first real sex with a girl. Yuria returned the smile. Oh, that sounds nice. Remind me. Was it that way in the original? The other Anaira shook her head. Nope. Originally this was when she lost her virginity. But that doesn't quite fit with everything else anymore now does it? Nope, but I like it this way more, replied Yuria as she loaded the first memory of the set and started imprinting it. A memory that quickly began to play on the monitor. By this point in the narrative, Riku rarely wore more than a pair of panties and maybe a bra, so she wasn't wearing much when it started. Kairi watched it for a moment before looking away. Mentally she made a note to have that conversation with Megumi. Something did need to be done, and soon. It wasn't long after that the two Inaira girls finished up their work, they tested the new set of imprinted memories and then proceeded to disconnect the equipment. Riku blinked as the device was removed, and Kairu tried not to pay attention to her glistening, twitching sex, hard nipples, or slightly panting breath. Yuria leaned over her with a smile, okay we are all done for the day, everything went well, how are you feeling? A bit horny, and hungry? I figured, we can have some fun later. Dinner should be ready, so we can eat as soon as we get to the cafeteria. I already have your meal planned out. Sounds great. Yuria reached out, and helped her out of the chair. At the same moment, she asked, Anyway, how much do you remember of your procedure? Her face scrunched for a moment or two, and then she replied, Complete blank. Don't remember a thing. She gave Yuria a look. Why keep asking? It's always a blank. I just want to be sure. The machine is supposed to completely take over your memory function, and you aren't supposed to remember a thing about the procedures. But I have to make sure, Riku replied after a moment. I understand. The two made for the door, while the other Inairai started cleaning the equipment. Kairu even noticed her remove a crystal from the machine, and carefully transfer it into a protective case. Kairu followed them out of the room, with Mei following. According to Mei the more interesting things were outside of the room. Kairi let herself slip into thought as she followed. Already her mind was chewing over what she had witnessed. 18. Interlude cusp of an unrealized dream. Yuria moved down the hall and watched the way Riku moved. Her gaze kept running over the other girl's full belly, and clear arousal. Yet her mind was focused more on the fact that she was nearly ready to pop than the fun just around the corner. Yuria was so excited about that, it was all she could do not to bounce in anticipation of the fateful day she was waiting for. Her little Mikyu was just a few days away, a fact that reminded her she had one more discussion to have with Riku. With that thought in mind, she found herself thinking about her soon-to-be-born child, making sure mentally that she had everything ready. A fully stocked nursery at hand. Medical supplies, nutrient supplements, special stimulants, baby toys, that sort of stuff. She mentally checked each box. She had stimulants meant to help her produce milk just in case. But from her recent sessions, Yuria already knew she was producing plenty. She also had a supply of suppressants that she planned to administer to Riku to help reduce Riku's supply of milk. Even better they not only had the effect of reducing supply, but they also tainted the flavor of it, rendering it bitter. Very helpful for her plans. She wasn't going to start applying them until after the second week. By then, 
Mika would have gained all the benefits she would need from nursing on her birth mother, and so it would make perfect sense to wean her of Riku's milk, and encourage her to nurse on Yuria's milk at that time. It would also help set them on track for a rapid separation of mother and infant. Yuria grew a little wet at the thought, as she considered her schedule. She'd spent a lot of time working on Riku to get her ready to accept not being there for her own child. To trust Yuria with it, and despite all the time they had spent together Riku still didn't really know Yuria, as Yuria had avoided telling her anything substantial about herself. Yet Riku now trusted Yuria completely. It showed in her very demeanor. If all went well, she'd have Miku all to herself in just two months. She pushed the thought aside, as they entered the cafeteria. Yuri led Riku to a chair, and helped her settle in before getting their meal. She had gotten them both the same thing to eat, a lovely stew. Although Riku's portion was about three times larger, and laced with extra vitamins. It was a meal carefully tailored to Riku's needs, and one that was responsible for her child growing so well. Part of the enhancements done to Mickey while in the womb were meant to help her development. That way she could be removed from the presence of her birth mother sooner. Setting the bowls, down, Yuria took a seat, and leaned forward a little. So you're almost ready to give birth. Are you looking forward to it? Rika nodded. Yes. I can't wait to see my baby. Yuria smiled. I can't either. Anyway, I need to ask. But how do you feel about not seeing much of her after she is born? I'd like to spend time with her and dote on her. Riku paused, then continued, but I have no problems not seeing her at all. Yuria felt her smile deepen, great, I'm going to be taking her away from you for the first few hours after she is born, I need to make sure she is healthy, and I want to get a head start on bonding with her, other than for a brief period to feed her, I plan on you spending zero time with her on the first day, Riku nodded along, sounds okay, especially since we don't want her bonding with me, not this early anyway. Yep exactly, said Yuria, as such I've laid out a perfect near zero time first week for you. Outside of feeding, you won't be spending any time at all with Miku, sound good? Riku smiled, perfect, it would be hard for her bond with me first, if she doesn't know me, I presume I'll be spending a bit more time the second week? Yuria nodded, yep, we'll start with one supervised hour a day. That period is so that you have some time to bond with her. But the moment she starts bonding with you, I'll take her away. I'll increase that time, over the course of the week if things go well. If they don't I'll shorten it. Sounds like a plan. How long before I can't see her at all? Two months, hopefully less. I plan to start weaning her off your milk at two weeks, and have her completely on mine at one month. If it goes to plan, I could take her away then. Once I start weaning her expect the time you spend with her to decrease. I understand, you'll be reducing the length and frequency of feeding sessions. What about my supervised time outside of that? Yuria shifted in her seat. Well if goes to plan, you should get 9 total hours with her on the second week. With the following week, you'll get 3 supervised hours with her a day for a total of 21. I plan to keep it the same for the 4th week, so another 21 hours of time outside feeding. With the 5th week, I'll start cutting your supervised time down. Riku frowned slightly. I'm not really getting a lot of time with her. Am I, perhaps, but it should be plenty of time for you. I'd like a little more. Besides, isn't the norm to spend about a day's worth of time with her in a week? I'm not even getting that with this plan. Yuria smiled. Past the first week, yes, but the limited time is kind of the idea. Riku nodded. I know, but, just try my plan for a while, see how it goes. If it's not working we can adjust it, replied Yuria. Preferably with a preference to cutting it even more. But we will see how things go, she thought. All right. I guess we could do that. Great. Glad to hear it, she replied, feeling just that. Happy that things were going so well. She just couldn't wait for the day. She could say hello to Mikyu for the first time, but she really was looking forward to when she could have baby Mikyu to herself. She had everything worked out. Haven spoken much with her own bond mother. Yuria had a plan for Mikyu's early years. It was going to be so much fun. Fifteen. Chapter 86 Hopes, Horrors, and Reflections Kairu followed the bear out of the cafeteria. What she had just watched go on in there was nothing short of a nightmare. It was all too obvious after hearing that. What Yuria was planning was terrible, and yet Riku was just going along with it. Yuria had flat out told Riku that she wasn't going to be seeing much of her kid for a week, and barely any of her the week after. Worse, she was planning to take the baby away from Riku after just two months, possibly less. From what she understood, Riku would have barely any time with her infant during that period. Barely two days worth of it, 
by the end of the first month, assuming, of course, that Yuria was being honest, and frankly she had the feeling that Yuria wasn't. While there was no reason for her to lie, Kairu figured there wasn't any reason for her to be perfectly honest either. For all she knew, she was only going to let Riku think she had that time, and in reality she had no time. None of what she had heard sat well with her. That Riku hadn't protested, and just went along with it just went to show how much something needed to be done. Frankly what the Inairai were doing here was just downright terrible. It seemed nothing was safe in this den of madness. Not only were they messing with Riku's memories, one of them was after her child. She let out a breath. It wasn't entirely their fault, and not all of them were that bad. Lelia and Kelly were both rather decent. Part of it was that the Inairai had so much power their own gifts had enabled their race to do such evils, perhaps Megumi was right, they shouldn't be eliminated, as evil as they were, she would be lost if she fell that far, instead they had to be shown the path, and Kelly was certainly moving away from this nonsense, Kairu was certain of it, she just hoped it was the right choice, that she wasn't making a mistake, already, she had a feeling that her conversation with Megumi would be a long one, lost in thought, she let Mei guide her down the corridors to keep pace with the pair they were trailing. Elsewhere, an Inaira girl let out a nervous breath, as she stepped off the shuttle. The last few days had been long, but she was finally here. The trip had been a bit boring, as there wasn't much to do. Well, much she wanted to do, but now she was here. The Star Blossom Facility. It was one of the biggest training facilities in the Empire. This outpost in deep space was so heavily classified that for most it may not have existed. She looked around marveling at the craftsmanship on display. The Anirai girl had gotten a look at it from the outside, but it was just as impressive on the inside. The facility resembled a massive flower floating in space, with twelve petals, and a domed area in the middle. The long stem below was actually a vast docking area. At the moment she was in that vast domed area, which was the primary habitation zone. Above her, she could see through the dome and was treated to a massive star field, with one star in particular being prominent. That was the local star, but it was so far away that it looked like a burning moon. Around her were countless structures, some of them normal in size. Others were gleaming skyscrapers. All of them were truly beautiful, with architecture to rival the capital if not better. After all, Star Blossom was apparently of Inairai design, not Neku design. At least according to the people she had talked to about it. Another thing she noticed was the people. Unlike back at the capital, where it was unusual to see a man. Here everywhere she looked there were dozens, along with plenty of females. Many of them in military uniform. The modified Inairai versions anyway. Ones designed to be revealing and freeing. The number of men she could see wasn't all that surprising though. Many of the men in the capital had been sent here before being sent on to various military deployments. Although this wasn't the only training facility, and so there were others that had plenty of men there as well. In addition, she knew that not every Neku boy that had been removed had been deemed suitable for the military. Many of the younger ones had simply been corrected and sent back, while older ones not suitable for the military were sent elsewhere. Where exactly that elsewhere was? Well, she didn't know. Not that she much cared for all the men. They were such ugly creatures, and not very useful either. At least the military found them useful. Some of the time anyway. She blew out a bit of breath and then reached into her bag. It was her carry-on luggage and it had everything she needed. Unlike a Neku she wasn't wasting space with all that pointless, and bulky clothing they liked to wear, which meant her small shoulder bag had more than enough space for her bathing supplies, a medkit, her mobile terminal, and that map she had been issued, along with a few other items she needed. It was the map she was looking for, and she found it easily enough right where she had left it. Pulling it out, she looked it over. It wasn't hard to find what she was looking for and she made her way off the platform, and into the town. Her destination was the local training clinic, and thankfully it wasn't a long walk away. As she made her way there she took a moment to observe the people on the street. She spotted a few cute girls that might be fun to play with. Not that she bothered to act on the thought. She had places to be, and from the sound of it, her days at the training clinic were going to be a lot of fun. Plenty of cute girls to play with. The boys likely wouldn't be as fun. But who knows, she hadn't spent time with them before, so she couldn't say for sure. Maybe it would be fun helping correct them? She knew the military did correct some of the men sent here, although only if they tested positive for potential. Potential was an important metric, and post-correction it would increase. If it was high enough, they could be trained in certain arts, arts that were highly valued for ground troops, 
realized potential had other applications as well, and not just the infantry benefited from those with talent, she shelved those thoughts when she found her destination, it was a larger building with a clean rounded exterior and gleaming white walls, it was quite gorgeous actually, but she didn't pause to admire the structure, instead she approached the double doors under the sign, and headed inside, what followed was a bit of a rush, as soon as she spoke with the receptionist, she was shown around the building, it had attached dorms, and a room had already been prepared for her, her room wasn't anything special, a small room with a nice bed, a desk, a chest, and a few other amenities, but she ended up not having much time to look around, she did leave her shoulder bag on the desk, figuring she would unpack it later, in the meantime she had to meet her new boss, although technically, since she was a trainee everyone outranked her, except maybe the Neku, the Anari girl wasn't quite sure yet, which is why she was restraining herself from playing with the cute receptionist giving her the tour. After a brief tour of the building, she was ushered into a small office, and abandoned. An older Inari was there waiting for her. Turk, correct? She nodded. Trainee Turk reporting for duty. You're cuter in person than in your photo. Glad to finally meet you in person. Thank you. She replied, feeling her cheeks warm a bit at the compliment. The other girl stretched. All right, take a seat and why don't you tell me what you know about what we do here, Turk nodded and settled into a free chair, in short we do a few things here, military brainwashing, memory extractions, and alterations, corrections, potential assessments, and when needed sterilization procedures, you seem to be missing a couple of procedures, but that does cover the basics, you did miss most of the procedures we do with men, and a couple with women as well, I see, but the recruiting office didn't mention anything else, they rarely do, but that's perfectly fine, you'll learn more on the job, than they could tell you, now if you would follow me, I do have a few patients lined up, why don't you show me your skills, Turk nodded, alright, I'll do my best, with that, her superior stood up, and she followed her out of the room, the exam room wasn't that far, and when they entered a nurse was busy securing a necu woman, a rather pregnant looking necu woman, okay, your first subject, she was recently promoted, and as per policy we will have to sterilize her, as for the pregnancy, that's okay, she should be giving birth in a few days, and we have a caretaker lined up for the infant, I see, what about separation, an infant does need a brief period with her mother before she can be completely separated, that will be fast tracked, with a near zero contact schedule, her only contact with the infant will be for feeding, unlike a civilian, she won't be getting supervised hours at all, if everything goes to plan, we'll be able to take the infant away and assign the subject to her new post in three weeks, understood, although I doubt that would sit well with the mother, how does she feel about being sterilized, doesn't matter, she won't be allowed to remember that she was sterilized, nor will she be allowed to keep any memories of her child, unlike with civilians, she won't be meeting the kid again later, so no need to archive those memories either, simply extract, and purge, I presume that means, we will later be removing any memory that she was ever pregnant, correct, now why don't you get started, and prep her for sterilization, Turk nodded, and began by cleaning her bare stomach, next she ran a scanner over her, and confirmed the positions of her organs, while she had never done the procedure before, she had already been taught all the basics, once she had the data, she marked two spots on the girl's belly, along with entry angles, before moving on to prep a pair of needles, filling their reservoirs with a special sterilization jelly, as she prepared the injectors, she glanced at the Neku girl's face, it was rather cute, but she noticed the eyes, she wasn't just docile, the eyes were glassy, in that way Aneku's eyes looked when under control, not surprising, it would make things easier if she was being controlled, checking the injectors, and satisfied, she brought the first one to the girl's belly, and pressed it firmly to the markings, an instant later it injected the special jelly directly into the girl's ovaries, next she twisted slightly causing the special injectors needle to expand, widening the entry point, and then she waited a moment before pressing a button, then she moved on to repeat the process with the other ovary, the jelly she was using was used to remove the eggs directly from the ovaries, the process did kill some of the eggs, but the majority would survive in the special suspension, where they could be put to use, Turk did know that a few versions of the sterilization jelly were designed to kill all the eggs, but those were only used in certain cases, what those cases were, she didn't know, nor did she know what use the eggs were put to, what she did know was that officer sterilizations were typically never reversed, 
as officers never truly retired, and pregnancy was not desired among their ranks, the upper officer ranks anyway, lower ranking ones were often allowed to get pregnant, even encouraged, once the auto extractor completed its job, she removed the capsules with the extracted eggs and placed them into a special container that was waiting for them, and turned to her boss, how'd I do, perfect, she smiled, now, go ahead and purge her memory, Turk nodded, and proceeded to hook up the equipment needed for that, which she was quite happy to find was all here, of course, it was supposed to be, it was a simple procedure, which went even quicker since the subject's mind was fully mapped, made it easy to locate, extract, and purge the memories about the procedure, her boss smiled, good looks like you know your way around a mind scanner, I was using them a lot back at my old clinic before I signed on with the military. Can't say I did any sterilization procedures before, but I have adjusted the fertility of a patient before. Just it had been the other way around with me increasing it in girls found to be insufficiently fertile. You'll be doing a fair number of those among lower ranked girls, especially the talented ones, who we make sure will get pregnant a few times during their careers. Much as was the case with this girl before her promotion. I see she replied, as a nurse stepped in to escort the NECU officer out. A moment later, another nurse came in with the next patient, this time a man. He was young, nude, and seemed to be just as controlled. His overall condition seemed to be rather good. All right, this subject is a bit of a treat, a fresh recruit. I'll walk you through this one, as I doubt you have done any of these before. We'll need to damage him, down there. Can't of him doing anything while he is here, and it helps make him more cooperative with our other goals. Elsewhere, Megumi shifted more of her attention to a feed she had been watching, although she'd barely been paying it much attention. Now what that drone was reporting was suddenly far more interesting. It seemed she was finally learning a bit about what they were doing with the men. They didn't seem to bother much with electronic records on that, and her previous efforts only revealed that they seemed to be shipping them off-world. At least most of them. Some of them end up being corrected locally as the Anirai called it. Twelve. Chapter 87 Distant Revelations, Turk frowned, can't have him doing anything, what do you mean about that? Males are pretty useless, and we can't have them multiplying, not to mention it would interfere with the academy breeding programs if they did something with the students, she blinked, breeding programs, is that why you mentioned I would be doing some fertility procedures as well? Her boss nodded, naturally the students are prime for it, since they aren't expected to be in combat. As such we ensure every student is enrolled in the accelerated breeding program, not that they are allowed to remember it, I can see that, but why aren't they allowed to remember it, as the nurse finished up securing the naked neck command to the exam table, the boss replied, several reasons, but the biggest is so that they don't go asking after their kids, which helps keep them focused on their work, also give us more freedom with these kids, than those of civilians who are expected to return to their mothers in 10 years, these kids never are. Turk shifted, I see, guess that makes the caretakers happy, oh, yes they love the academy breeding programs, who wouldn't, it provides a steady stream of girls who need caretakers, and effectively have no mother to return them to, of course not all of them are sent to the caretakers, others are sent off for research, research, frowned Turk, not sure she liked the sound of that, I'll tell you about that later, but what I will tell you now is that those programs are low risk, female infants are too valuable to risk in anything that might harm them, Turk noted that down, and then turned her attention to the man, I see, and the need for the infants to all be female, is why we are doing this procedure, exactly, we don't need any males sneaking in, besides we get more than enough boys sent to us from elsewhere, no need to breed more useless boys, Turk glanced around, all right so we need to sterilize him, how do I start? Her boss picked up a strange tool, we use this, it is nowhere near as gentle as what we use on the girls, but it will get the job done. Since you have not done this before, just watch what I do. Turk nodded and watched as the device was fitted around his genitals, the long part of the penis was stretched and fitted into a weird tube, where an odd sphere at the end was located to touch the tip. Several weird prongs were fitted around his sacs, and then the device was turned on. Almost instantly his part responded, swelling inside the tight fit. Within moments, he started whimpering. Her boss pulled out a needle, and loaded it with a dark purple fluid, and just viciously jabbed it into a sack. She didn't bother to be gentle at all about this, unlike with a girl, don't bother being gentle about it. Afterwards, we will program him to ignore any damage or pain he feels from what we have done. Understood? Turk nodded, as she watched the fluid vanish into the sack. 
She watched as that sack started swelling more rapidly, and even turned purple a moment later while her boss repeated her actions with the other one. Then she pressed a switch on the weird casing device, and the sphere started to glow. Just then a couple of weird teeth expanded the opening at the end, before pushing the sphere in, he started screaming. Then, and the device tightened itself around the organ. The organ started pulsing a moment after that, but nothing else happened. An instant later, her boss removed the whole device, leaving the man with a set of swollen bruised looking genitals. We'll do more damage to them later, but we are done here for now. Go ahead, and touch them. Hesitantly, she reached out with a tentacle and touched the end. The man cried out, in what sounded like pain. She'd barely touched him, too. She looked questioningly toward the boss. Not only is he sterile now, but his nerves have been hyper-stimulated. The slightest touch down there is agony. We want that, since we need to curtail his sexual impulses. I see. Go ahead, and start programming him. Wipe the procedure from his mind, and make sure he ignores any sensory data from that organ unless he tries to use it on a girl. If he does, the pain should cripple him. Turk got to work, but noted her boss wasn't idle. She pulled out a few devices, and began scanning him, giving him a bit of a workover. After a bit, not a lot of potential with this one, but otherwise a fairly decent specimen. Barely usable, just barely qualifies for the military programs. I doubt we will ever bother to correct this one, but he seems to have just barely lucked out. Turk frowned, he did, if this subject has scored any worse he would have been sent to a facility or worse, not that it matters much where a useless man not worth correcting gets sent off to, as long as they prove useful in some capacity, that is, Turk quickly agreed she didn't much care for men either, and this man was no exception, it didn't take them much longer to finish up with him, and they moved on to other subjects, the next subject proved to be a much younger girl, from the look of her she was a student, and Turk noted her rather swollen belly, okay, this subject is a student, in the middle of her third pregnancy with us, not that she recalls, we wiped her memory of the last two. By now her programming should make her very cooperative with the procedure. She is due to give birth today, so we are going to induce labor for her. I'm not anticipating any complications with her, so we should be done in an hour, two at the most. Turk nodded as the nurses adjusted the table, and brought in a couple of extra equipment pieces. So nothing too unusual. Exactly, she'll give birth. We take the infant, and she goes back to class. We'll catch up to her later for the infant's first feeding from mommy. A caretaker will be here to nurse it for her until then, and you'll be running the normal battery of tests to make sure the girl is healthy, and to measure her initial potential. That will determine what program we put her in, other than that last bit. None of this sounded too unusual to her. New mothers often saw little of their infants during the first week. She had worked with plenty of them as well, so she had a good idea of what to expect. As she went ahead, and started preparing for the task, she inquired, what kind of programs are infants put in here? There are a few programs here, for now I'll tell you about the main program, we can discuss the others, and their requirements later. The main program is the general caretaker program, which focus on girls with high potential. Girls in that program often end up here at the academy as students via the early enrollment programs. She paused in her work. Early special programs for early enrollment. The minimum enrollment age is officially 14, but those special programs allow girls as young as 9 to be enrolled. They have their own campus section and learning programs. Turk had a few questions about that, but decided to shelve them for now. She had an odd feeling about those special programs and hoped she was wrong. She really did. Not that she could do anything about it if she was right. Instead, she turned her focus to the patient. The scans indicated both the mother and infant were in prime condition. She also noted the key markers of enhanced individuals that had a few implications. Back at her old clinic, she had done plenty of in-womb enhancements, which combined with the regimens expectant mothers were put on helped accelerate a pregnancy, not by a small margin either. Between the two a pregnancy would end up taking five months on average instead of eight and a half. None of the implications of that were particularly relevant at the moment. Instead, she turned on a device. It created a special field meant to stimulate the mother, and when combined with the drug she was preparing would induce a rapid labor cycle. She was healthy with strongly developed muscles, so she had to agree with her boss. This patient would likely be finished within two hours. That wasn't too unusual. Most clinics made sure expectant mothers were prepared for this moment so as to ensure that it would go smoothly. 
As it turned out the birthing did go very smoothly, as Turk was cleaning the newborn. Her boss turned to the patient, Okay we are about done for the day, I'll need you to go ahead, and forget that you just gave birth, and I'll see you in a few hours for a milking session. In the meantime, a nurse will go ahead, and empty your breasts before you head back to class. Also I'd like to see you in a week for a fertility assessment. I understand. Good. Now be sure to have plenty of sex during the next couple of weeks. The girl nodded, slowly. I will. Great. Then she turned back to Turk. Go ahead, and take her into the other room for the standard battery of tests. When you are done, take her to the nursery. The caretakers will get her fed, and take care of her after that. Turk nodded, and headed out. A nurse showed her the adjacent exam room, one that was specifically set up for infants, and young girls. She placed the infant down on the exam bed, where it immediately began to cry. Turk sighed, and then reached out with her mind. Such a young mind was quite easy to influence, and in a moment it was no longer aware of why it had started crying. It stopped, which got rid of a distraction. With that problem solved, for now, she started hooking up probes to her tiny body. Once they were hooked up, she began a series of highly invasive scans. As the scans were running, she started hooking up a second set of devices to her head. It was a memory scanner. In this case, they were not using it for mind manipulation, but rather to begin some early programming. Nothing too serious yet, but it was important work nonetheless, as this programming would be built upon in later sessions. By the time she was finished with the first series programming, the scans were complete. The girl was very healthy, and more importantly she had very high potential right from birth. A very valuable infant all right. If the breeding programs regularly produced infants like this one, Turk could see why they didn't want the mothers to remember them. The very nature of this place was quite ideal for a program like this as well. With that in mind, she removed the probes, and equipment, and picked the little girl up. It was time to deliver her to the caretakers, who would make sure she got fed, and taken care of. Once they had her, this little one would no longer be Turk's responsibility. The nursery was on the lower levels, she had been shown where that is, but had not yet been inside. As such she knew exactly where to go. It only took her moments to find her way to the nursery, and she headed inside with a nameless little girl. The place seemed to be quite busy with numerous little baby beds, all of them occupied with infants, all of them female. Naturally, caretakers were moving around, and she noted nursing stations where a few caretakers were nursing some of the infants. It seemed these breeding programs were quite successful. There must have been hundreds of infants in this room alone, and she had been told the entire floor was the nursery. A caretaker walked up to her, with a smile. You must be Turk, I was told you were bringing us a little one. She nodded, and handed over the nameless little girl, who was immediately brought to a breast by the caretaker, and encouraged to suckle. She seems quite healthy, and so responsive. How did she measure up? Quite well, excellent numbers. That sounds good. I'll let the others know. Turk shifted, so she hasn't been named. When is she going to get one? When she gets assigned a permanent caretaker. Until then she is just a number. I see, replied Turk. That was a little different from what she was used to. But then again most civilian births already had a caretaker lined up. It wasn't quite done this way. She was used to the babies always having a name lined up at birth. Either from the mother or more often than not the caretaker. Then again, this was a different system she was now working under. As the caretaker walked off, she took another look around the nursery. It was unfortunate that so many little ones were simply nameless numbers awaiting their fate. At least they were being well taken care of. With those thoughts in mind, she made her way out of the nursery. It was time to get back to her boss. When she got back up to the exam room, she found that the last patient was already gone. Not only that, but it seemed that she had taken long enough for another patient to be leaving the room. A young nephew about the same age as the last one. Her gaze must have been noted, as her boss said, fertility assessment, that girl gave birth a couple of weeks ago, and the breeders have been working to get her pregnant again, they succeeded, she'll be back in two weeks for her first fetus exam, I see, the nursery also seems quite packed, naturally, we try to get the students to have as many kids as possible while they are here, as such they aren't merely encouraged to get pregnant, but required, that explained a few things. Guess that explains the size of the nursery. Who is the next patient? I'll be taking care of that. In the meantime, I have something else for you to do. I need you to head to the special campus, and pick up a few girls for me. She picked up a pad, and handed it to her. These are their details. Turk nodded and made her way out of the room. It seemed she had a few special patients to bring to the clinic. 17. 
Chapter 88 Dark Games, and Uncertain Plans, Kairu made her way down the road. Honestly she was barely paying any attention to her surroundings, and was more lost in thought about what she had witnessed recently. What was going on in that resort did not sit well with her. It made her wonder how many girls were victims of child theft. So many questions were raised by that, and it left her wondering, how far did it go? To what end? It was tempting to try, and ask Kelly, but she knew that would only get her so far. Kelly had been a source of information, but she wasn't all-knowing. Elements of this went way up the chain. If she had to guess, it went all the way up. Kairu had little doubt that the Anairai had the Imperial Council, family and everyone else at that level wrapped around their tentacles. In fact she recalled the conversation from the other day in which she had discussed that with Megumi. During that conversation, Megumi had mentioned assigning a cell, along with a few drones to investigate the leadership. How well they had done, she didn't know, nor did she know what they had uncovered. Kairu hoped that Megumi would tell her during their upcoming conversation. She wasn't sure what they were going to do, but she felt it was time to act. Time to do something. They could not let this go on too much longer. It was with those thoughts in mind, that she wandered into her apartment. Rather idly, she made her way into the bathroom, to find Kelly with a notepad. Kelly smiled, when she spotted Kairu, and tossed the pad in a drawer. Ah, I thought I had missed you. Driven from her thoughts, she noticed that Kelly looked especially clean, and that her hair had been styled. Going somewhere, her smile turned slightly impish, and she nodded. Unfortunately, Nanu insisted I go on a date with Kiri. Kiri? Isn't she twelve? Kelly let out a breath, she is, and I tried to get out of it because of that. Nana was quite insistent, however, so here I am. I ah, uh, see, said Kairu as she slumped onto the seat. I know you and I have somewhat different standards, but is this really okay? No, it isn't, but nothing I said got through to Nana. Mom tried to convince her as well, but that didn't go so well. Kairu frowned, I see, would you like me to come along? As support, that might be nice. Star Blossom Academy, Special Campus. Turk slipped onto the Special Campus grounds. By now the hour had changed, and above her she could see blue sky. Naturally, that blue sky was artificial and meant to simulate daylight. Here at the Star Blossom facility it was now about mid-morning time-wise, and her first day here had certainly been rather busy. She had arrived early before first light, and almost immediately started helping with patients. Hell! She hadn't even had time to unpack, a fact that seemed to indicate what her future might be like, incredibly busy with every minute packed naturally. At least the pay was good, once her contract expires, she figured she could settle down somewhere nice, and live out her dreams. With those thoughts in mind, she checked her map that she had thoughtfully retrieved. The patients she was to pick up were supposed to be waiting for her in the main lobby, and there were five of them. The details she had been given included photos, names, and some basic information on them. They were early enrollment students on the officer track, but why they were being brought to the clinic wasn't listed. Turk could guess, but she figured that was a waste of energy seeing as she would find out soon enough. Turning towards the lobby, she considered the girls she was picking up, naturally since they were early enrollment students. They were all younger than the minimum official age for enrollment in the campus. With one exception most of them were either 12 or 13 with the other one being 10. Apparently, that last one was a real genius, and as such she was in the same class as graduate students. According to what she had been given, all five of them were graduate students from the same class, nearly ready for their first posting. She found the group waiting for her in the lobby, wearing the local academy uniform. It was based on the military uniform and as a result covered about the same. Honestly she thought they looked a little silly in it, like little kids playing soldier. The uniforms came with the same stuff the military uniform came with, including a tool belt, and a cute little side holster attached to their skirts. That holster was empty at the moment, but there wasn't much surprise there. Weapons were typically kept in arms lockers, unless needed. Turk made her way up to the group, introduced herself, and mentioned that she was here to take them to the clinic. The youngest stood up, and stretched a bit, glad to see you are so prompt, last time the clinic had me wait here for a procedure I was here long enough to get bored, sorry to hear that, she giggled, gestured for the door, and said, well let's get going, don't want to keep the doctors waiting, and we can talk on the way, she nodded, and gestured for them to follow her, the group all headed for the door, and after a moment, out of curiosity, did they tell you what our procedures are, I'm kind of new, so no, they just gave me a pad with a few details about you five, nothing about why I was taking you to the clinic or for what I see, 
Guess that gives us something to talk about then. I was told that I could discuss my procedure with any of the medical staff, and so were they. She blinked. Wait, do you mean you know what they are going to do? Her face lit up. Sure do. Unlike those at the other campus, we are allowed to know what they do to us. Well, while we are here anyway. Once we leave, those memories are to be archived. I've heard it's a precaution. That does make sense. A lot of it. You can't give up information you don't know, and since anything we know about this place will be archived we can't give it up if captured. True, replied Turk as they slipped out of the lobby. The girl quieted down for a moment. As she looked around then she turned back to Turk. Anyway, about my procedure. Since I am graduating soon, my memories are to be archived. Along with a couple of other procedures. Another girl spoke up. We all are. As graduates, we can't leave without our restricted memories being archived. Of course since we are from the special campus, that isn't the only thing that needs to be done. Oh? Really what else needs to be done? The youngest spoke up, nothing much. We all have special implants that will need to be removed, and since we are going straight to command level ranks we need to be sterilized. Turk blinked, that was odd. Sterilized? At your age? Surely that can wait a few years. Perhaps, but that's what the implants are for. They take advantage of our ovulation cycle to drain our ovaries. It's much slower than the normal method, but significantly fewer eggs are lost. I see, but you wouldn't happen to know why they bothered to do it this way? Is the other method not sufficient? They said we had really nice eggs. They wanted as many of them as possible. They never said why, and it's not really our place to ask. Ah, well, anyway, I'm curious, what was growing up like for you? You all grew up without any contact with your birth mothers. The youngest lit up. I had a lot of fun, and honestly I don't care much about not knowing my birth mother. Although I would like to see my caretaker again. She was such fun. <laughs> One of the others elaborated. After entering the academy, our contact with our caretakers was restricted to encourage us to focus on our classes. We have to earn hours with them. Ah, I understand. So I take it you all loved your caretakers? They all nodded. After that Turk slipped into a different topic. But all the while she was wondering why these girls were being sterilized so young. It meant they would never truly have children of their own. But at least they might be able to serve someone else when they are older. Having no eggs, doesn't mean their womb was suddenly useless. Their wombs could still be used by someone else, for their young. It didn't take too long to reach the clinic, and she ushered the girls inside, where they promptly stripped down to nothing, tossing their uniforms into provided baskets, and sighing in relief. The youngest even voiced, so much better, that thing is nice and all, but I hate wearing it. Then why do you wear it? Cause it's required, when we go out, I prefer the other version of it frankly. Turk noted that down mentally, and led the group deeper into the building. She already had instructions for where to take them and she led them right to a special exam room. Without even prompting, the youngest went up to the exam bed, and the others settled on a waiting bench. Turk used a companel to signal her boss, and then went to make sure the little one was nice and secure on the bed. By the time she was finished, her boss had arrived. Ah, good. Kiri is the one I wanted to look at first. Did they tell you anything about what they are here for? Turk nodded. She mentioned an implant, sterilization, and a memory procedure. That does cover the gist of what we are doing. Although with the sterilization part of things, we've already been doing that gradually. With the egg trainers, we've been slowly removing their eggs. So they've already been partially done? Sort of. The egg trainers stimulate ovulation, and drain the eggs at a set rate, which we can adjust. We raised it dramatically, with Kiri since she was going to be graduating younger than normal. When I last checked her ovaries were almost empty. We just need to make sure the drainer got them all. I see. Out of curiosity, what are we doing with these eggs anyway? A few things. There are a few parties interested in Kiri. She is a very good genetic stock with superb intelligence, and physical traits. The breeders want her eggs, for breeding purposes, both for breeding superior nephew, or for their own children. Some of her eggs are being sent to them. Turk frowned. The breeders? Her boss nodded. Yes them. They monitor the students, and control the local pairings. Most of the pregnancies among the student body are from natural pairs, but the rest are from implantations, done with eggs harvested from various donors, like young Kiri here, I see. So does that mean she is a mother? Her boss smiled, indirectly, but yes. She has 98 registered infants already born, and 63 more scheduled to be born in the next few months. Of course that just covers the naked girls that have been impregnated with her eggs. Turk glanced at the young girl in question, 
She considered asking for her opinion, but decided not to. She had little doubt that the girl's feelings on the matter had long since been conditioned. Little Kiri was likely more than happy to let her eggs be taken, and used at the discretion of others. That's quite the list for someone so young. Just a sign of how much demand there is for quality eggs like hers. Now why don't you get started by checking the remaining egg level in her ovaries, and how much the drainer has collected, Turk nodded, and got started on that. It took her only moments to find that her boss wasn't kidding about Kiri nearly being out of eggs. On the display Turk noted that the drainer was actively stimulating her ovulation cycle, and pulling out what few eggs remained. And she only had a couple dozen left in her ovaries. The drainer had a special collection module in which it was storing the extracted eggs, a module whose contents didn't account for all the missing eggs. From the look of it, the drainer was designed so that the collection module could easily be swapped out. All evidence that supported what she had just heard. Interesting device, I've never seen anything like it. Yes, it is quite something, and very efficient at what it does. Anyway, how many eggs does she have left? A couple dozen in her ovaries, and about a hundred in the drainer, replied Turk. I see, not quite empty yet, we'll just let it run for a few minutes, then, and get to work on her other procedures. Well, if we are letting that run, I guess that means we start working on her memory. Seems odd, normally that is done last. Nah, general health check, followed by the final administration of her special regimen. Special regimen? Nothing you need to know about, and before you ask. This regimen is only for Kiri. The other four don't have it. I see. I'll go ahead, and prepare that regimen. In the meantime, I'd like you to do a general health assessment. Turk nodded, and got to work doing just that. Hooking up probes, and adjusting scanners so that she could get detailed information. As she ran the scans, she monitored the data. The picture she got back was of a remarkably healthy girl. Well aside from being nearly sterile, her ovulation cycle had also been put into overdrive, but there was little sign of ill effects from that. Maybe the regimen her boss mentioned had something to do with that? For some reason she doubted that. The next item she noticed raised a few more questions, as some of these figures seemed more in line with a girl a couple of years older, yet the rest was right in line for her age. With a sigh, she turned to her boss after the scan finished. Sounds good. Right in line with what I expect. She replied while holding a series of injectors filled with various compounds. There were twenty of them. Turk eyed them, wondering what exactly they were doing to Kiri. This whole treatment felt unusual. Some of these figures aren't quite right though. Perfectly in line with what I expect, especially with the regimen I have her on. Can I ask what that regimen is supposed to do? In short it is doing several things. Most importantly it allows her to realize abilities not normally found in the NECU population. Our implementation isn't perfect, and only works in a small number of cases. Kiri here is one of those rare cases, Turk nodded along, but she found herself wondering what she wasn't being told about this. She barely even realized that under her breath she was asking some of those questions she had. Even as she started to administer the compounds as directed. Inject this one in soft tissue of the thigh. Inject that one into the vein of the neck. Inject this other one directly into the breast. Inject that one behind the eye. With each one she had new questions about this. But she didn't think she was going to get an answer. She had joined a military hospital after all and it seemed information was even more closed off, at least for certain patients, and Kiri was one of them. Eventually they moved on to checking her egg drainer implant again. By that point her ovulation cycle had ended, and surprisingly, at least for Turk, her ovaries were empty. Kiri was now officially sterile, as all of her remaining eggs not already taken were inside that implant. Once that was removed, who knew where they would be sent? Turk did have to wonder what other parties wanted Kiri's eggs, and for what? as her boss had already said they weren't being used for just breeding. Impressive, she lost far more eggs in a single cycle than she should have. Yes, the implant dramatically increases the number of eggs that leave the ovaries during ovulation, not just a number, and speed of ovulation cycles. Quite impressive isn't it? In a creepy sort of way, it was. Not that she said so. Instead, she inquired, would her cycle normalize after the implant is removed? Mostly. It may take a few weeks for everything to normalize. Her body is currently used to ovulating multiple times a day. That will have to be monitored, naturally, especially since the implant will no longer be regulating her cycle. Turk had to agree with that, and before she knew it they began removing the implant. Something which was thankfully designed to be easily removed. And that removal process answered another question she had previously heard about Kiri. Once the implant was removed, 
They moved on to her memories, archiving them, and storing a large number of them on a memory crystal. Some of those spaces were then filled with fake memories. Others were left as blank spots which she was programmed to ignore. Apparently these spots were intentionally left blanks, so that they could be used later for imprinting special information. Information that would then be purged once there was no longer a reason for her to have it. Once they were done with Kiri, she was asked to wait outside, and they moved on to the other four. Who all proved a little simpler, they didn't have any weird regimens to inject them with. Each of them proved to have empty ovaries as well, and an implant with the final batch of eggs to extract. As for what was being done with the eggs of those girls, she got no more of an answer than she did about Kiri. Megumi, having watched all of this, had her drone tag the individual Kiri. It seemed something interesting might be up with that. This academy was proving quite interesting. She wanted an agent on the ground to investigate it more thoroughly. How she was going to get one, she wasn't quite sure yet. Having to insert one would be difficult, perhaps it was time to recruit, as for who, she seemed to already have a possible candidate. 14, Chapter 89 Awkward Dates, Dark Observations, and Kiri sighed, as she saw a truck pull up to the house, she had a feeling that Kelly was finally here for their date, she hated this. Kelly seemed nice, but Kiri didn't want to go on a date with her, not that complaining ever did any good, once mommy Mayu was set on something, there was little point in arguing with her which is why she was stuck with this arranged date. A moment after the truck stopped, a familiar Neki girl stepped out. She had seen her the other day, it was Kairu if she recalled correctly. She was kinda cute for an older lady, and seemed nice. Not that Kiri really knew her, Kelly sure seemed to like her, really seemed to like her. In fact, judging by what happened back at the big family party celebrating Kelly finding someone she likes, how Mami Maru took that as an invitation to arrange a date between her and Kelly she didn't know. As Kairu was helping Kelly out of the truck, Kiri turned away from her window. She stretched a bit since she had been settled in front of her window far too long, and then checked herself in the mirror to make sure she still looked presentable. While she didn't much care about the date, she knew if she wasn't presentable Maru would throw a bit of a fit. Kiri wanted to avoid those, as she didn't much relish the experience. The mere thought of it made her shudder. Happy that she was presentable enough, she looked clean, her hair wasn't ruffled, and her fur had a nice sheen to it. She didn't see anything that would upset mommy Maru. She let out a breath, took a moment to center herself, and with practiced ease she pushed her thoughts and feelings on this into that one small corner they would be safe in. Safe from Mommy Maru anyway. As it was, that was the only way part of her mind remained safe from Mommy Maru's manipulations. Now with the mental mask firmly in place again, Kiri left her room. It was time to meet her date. By the time she had reached the door, Kelly was already there. She didn't see Kairu, but it seemed Maru was already speaking with Kelly. As she drew closer, she began to pick up what they were saying, or more accurately what Maru was saying to Kelly. Most of it was her typical stern spiel that she always gave to Kiri's arranged dates. Just as she drew close, however it changed. And when you two get back from your date, I better see some bonding. Maru turned to Kiri, got that young lady, you better bond with Kelly this time, I spent too much effort arranging this for you, and it's getting hard to find suitable mates for you, since you keep failing to bond with them, she suppressed an urge to protest, and instead replied, yes, mommy, all right then, you two have fun, and I'll see you both tomorrow morning, said Maru, Kiri nodded, blinked, and then stuttered out, tomorrow, yes, tomorrow, you'll be staying with Kelly tonight, Kelly gave Maru a look, you never said anything about that, Maru glared, go on, both of you, Kiri kept her head down, and slipped past Kelly, and out the door, heading for Kelly's truck, behind her she could hear arguing, she was greeted near the vehicle by Kairu who helped her into the cabin, and got her settled, not that she paid much attention, instead she was busy being worried about tomorrow, she did notice when Kelly got there, her shoulders slumped a little, and a pout on her face, Kiri could guess how that little argument went, there was no arguing with mommy Maru, she always won, Kelly practically crashed into her seat next to Kiri, instantly, Kairu spoke up from the driver's seat, something happened, Kelly sighed, and then snorted, Nana is such a pain, apparently, the reason she was so dead set on this date happening today was just so she could dump little Kiri on me, we are stuck with her until tomorrow, as Nana is going to be out, Kairu frowned, and as she started the vehicle, I would have appreciated a little more warning on that, so would I, responded Kelly anger in her voice, and then more calmly she continued she waited until I got here to spring that on me, 
Kairu sighed. Yeah it sucks when things are sprung on you last minute. Kiri noted that way that was said, and wasn't too surprised when Kelly responded. But I apologized for that already. Kairu chuckled. You did. But I still find it amusing that the same thing effectively happened to you. Kelly slumped a little, but didn't reply. After a few minutes of silence Kiri finally decided to speak up. So, um, where are we going? Turk stepped back into the clinic. She had just finished escorting the special students back to their campus. What just happened with them was wrong. They were young. In that prime age range of discovery, that age where girls went out made friends, maybe even start dating, and on the cusp of adulthood, yet from what she could see, none of them were being allowed to be girls. Worse any chance they may have had to truly be mothers was taken from them before they even had a chance to be one. Thinking about it was honestly depressing though. So she forced the matter into a corner, not without promising herself that she would uncover what that whole thing was about. Turk needed to know what the others were doing with their eggs, it would likely shed some light on that matter. In the meantime, she had to check in with her boss. With that thought in mind, she made for the office, and whatever the next task was going to be, she just hoped it was something more normal, and not whatever that had been. Thankfully it did turn out to be something far more agreeable. She arrived at the office to find her boss directing a few nurses. It seemed something was happening when she was spotted. She was quickly informed. Ah, Turk you're just in time. Time for what? I know earlier was your first time working with a male. We have another one, but this time it's one worth correcting. Well, worth correcting now. Anyway, his potential is utter crap, even after enhancement. But as it turns out he has a few talents that make him worth considering for a captaincy. Today proved his lucky day. Someone signed off on a correction procedure, and a supplementary course here at the academy. He arrived a few minutes ago, a Doc 53, and will be here in about 10 minutes. She blinked. She'd never had an opportunity to assist with a correction procedure. Not many opportunities for it back at the capital. The whole lack of men may have played a role in that. It was after all kind of hard to do one without a man to perform it on. This was definitely not something she was going to have a problem with. If anything after seeing what happened to the other man she felt this was even more of a favor than she had previously believed. More than happy to assist, she fell in line with the others, and prepped an operating room for the first phase of the procedure. By the time the patient actually arrived, they had just finished getting ready for him. As he was escorted into the room by a nurse, Turk looked him over. He was roughly middle-aged with a sturdy build. At a glance she could see why he had been passed up for this before. He looked strong and there was definitely intelligence in those eyes, but with little potential, and already being grown. Well let's just say it was hard to justify the cost of this favor on someone like him. He was certainly lucky that someone had agreed to the procedure, and promotion. She did note that he was in uniform, but that didn't stay on long. The nurses efficiently removed and discarded the garment, which revealed his nude form. It wasn't much to look at, but she did note that he had not been spared that other procedure, perhaps even a few more as his genitals looked terribly swollen, and abused, there was also something attached to them, and it certainly didn't look to be a gentle device, a device the nurses simply ripped off him, tearing some of his flesh with it, she frowned, is that alright, well, we were going to be removing that completely as part of the operation, so it's fine, Turk nodded, I guess it's fine then, although that did look to be unnecessarily rough, it is, and if the circumstances were different I might have actually cared, I don't, the nurses proved quite efficient at getting ready, and within moments he was securely placed on the bed, as she started hooking up probes so that they could monitor his vitals. Turk asked him, have you been briefed on this procedure? No, was his quick reply. Her boss was the one to speak to him next, as she interjected before Turk could reply. Well you're a lucky man, not many men your age get this chance. I see. Now then, you are going to be seeing us a few times over the next few weeks but most of the work will be done today. You may feel some discomfort after the procedure, but that won't be anything to worry about. Then she turned to Turk. Start monitoring his vitals, and I'll start with removing his non-functional genitals. Then we can get into the real part of the procedure. By start, she meant to program the surgic alarms to conduct the removal. Within seconds of her working the console, a small number of robotic arms secure the organ. Then a series of cuts were made with precise usage of a surgical laser. Finally the non-functional organ was removed and set aside. A series of micro force field projectors activated to produce an energy bandage, and the arms moved on. 
they began manipulating the remaining flesh, and using precise applications of a dermal regeneration laser further aided by calibrated injections at the site, after a few minutes, he had something far more proper between his legs although it did perhaps look a little odd, given the rest of his form, as the arms receded above, Turk was prompted for the next step, she turned to the console, and began to run a scan, using it to calibrate the next surgical operation, while her boss had the nurses prepare a few injections, of course by a few she meant quite a few, as they had well over a dozen different things to give, and some of these concoctions required being injected in multiple locations for the right effect, while the two of them were doing that, a nurse fed the discarded organ into a machine, it was no longer functional, but that didn't mean it was useless, that machine extracted everything left that they needed from it, and converted the rest into a nutrient solution, one that would be used for the next step in the process the machine was intended for. Once they were ready, they began with a series of injections, across his body. No part was spare the needle, as the first doses were applied, at the same time, the arms were spun up, and they began by making a tiny incision at the base of his skull. A small needle-like arm entered the hole, and executed its programming. Then a more powerful version of a DRL, dermal regeneration laser, was applied. This one could not only accelerate the healing of flesh, but bone as well. In seconds there was no evidence that a hole was there. The arms moved to the next location on his head, which required a somewhat larger incision. After removing a small circular plate of skin, and bone, several small arms moved inside to execute their programming. At the same time, she was preparing the area around his belly for the next procedure. It was cleaned, locations highlighted, and a series of predetermined injections were performed in the area. By the time she was done the arms had already finished inserting a small device, and were closing up his skull. It took them only seconds, and the arms were immediately programmed for the next task. They made a series of small incisions, which allowed a few special arms to intrude into his belly where they proceeded to correct his internals, preparing him to receive a few new organs they were growing for him already. A process started earlier by a nurse, it would take a couple more hours for them to be ready, but the arms would need that time anyway to prepare his belly area to receive them. Already, those arms were stimulating the creation of new connections that went nowhere. Energy bandages were being projected inside his organ cavity to prevent bleeding out while they worked. Over time his features softened, and his size even began to shrink a little as mass was redistributed according to the new body plan. He didn't quite look finished, when the new organ set the machine was force growing was finally ready for implantation. The arms were immediately programmed for it, and made a few delicate incisions, and pulled back a large amount of skin. Then they delicately moved the organ from the growth vat, and into the prepared location. It took mere seconds to hook it up to the prepared connections. A quick scan to confirm that everything had gone well, and to make sure everything lined up correctly, followed by a few adjustments, and then he was closed up. Now it was just injections, and stimulation. With that done, they applied the last series of injections, including a new set of compounds injected into his chest. Then everyone stepped back and allowed an arm to run over him with projected light beams. In response, to the energy his features seemed to melt a little, and his chest swelled. It took only a few minutes for the process to complete, and now here he was corrected, or perhaps it would be more accurate to say she. She wasn't perfect quite yet, but she was functional. Follow-up procedures would be required, but they would be simpler. Mostly cosmetic, with some of it being mental. Speaking of mental, they did have some remaining mental work to do now. Fourteen. Chapter 90 A Forced Date, and Graduation Kiri slipped into her dorm room, she had just come back from the clinic for her final exit procedures, and most of her restricted memories had been archived while she was there. The young Nekia was looking forward to her graduation and first posting. She caught sight of herself in the mirror, physically she was a little more mature than her age should suggest especially in the development of her extra characteristics. That was of course due to the effects of the special regimen she had been on. The exact details of that escaped her, she had known them not that long ago, but since she no longer needed to know the memory was archived, the why of the regimen remained, the regimen was meant not only to help her unlock special abilities, but to also help mature her body a bit. After all once she graduated, she would officially be marked as 18. In other words she was going to officially be an adult as such they needed to ensure she was finished growing by the time she left. What she saw in the mirror now was going to be her body for the rest of her life, 
She was petite with a modest overall figure, and a cute childish face. At the moment she was dressed in the General Academy uniform which was used mainly when visiting areas outside the main and special campuses. It was based on the military uniform, and was in general use on most ships. There were two acceptable ways to wear it. The uniform consisted of a short crop top with special flaps on the front. The bottom hem of the top ends about 2 cm below the nipples. It is designed to cover the shoulders and has short sleeves ending about 10 cm down the arm. Rank pip is meant to be worn on the collar. The uniform is meant to be worn without a bra, and the flaps are typically worn open, with a few notable exceptions. It is permitted for an undershirt to be worn, but that is heavily discouraged. If an undershirt is worn it's encouraged to wear one with a cutout for the breasts so that they can breathe and be seen. Down below, the uniform consisted of a short skirt with a belt designed to hold any equipment the individual may need on hand. The skirt ends at half thigh length, and like the top contains a special front flap that is typically worn in the open position. Underwear is permitted but heavily discouraged. If panties must be worn, crotchless ones are highly recommended so that the pussy can breathe and be seen, naturally. She wore it a standard regulation, even if she preferred the other one. The other uniform was rapidly becoming the standard in the fleet. With a sigh, she removed her current outfit and pulled out the other uniform. It consisted of nothing more than a belt with a frilled lower edge which gave the impression of a skirt, albeit one too short to be practical. Some girls paired it with a regulation collar for their rank pip, most didn't and Kiri was no exception. Instead, she pulled that out and attached it directly to her breast just below the nipple on the right side as recommended by convention. Of course, her boob had been prepared previously to allow the pip to seat itself just right. Glancing at herself in the mirror, she smiled. She was looking about right. Grabbing a brush, she did a little bit of maintenance on her hair. A quick check on the clock showed she still had a few minutes before she had to report for graduation. Then it would be off to her first task. She would be working directly under an Inira as her right-hand girl, and Kiri was looking forward to it. Kiri didn't know who it was, but that didn't matter. The Inira in question would be teaching her the ropes with her new abilities, and soon she would be helping manage the Neku population. There was a lot to do, and as a Neku she could blend in naturally allowing her to better keep tabs on anomalies than an Inira could. While the girls are supposed to report those anomalies themselves, sometimes they don't. Which is where Kiri was going to come in. Satisfied with the brushing, she grabbed a trimmer, and trimmed a few out of place hairs, and then pulled out the regulation makeup kit. Normally makeup was highly discouraged, but it was expected during ceremonies. When worn there were a few regulations, it had to be kept light and was used to enhance natural features. Face, breasts, and pussy were common locations for it to be applied. Being young she didn't need much in the first place, and so she simply followed the instruction she was given for it by her instructor a few hours ago, applying just a bit of enhancer to bring out the more subtle colors in her skin. Once done she double-checked herself in the mirror and decided she was presentable for the graduation photo. They were also going to be making her official military ID today, hence the extra mile she was instructed to go ready to go. She took one look at the clock. It seemed she had timed that well, so she grabbed a bag and crouched by her nightstand pulling out her day journals. As a student, she was encouraged to regularly record her day. It was to get her into the practice of making daily reports. Now that she was graduating, she needed to submit these so that they can be reviewed and archived. Kiri would not get them back, and would instead receive sanitized copies at a later date. Next she added the few belongings that she had from her time here. They would also need to be submitted for review and possible sanitization. It only took her a couple minutes to pack up, and the last thing she added to the bag was the other uniform she had been wearing moments before, neatly folded, and ready to be turned in. Kiri left the room. It was time for graduation. The graduation ceremony went pretty well. They formed up in a group and listened to a speech, and then one by one they went up to turn in their bags and receive their certificates. Afterwards they lined up outside a room where they went in to have their photos done, and their IDs made. Perhaps a little more since she had a memory gap after entering that room, she remembered walking in, and then walking out with a fresh ID, and a copy of her individual graduation photo. She was then asked to wait outside for a bit before they brought her into another room with the others for a group photo. Again there was a bit of a blank, and unlike before she did not receive a copy of that. She was going to get one later. Apparently they need time to prepare her official version of the group photo. No surprise there. Kiri kind of expected that. With all of that done, 
It was time to finally meet her new superior, who thankfully met her on the way out of the building. It was often hard to tell age with an Aniri, but Kiri had a feeling she was dealing with an elder one, even if the girl only looked to be in her early twenties at the latest. Of course that was following Nekometrics, it would be a bit different using the Aniri ones. After all an Aniri her age would not only already be considered an adult but would likely have kids of her own while by the same token Neki her age were either going through puberty or already had. Those from an enhanced bloodline were often in the latter group. Settling down and having kids often came later. It just showed how differently their two species grew. The elder smiled, ah, Kiri right on time. Here carry this for me, and we need to get going. Kiri took the bag suddenly presented to her with what seemed surprising care. She took it gently, and glanced inside to see a few canisters with a clear case, and something suspended in a medical gel. What are these? Eggs donated by the student body, as I recall one of them contains some of the eggs you donated. She nodded along and held them gently. Kiri knew what was really meant by donated, even if she didn't remember doing it, but didn't say anything. Honestly she had no issues with having her eggs taken, and part of her was happy to have them used. I see. May I know what we are doing with them? merely delivering them to a top secret lab that is on our route. Items like these can't be sent with the usual couriers as they are too valuable. Be very careful with them, as we don't want to lose any. Kiri replied, I won't. It wouldn't do if these eggs couldn't be used. The elder smiled, glad you understand. Now this way. Kiri followed, and held the bag securely so that it wouldn't be jostled. The eggs were cushioned in there by some padding, but she still wanted to be careful with them. A part of her was curious what was going to happen to these eggs at the lab, but if she had to guess they were slated for use in research. They were being sent to a lab after all. Kiri stepped out of the truck and glanced around. They too had brought her to a small diner that she hadn't visited before. Kelly gave her a smile. Here we are. This is actually where I Kairu and I met for the first time. Well technically it was the first time Kairu let me see her anyway. We technically met a couple of times before, but Kairu was always hiding. She was rather shy. Kiri blinked and took a look at Kairu. She seemed so confident. It was hard to picture her as acting shy. She was. Kelly nodded. Yep. Anyway let's head in and get something to eat. We can discuss what we do after on full bellies. How does that sound? Kiri smiled. That sounds good. She was hungry, and the place looked good. Plenty of people seemed to be enjoying their meals, and feeling more free to be herself she eagerly went in. The other two followed, and before she knew it they were all seated at a table, waiting for their food. She had ordered some fried fish, which sounded really good. The waitress even recommended it. You seem much happier than you were earlier, suddenly commented Kairu. She frowned. Well mummy man you can be rather strict. Kiri sighed, I can't really be myself around her. Always the dutiful daughter, and I have to hide my real feelings in a tiny corner of my mind or she would adjust them. That's never pleasant. Kelly sighed, that sounds like Nana alright. A real pain, and she goes too far. Ah, uh, ha, huh. honestly I'd much rather be Lalu's daughter. I'd be free to be me, and I could even meet my birth mom on occasion. Kairu sighed, utterly horrible. You mean you aren't even free to be yourself in your own thoughts? Kiri shook her head. No, if she catches us thinking things she doesn't approve of, she alters them. Despicable. Kelly commented. Unfortunately it's legal. Not that many approve of it. I sure don't. My mom doesn't. And many others don't either. Doesn't mean we can do anything about it. Kiri replied. I know. I've spoken with Lalu about this before. She can't help me until I turn 15. Kelly smiled. So you really like my mom don't you? Kiri nodded. Yes I love Lalu. I even plan to pick her as my preferred caretaker for those moments when I can't care for my own children down the line. Kelly giggled. A forward thinker are we? Not sure you need to plan so many years ahead, but it's good to be prepared. Kyra nodded. Preparation is good all right. At the same moment the waitress arrived with their food, and set the plates down before them. After she left, Kyra continued, but I don't think giving up is right. I don't know. Maybe we can help. Kiri didn't think they could, but she wasn't going to shoot down Kyra's hopes of being able to help. In the meantime she figured she would enjoy this chance to just be herself. 14. Interlude Relationship Management Yuria stretched as she slipped out of the bed. She had just had some fun with her neck you charge. Riku. Sighing, she checked her notes as Riku recovered from her last orgasm. It was getting close to time for Riku to leave here, and move into her new home. Riku was going to be moving into a prepared house not too far from where Yuria lives. Which was great since it would allow them to keep in contact. 
it would also make the supervised visits easier, being close by. Of course Riku wasn't going to leave until after Mikyu was born, and that was just around the corner. She turned with a smile. You know you are just a few sessions away from being done with your retreat here. I think it's about time we take care of a couple things, and discuss a couple items, alright? Riku stretched and nodded. Sounds good. Her smile changed. Great. Now, first things first. It's time that you terminate your current relationship with your husband. Then she gestured at the companel, while pulling out some contact details. I'd like you to do it now. I've already got all the paperwork done. You simply have to sign, and inform your husband of the new status, and you'll be a free girl. Understand? She blinked. What about him? Doesn't he have to sign as well? If this was an ordinary separation, yes. But it isn't. You see it's part of a special provision that not only allows a unilateral annulment of a marriage, but gives us permission to manage your relationships. Not that we need it. I have a couple of girls lined up for you to mate with. Do you have any problems with that? Riku shook her head. No. I'm not sure about not knowing them. But if you like them they must be good picks. Yuria's smile widened. Glad to hear it. A moment later, Riku moved into the chair, and they booted up the terminal. Yuria stood by and coached her through informing her husband, who simply accepted it. A good sign, but one she expected. He had already been conditioned to accept the termination of the relationship as well. With that out of the way, and a few documents signed later, she turned to Riku. Okay, there we are. Now that that is out of the way, I think it's time we discussed your job. As you may recall, we had you terminate your old one. Yes? She nodded. I still remember that. Yes. I was wondering about that afterwards. Since I am required to pay for the caretaker service. Yuri I was happy to hear that. Glad that was on your mind. And you will be glad to know that a job has been lined up for you. One we believe you will do well in. The hours are going to be long though. So you will have little time to interact with Miku. I believe you have no problem with that. Yes? Riku said, seems acceptable, but what kind of hours will I be working? You will be expected early in the morning, and won't get off until late in the evening. We will work Miku's feeding schedule around your breaks. Most of your time with her will be in the evenings. That is also when we will be doing your supervised hours, at least for a little while. I see, does that mean I'll be starting soon? Not right away. You will start about two weeks after Miku is born. At least, according to plan. I see. Sounds like the hours will be bad. Yuria nodded. Yes but that is kind of the point. You don't have a problem with that do you? Kairu frowned, and then shook her head. I know I should, but for some reason I don't care about the long hours. That is a good sign. You don't need to worry about that. Nor do you need to worry about the pay. Just be happy that you have long hours, and the bills get paid. Alright? She nodded, and the few worries forming slipped from her face. I will. Now about what you will be doing. It seems you have some aptitude for medicine. Although since you were never formally trained we are going to have to fix that. 14. Chapter 91 Consultation Kairu reached out with a thought. It had been an interesting time with Kiri. Kelly and Kiri were curled up asleep on the bed, and Kairu was still awake lying next to the pair. It was time that she had a much overdue conversation. Especially in light of what she had learned about poor Kiri, and what was happening with Riku. There was much that was just wrong and she wanted to do something about it, hopefully before Riku's baby was ripped from her. But at this point it was obvious that a lot of damage control would need to be done. As Riku had clearly been primed to simply let them take her baby, it took Megumi only a moment to respond to her questing signal. Yes princess, she sighed, it was that nickname again. I was thinking about that conversation we had the other day, the one where you told me that you couldn't fully restore the Imperium. I think I am ready to discuss whatever line of action you have in mind. In that case, I'll send the shuttle down, meet me on the roof, and we can discuss this in person. I have a few new developments to share with you as well. New developments? I'll tell you the details in person, but my network has infiltrated the military. Suffice to say things are quite different there. Why do I have the feeling you are going to tell me something I won't like? I'm afraid you would be right about that, which is one of the reasons I'd rather do this in person. Or rather, as close to in person as you can, when your real form is a 12 km long battleship. See you in a moment then, replied Kairu before disconnecting. She gently slipped out of the bed, only to be noticed by Kiri who wasn't as asleep as Kairu had thought. Where are you going? Bathroom, I'll be back in a bit. The girl just nodded, and curled back up with Kelly and Kairu slipped out of the room. Quietly, she made her way up to the roof. As usual it seemed empty and deserted when she got there. But Kairu knew that was not the case. 
It was quite easy for her to find and board Megumi's shuttle which had set down moments before she reached the roof. Still, it seemed a little fast, but Kairu had a feeling it had been in the area, or something. Stepping onto the shuttle she was immediately greeted with a smile by Megumi. Welcome aboard, would you like to sit down first, or hear what I have learned about the Anaira military programs? She settled onto a nearby bench next to the wall, and inquired. So what did you learn? Keep in mind it's partly conjecture based on the evidence I have observed, Kyra nodded. I see, can you just tell me? I have learned a few things that have certain implications regarding your previously sterile state. Kyra's eyes widened. You learned why and when they did that? Megumi shook her head. I don't know when, but I do have an idea of why. From what I can tell, the Anairi sterilize all high-ranking officers, as they do not want them to get pregnant, and based on what I have heard it sounds like officers are expected to serve indefinitely. She sighed, before continuing. I also learned a bit about their technique for doing it. I have noted two different techniques used for sterilizing a girl. The first is their quick and dirty way. They use a special jelly injected directly into the ovaries to facilitate the complete removal of a girl's eggs. The process kills some of the eggs, but preserves the rest. Their other method is much slower but was designed to preserve 100% of the subject's eggs. They make use of an implant secured inside the uterus to stimulate ovulation and slowly collect the subject's eggs. These eggs collect in a removable module that can be accessed via the vaginal passage for easy swapping. Kairu blinked. Wait, are you saying they are after our eggs? Why? What could they be doing with them? I don't know, yet. Not for sure, but from what I can tell they seem to be using them for breeding programs. Kairu felt the blood drain from her face, as dots connected in her mind. Breeding programs? Do you mean to say that I might have kids and not even know it? Megumi's features shifted. I'm afraid so. And no. I haven't yet acquired your file. I am planning to look for it, and I do have the medical files of one base within reach. I should know if they have your file soon enough. What facility? Inquired Kairu feeling a need to know. Star Blossom Academy, you know it? She nodded while feeling more blood drain from her face. Yes, I was there. Kairu really had been. She had been at Star Blossom back when the campus had been here in the capital. Thinking back she had also been to the new campus about five years ago and the Mabel a few times before that as well. Her mind hit a block when she realized she had a lot of blank spots about that visit to the new academy, and the others as well. She didn't even know why she had been there, only that she had been ordered there. As new worries bloomed in her mind, Megumi took her into an embrace. I see, it will be fine, trust me, if they still have your file, I'll find it. Kyra nodded against Megumi. When you do, tell me, I need to know. I'll tell you, but I think there is something you should know first. Kyru frowned. Know what? Megumi gestured, and a hologram of a young girl appeared. Meet Kiri, or a representation of her anyway. She is just one of many girls born and raised entirely under the Inairi system. There is quite a bit I think you should know about her, and others like her. From what I know she was born as part of their breeding program, and raised by a caretaker. Apparently her mother doesn't even know she exists either. They prepared her from birth for a military career, and they enrolled her in the academy at the age of nine. She is a bit of a special case, but she isn't alone in being enrolled so young. Worse, many of these girls seem to be heading straight into officer positions, and they sterilize them slowly over the course of their tenure at the academy. Kairu gave Megumi a look. That's horrible. She blinked. Wait, what are they doing with their eggs? Aside from using them for their breeding programs. I don't know yet. Her mind churned as she began to realize how many victims the Anairi had. There was no way things could be returned to the way they were. Especially not with so many girls born and raised under the Anairi system. Almost afraid of the answer she inquired. How many? That I saw. Too many. They had a nursery with hundreds of young girls awaiting a caretaker. Girls destined to never know their mothers. Given that they have been doing this for years, we are talking about potentially thousands. Tens of thousands of young girls raised in this manner, repatriating them to their families would not be practical, and frankly, for many of them their families are complete strangers. Kairu felt a lump grow. How can this be fixed? Megumi sighed. I can start the process, but I'm afraid someone will have to sit here and babysit the Imperium for the next few decades. I've found a friend that can do it. Alira. She is a dragon that has chosen to nest not too far from here, and she can easily guide the process after I start it. Kairu blinked. A dragon? Trust me. She is the best choice by far for a babysitter, and when we come back I'm sure you will agree, I guess. 
But what exactly are you going to do anyway? Well that is what we are going to discuss now. I've prepared a series of genetic alterations for the Aniri that would make them more inclined towards a more symbiotic relationship and would enable controls so that they don't get out of hand. The same thing I did with Kelly, which as you've already noticed has allowed her to better consider other viewpoints I've noticed. Then she frowned. How exactly would you distribute that? Megumi stood up, specially coded nanovirus, it can be distributed on a wide scale, and not only implement my changes to the Aniri population, but can affect the Neku population as well. Not only can I implement genetic changes, but I can alter their conditioning. Speaking of genetic changes, there is quite a bit to discuss there. What the Aniri have been doing to your people's genome is largely beneficial. Kairu frowned. Beneficial with what they are doing? Megumi nodded, enhanced shinik, and reproductive ability. On the whole, your species post change is better equipped to survive. These changes do make it easier for them to brainwash your people, but by the same token it also becomes harder. The key element here is training, and with the way things are set up, they have an easy time conditioning your people to accept being brainwashed rather than resist it. Is there anything you can do about that? Yes. There are a few modifications I can make to help you resist it. They've tuned their enhanced genome so that certain elements of your shinic genome are active from birth. These are useful for conditioning a child while their mind is most vulnerable to telepathic influence. There are a couple of things I can do to address this issue, but neither will help those already conditioned. That will have to be addressed later. In fact I've already formulated an altered version of their enhanced genome, one that should better suit your people, and will resist their retrovirus. Kairu blinked. Do you think that's for the best? I do replied Megumi. I'll trust you with that. More importantly, how exactly are you going to deploy this nanovirus? I'll need time to manufacture, and program sufficient quantities of it. But I have considered the issue. The most efficient delivery method would be via orbital bombardment. Bombardment? Are you insane? The casualties alone would be beyond minimal. My targeting scanners and computational abilities are more than sufficient to ensure zero accidental deaths. Delivery will be via disposable single-use drones with their own reaction thrusters, resulting in very low impact velocities. The only way someone could die is if they had the misfortune of actually being struck by a drone, an incident that is entirely avoidable. The mass panic the drones would cause is actually more of an issue. I have a solution for that however, and I'm already reconfiguring a few of my PPB arrays to fire wide area stun blasts. Biomax and security drones can be deployed afterward to control the panic after people recover. In all honesty, the real hurdle would be the planetary defense grid, or more specifically the shield. I can take care of it from orbit, but there are risks with that. Risks that can be eliminated by simply disabling the generators on the ground. Removing the shield from play entirely. Kairu sighed. That sounds like a plan, but I have a few questions. Ask away. They spent a while after that working out the details before Kairu ultimately made her way back down to her apartment, and slipped quietly into bed. This time without disturbing anyone. 15. Chapter 92 Remote Observations Megumi stretched her avatar, and sighed. She had promised Kairu that she would locate her file, but that was going to take some time. How long was a matter of debate, not to mention there were quite a few objectives she wanted to complete with the limited number of drones she had over at the Star Blossom Academy. A couple of them were already leaving to follow Kiri. While her drones had the ability for self-replication, that required time and resources. She had already done some replication where the opportunity had presented itself. Doing it too much, however, and she knew the base would end up on alert for suspicious activity. With that in mind she allocated a drone to try to find a possible access point to the local Inira medical database. Which was one of several databases she wanted a look at. The Inira had chosen to compartmentalize their military databanks, and these computers had the very simple defense of being on isolated networks. While Megumi was not sure what the point of that was, it was a simple, and effective method to protect data. Although there were a few signs that not every Inira agreed with what they were doing, Turk seemed to be going along with it. But it had not escaped Megumi's notice that she was uncomfortable with some of what they were doing. Setting the shuttle back on a course to the constellation, she prepared to wait while the nanovirus was prepared. Since she had not bothered to make any yet, that was going to take some time, even with her advantages. Kiri took a look around the cabin she was to be sharing for the next few days with her new boss. They had boarded a fast cruiser at the academy docks, not one of the usual transports visiting the academy. An actual cruiser, a full-fledged cruiser. This ship, 
the Niswings of Rethel, was a Vanguard class heavy cruiser. The Vanguard class was the smallest line of heavy cruisers in the fleet and designed to be sent ahead of the main fleet, intended mainly for combat recon missions, but like any cruiser it could serve other roles. The class was renowned for its speed, able to outrun most other ship classes in the fleet. Kiri had been told a bit about the class, including weaponry, shielding, and engines. The ship was most notable for its two plasma beam rays, its powerful engines, and a defense grid that gave it an excellent chance to withdraw if outmatched. As such, not only were vanguards used for recon missions, they often found themselves assigned to special fleet groups and raiding assignments. Of course, their speed and strong sensors also made them useful for patrol missions. The ship was modular which allowed them to be further specialized based on the needs of the mission at hand. The cabin before her was modest but well furnished, befitting a small capital ship like this one. The floor was standard military deck plating, but a lovely mat had been placed down for comfort. Against the right hand wall, was a large bed, more than enough space for two people. Against the rear wall was a large cabinet, and shelves. The cabinet did not seem to be standard issue, as it looked unique. There was an attached bathroom on the left hand side, fully equipped, and the room came with a desk. A heavy-duty terminal was even set up on the desk. Unlike some of the other crew cabins she had noticed there was no closet, but there were a couple of drawers under the bed. Several shelves lined the wall, and there was a trunk at the foot of the bed. Her boss smiled, looks like they had a nice cabin available. We will be sharing the bed, but don't worry about the usual duties that a fresh officer attendant such as yourself might be expected to fill. You're exempt from those, and if anyone does try to use you in that manner, inform me immediately. She blinked. I thought since I am now officially an adult, that you would have to put out, and be free to use like your fellows. Some might expect you to do that, but I don't, just because a silly ID says otherwise. Speaking of, let me see yours. Kiri pulled it off her belt, and handed it over. Unsure why her superior wanted it. As soon as she had it, the elder Inairai headed over to the terminal and slipped it into a reader. While saying, don't worry about this, just go ahead and put those eggs in that cabinet. It was specially designed, and installed at my request for them. Kiri nodded, opened the cabinet, and slowly transferred the canisters into the safe. It simply looked like a cabinet, but it had a lock, was armored, and the inside was specially designed to hold the canisters the eggs were secured in. They would be quite secure in there. Just as she was slipping the last canister into the final slot, her boss extended a tentacle with her ID. She took it, and looked it over. There had been a change. Her full body image was the same along with most of the usual fields such as age, service number, and rank. Like many of the newer IDs there was a field for sexual status that most were conditioned to ignore. Hers now had a new little marking added to it. What's this? Basically it marks you as protected, rather than free use like most officers are. Technically I claimed you, which means no one can touch you without my permission. Kerry blinked. She'd been claimed? Already? The academy had told her what to expect about that. She felt honored to have been claimed. She smiled. I'm in your care, mistress. Call me a puri. She paused. Now I have a few things to do. Why don't you make a few rounds of the ship, explore, and come back later in the evening. We can eat then, and get started on your instruction. She nodded, and with proper manner responded, will do. Mistress a puri. A puri sighed. Just a puri would do, young lady. Now run along, we will talk again later. Kiri nodded, and left the cabin. Stepping out she was greeted to the sight of a number of crew women moving through the corridor. A mix of uniform styles were on display. About half the girls in the hall were in full nude uniforms like herself, but a few were in the more general uniforms. She paid attention to those, looking for closed flaps, as it would be highly inappropriate to have closed breast or pussy flaps here. She didn't spot any. A good sign. After a moment, she picked a direction and started walking, noting the various cabins, looking around, and taking in key features of the ship. She was going to be living here for a bit, so it made sense to do some exploring to get a feel for the ship, not to mention it would make her better able to serve her new mistress. She had a good feeling about her mistress, and she already wanted to serve her well. A good sign about things to come. Kiri was on one of the lower decks. It had been a couple of hours since she had started her tour of the ship. While she was at it, she had started doing rounds, picking people at random to talk to, and extending her mental abilities to probe them. 
getting a feel for how they were following their conditioning. As she moved around she was noting how few of them were actually pregnant, for some reason she kept thinking more of them should be pregnant, why? She didn't know, but one in four seemed to be a good number. Rounding a corner, a younger crewman nearly bumped into her. She quickly apologized, sorry, didn't see you. Kiri looked her over, she was petite, and in a full nude uniform, the marking of which identified her as part of the medical staff. Her skin seemed a little flushed, and there was clear panic in her movements. Um, is everything alright? The girl shook her head. Have you seen Nehru? She is late for her. Kiri shook her head. I don't think so, but I'm kind of new aboard. I don't know who that is. Younger officer, lieutenant's marking. She has a medium build, a little under 150 in height, average breasts, dark auburn fur, and hair. Fluffy tail and a cute slightly childish face. Kiri listened to the description, but that fit a few people. A moment later the nurse pulled a photo of her belt. See, I have a picture of her here. Kiri studied it, and then replied, I have not seen her. I'll keep an eye out. Please do, we need her in the medical bay. Kiri watched the nurse run off, and mentally noted this near Rudan. It seemed she might have just found a clue about an anomaly. Crewmen and officers were conditioned to always be punctual about visiting the medical bay. Since this girl hadn't, it was probable she was hiding somewhere. With that in mind, Kiri started thinking about where one would hide on the ship. Kiri slipped into one of the auxiliary cargo bays. She had checked a couple others already. Using the ship's computer she had narrowed down the likely areas to hide from the medical staff to be the low traffic areas. It was a rookie mistake, but a common one. So it was exactly the base to cover first. She doubted much that the anomaly Nehru had the presence of mind to think up a better plan to avoid notice. The only reason an alert wasn't out was to avoid alarming the young officer. Kiri was curious about this. Something must have spooked her, possibly a sign that someone hadn't conditioned her to ignore things properly. Still it did leave one to wonder what she had noticed. To leave her spooked. Whatever it was, it was something to be fixed. With those thoughts in mind she took a look around the room. Like any storage bay there were stacks of gruff boxes stowed throughout the room. In this case unspecified supplies slated for delivery at their next destination. Kiri didn't know what was in the boxes, but wasn't planning to look. There was likely a reason the items were simply unspecified in the cargo manifest. There were even special instructions for the crew to avoid this room, which made it a good place to hide. Kiri had not checked this room first because of the conditioning meant to keep crew out of the room but it was possible that the conditioning for this Nehru was poor enough that she had found her way here. Rounding a stack she came across a female figure sitting on a crate, and looking a bit distressed. She was quite cute, lovely dark auburn hair, average breasts, a bit short with a nice long and fluffy tail. Up close Kiri noted something that had not been mentioned to her as well, the girl was pregnant. Very pregnant. Judging by the swell of her belly, Kiri smiled, it seems she had found her first anomaly. Planning to impress her mistress, Kiri slowly approached. She didn't want to alarm the girl. She needed to get her to medical where she was supposed to be at the moment. 15. Chapter 93 Remote Revelations While Kiri was moving in on the pregnant neck use she had found in the cargo bay, Megumi kept only half an eye figuratively speaking on the little inquisitor. At the same moment, one of her drones had successfully found an access point for the Star Blossom Academy medical database. Something that Megumi was looking forward to processing. She really wanted good news to give her princess, something she knew Kyra needed, especially given what recent revelations had revealed, particularly the ones about the possibility that Kyra might in fact be a mother, and have no knowledge of that fact. Not to mention Megumi also wanted to know how far these breeding programs had actually gone. Indicators indicated the numbers could be large, but she didn't know for certain how many girls were victims of this program. Her primary attention focused on the drone in question, as it slipped into the primary databank room vial event. One that was normally force shielded, but that shield was currently down for maintenance. In other words, a bit of luck had allowed her drone free access without being detected, especially since the vent was just out of sight from a visual sensor node. A flaw, but not a design flaw. Rather it was just a stupid mistake since someone had planted a crate in front of the vent. Thankfully, not too close to the vent. This gave the drone just enough room to slip through the vent, and recloak. A drone's gaze swept over the room, noting numerous computer banks. A couple of them opened, panels exposed, and even a few circuits removed, as a few NECU were working on the systems. It seemed that the crate was likely full of spare computer parts, part of their current maintenance cycle. 
something she didn't have to worry about, since her own system were thankfully maintained automatically by nanomachines. No need to worry about some technician opening her mainframes up, and messing with her internals. Like any thinking creature that thought was somewhat uncomfortable to her, and sent a shudder down her avatar's spine, not that it had stopped her from messing with Kairu's insides, but that was a completely different sort of thing, not to mention no doctor could match her skill, so Kairu was perfectly safe, thinking of that. Kairu was actually the only person that Megumi would allow to mess with her internals. She experienced a slight hiccup at that thought, for 23.1 cycles her processes froze, and then rebooted. Megumi made a note of that, and immediately rededicated resources for a complete internal diagnostic. Something wasn't right, her processes should not have experienced a complete freeze, it took her another moment to process all the data she had failed to process in that brief hiccup, and then she refocused on the drone, it had found an active console that no one was watching, there was a sensor node, but it was directional with a scan cycle, one she and by extension, a drone could see, it waited until the node had just finished a pass over the console, and then it made the connection taking a few moments to access the control circuits, and then the database, which turned out to be reasonably large, there were thousands of files here, which seemed to be organized by program, and department, she noted the headers down with a few of them standing out, Megumi marked all of those file groups mentally and began making a full copy of the data, simultaneously she dedicated processing power to read the data as it came in, and analyze it, she quickly identified a program labeled as girls without mothers, that one seemed quite promising for information she wanted, she poured through the files, and related breeding programs that were linked to it, quickly discovering the scope of the program. This academy wasn't the only participant as some files listed other academies as being partners, but she didn't seem to have full files on the victims of those academies, what she found was bad enough, as there were indeed far too many victims. Searching through the files, she noted the language. A commonality was that all victims of the program were separated from their mothers at very young ages, and their mothers were then wiped of any memory related to their daughters. Many of them had this done to them multiple times, as the files tracked each daughter which caretaker they were sent to, and their general health when they were separated from their caretaker, and what program they were enrolled in. The files had reference marks to these other programs, the fertility status of these girls, and even tracked which ones had children, and how, along with notations on how many eggs had been harvested from these girls, and where they had been sent, it seemed there were three general options for that, breeding programs, research, and market, no additional detail was given on what was happening with the eggs they were taking, looking through this long list of files, she eventually came across Kiri's file, which came with a surprise, her birth mother was listed, along with date of birth, and when she was taken, Megumi hiccuped again, and reprocessed the file before dropping it into a data bank. That might be a problem, deciding to delay further processing of the files, she transferred the entire process to a subcomputer and ceased paying attention to the data frame, returning her attention to other matters, best not to focus on that stuff any longer. Kiri shifted, she had managed to strike up a conversation with Nehru, and older Neko was starting to relax. Perhaps it was time to ease into her questions, start with something seemingly innocent, with a smile she asked, so may I ask what brought you to this part of the ship, not many frequent these bays, she sighed, I needed some place quiet to think, I don't know if you noticed but something strange is going on, I think the medical staff are doing something, Kerry blinked, not expecting to get so much with a single question, perhaps it will be easier with this one than she thought. Of course she still wasn't sure of the state of Nehru's conditioning, she frowned, strange, doing something, care to elaborate, the girl nodded, I uh, guess, take you time, no need to rush, it is not that, I'm just not sure where to begin, well how about the beginning, when did you first notice whatever it is that you thought was strange, she nodded, frowned, and then said, well, it started a few weeks ago with my best friend, I'm not entirely sure of the details, but her 12-year-old daughter boarded to stay with her about a year ago. I had not seen much of the girl since she came aboard however, and nothing in the last couple of months. So I asked her, and she said she hadn't seen her daughter either, not for the last six months. She didn't even know how her daughter was doing. Even more weird was that she seemed utterly unconcerned, maybe even a little happy about this. It was weird. Kiri frowned, she had an idea of what happened 
nothing weird there, likely her friend's marriage was dissolved, and the child temporarily transferred to her care. Once a caretaker was lined up, and appropriate conditioning was in place she was taken away. She didn't mention a word of that, instead she said, that does sound odd. Well after that, I asked a few more questions, which brought me to look more closely at the medical bay. I began realizing that I couldn't remember much about my visits there, and when I asked around no one else could either. They seemed weirdly dismissive of that. Kiri nodded along, and listened. After a while, I see. Why don't we go down, and confront them? Ask them about these things you noticed? As she said that she reached out, and tried to nudge the girl towards agreeing. I guess, but I'm kinda scared to do that on my own. Kiri giggled. Um, didn't I just offer to go with you? The older girl blinked. Then her eyes widened. You did? Yeah. I think we can do that. With that Kiri led her out of the room, but continued to chat although nothing of real note was said between either of them, at the same moment, she reached out to let her mistress know what she had found, it was often hard for her to use this ability at range, but she figured her more talented mistress would be able to hear her, the response that followed was clear, and proved her right mere seconds later, a few minutes later, she reached the medical bay with Nehru in tow, her mistress had been closer, and was already waiting for them, a puri smiled upon spotting them, and walked up to them, hey, Kiri, who's your friend? This is Nehru, she paused waiting just a second for a puri to establish a connection, before saying, I'm accompanying her for the appointment she is late for, Nehru frowned, blinked, her gaze then blanked for a moment, and then she nodded, yeah, that's right, a puri smiled, I see, mind if I come with, Nehru shook her head, and the three of them entered, where they were immediately thanked for finding the errant Neku, and then led into an exam bay, Nehru was prompted to strip, her uniform tossed into a bin kept nearby for that purpose, and then she was asked to lie down on the exam chair. Kiri felt a bit excited, it was not often she got to observe or assist with a recorrection, especially not one with extra attached. The nurse on duty smiled, as she affixed a few restraints, they were not often needed, but sometimes proved useful, in this case they might be needed. All right sweetie, today we have a few procedures to do in addition to the general conditioning and reinforcement which we need extra of, given you tried to hide from us. First up, congrats you have been selected for promotion. As such I will need to sterilize you. Next you are overdue for giving birth, so we are going to be inducing. Don't worry about your daughters, you will not be seeing them, and we will be erasing all memories of you even being pregnant. Nehru frowned deeply, sterilized birth. What are you talking about? I'm not pregnant, and I don't want to be sterile. I'd. The nurse stroked Nehru's breast. Of course you are sweetie, I'm glad to see that the conditioning to keep you from noticing that is still working. It will make my job easier, as for the sterile thing, it's required, but don't worry about it, we are going to be extracting your eggs, while you won't have another chance to experience being a mother, your eggs will be used. Not that you will have any say on how, or even remember that the procedure was done. How exciting, don't you think? Her face seemed to disagree, that, that. That's horrible. How you can say that with such a straight face? As near you tugged on the restraints. Kiri didn't agree. It sounded exciting. She thought back to the cabinet. One of those canisters contained her eggs. How many of them? She didn't know. Idly she wondered how many of her eggs were still in her ovaries. Strangely she was hoping the answer was none. Sure it would mean she would never have a chance to experience being a mother, but it would also mean her eggs were desirable enough that the Anira took them all. Kiri focused little on that thought, and instead got ready to assist. A puri had already informed her that she would be, and that thought got her excited, very excited. She stepped up next to Nuyu, and began to rub her head, helping to relax her stressed fellow. While the nurse prepared the special sterilization jelly, her belly was then scanned, and her skin marked. They were making sure of the position of her organs, and babies. Kiri glanced at the monitor as it was done, and noted that Nehru had the fortune to be blessed with a litter. She had four little girls growing in her womb, and the nurse wasn't joking she was obviously overdue. Those girls didn't have a lot of space left in her belly, even with it so heavily swollen. A moment later the first needle was pushed into her belly, through a clear path, and right into her left ovary. The nurse confirmed it was in, and secure before injecting the special jelly. The bluish fluid flowed down the clear tube, and into her ovary causing it to swell as her eggs were encapsulated. Once the fluid was in, the nurse twisted the injector slightly, triggering the tube to expand, and widen the entry point. 
Once it was sufficiently wide, she thumbed a button on the side of the injector. A moment later the jelly began flowing up with the tube now visibly full of eggs. In moments the injector was full with far more eggs than those little canisters they were transporting. It took a couple of moments for the injector to empty the ovary, and in the meantime the nurse did the other one. As the nurse pulled the first injector she said, and there, we are one empty ovary, that wasn't too bad now was it? Looking a bit defeated, Nehru said, no. The nurse handed her the eggs, put these over there, we will process them later so that they can be put to use, we will need to get rid of the dead eggs, and identify which ones have more desirable genes. Kiri nodded, and took the eggs to the counter. I presume the best eggs will be sent to the breeding programs? Some of them. Plenty of the best will actually be sold on the market for civilian use. In IRI civilian use, to be more specific. High quality eggs are quite desired there. Kiri replied. I can see that. While placing the eggs in a designated location for them. She then walked back over to take the second injector canister. As she did the nurse rubbed Nehru's belly. There we are. All nice and sterile. Now there is no chance of you getting pregnant while performing your duties. If we need your womb, we can always implant. Who knows, maybe you will get to be an incubator for someone's child. Kiri knew there was a good chance of that. Once a girl was sterilized for her duties, it was the only way she could experience a pregnancy. One of the reasons this was done was because officers were expected to be very sexual creatures, attending not only to the sexual needs of their crew, but also the sexual needs of any Anairai aboard. The high-ranking ones were even required to keep their wombs empty for any Anairai that wanted to use her womb to incubate a child. As such it was not desirable for an officer to get pregnant on her own. Of course, there was also the element that being pregnant interfered with their other duties as well, but that could be managed if needed. Nehru didn't seem to like the idea of being an incubator though. Incubator. Who would want to be? She cut off as a puri touched her head. A couple of moments later in an emotionless tone she said, on second thought, that might be nice, it's not like I am going to use my womb, so why not let someone else use it, that much mirrored Kiri's thoughts on the subject, besides as an officer she wasn't allowed children of her own, if she did get pregnant, she would have to give up the baby anyway, there was a program for that as well, the girls without mothers program was designed to provide for the children of military personnel, and ensure any baby born to an officer had a caretaker, in fact that program did a lot for the little girls enrolled in the program. Kiri knew well, since she was enrolled in the program. She didn't have long to think on that before they moved on to inducing labor. At the same time as she was going into an induced labor, Kiri was roped in to assist with conditioning and memory removals. While she was doing that, Kiri even dived into Nehru's memories seeking to learn more about what caused her lapse. They had just finished, and she was carrying a baby. They were taking it to a neighboring room for its first checkup, when she noted a necky woman walk in. Kiri recognized her as Nui's friend. She was petite, in a full nude uniform with perky breasts, bright green eyes, healthy black hair, and fur, and a large swollen pussy that was glistening. Her nipples were full, and swollen as well indicating a strong state of arousal. Kiri had a feeling she had recently had sex in fact. No surprise there, given the rank marking attached to her breast just below the nipple, she was of the same rank as Nehru, which meant she would be encouraged heavily to mate, and also meant she was likely already sterile. In fact it would be weird if she was not sterile. A nurse noted her entry, smiled and said, Ah, Mary you're right on time, we just finished getting ready for you, are you ready to have the remaining memories of your daughter extracted? She nodded, yes. I'm looking forward to no longer being able to remember her. You should be, and to make sure how do you feel about not having seen her in six months? How do you feel about not being informed about how she is doing? I'm happy about that, it lets me focus on my duties, and I don't have to keep myself abreast of her well-being. Good, sounds like the conditioning is doing its job. On a side note, at our next stop you will have a chance to see her. How do you feel about that? Well if the procedure goes well, I won't be able to recognize her. I'm not sure. Curious, Kiri said there will be a chance? I take it her daughter is at the facility we are heading to? The nurse nodded. Yep. The facility took her six months ago as a test subject. I've been allowed to review some of the work they have been doing on the little lady, and it is quite fascinating. Kiri shifted. Oh, that sounds interesting. Maybe I'll have a chance to take a look at what they have been doing. Look forward to it. I found it quite intriguing. Mary interjected. I'm especially glad I am not going to remember this. I don't think I am comfortable knowing my daughter is being used as a test subject. 
The nurse smiled, you should be proud of her. The little lady has made a fascinating test subject, and proven quite useful to several projects. I see, but it still makes me uncomfortable. I'm not sure I can approve, especially without knowing what they are doing to her. Ah, but that is precisely the point. As her mother you wouldn't have approved of any of it. Which is why we took her from you. Besides at this point, you no longer have any jurisdiction over her. We had you legally signed that over. Not that you have any choice there. Anyway, there is something to discuss even if you were to be allowed to remember the discussion. Mary frowned. Oh, the facility has requested the use of your womb. I'll need you to sign a couple of things to make it official, and when we get to the facility we will be implanting several embryos into your belly. I see, but I'm supposed to avoid being pregnant, unless your womb is requested for use yes, said the nurse as she produced a few documents. Now sign here. Mary simply signed where indicated without even reading it. Kiri decided it was time to move on, and headed to the next room. She had new things to look forward to. Kiri got started following her instructions on the full exam for the newborn infant, and interestingly first stage conditioning. Apuri was by that point in the room doing the same to another infant, and she asked, did they do this to me when I was a newborn? Apuri nodded, naturally, the infant mind is completely defenseless. It's a very simple matter to start conditioning an infant, which is why we start as soon as they are born. You are no different. I have a record of your conditioning. You were quite receptive, exceptionally receptive, as your conditioning was largely finished by the time you were two. Most girls would need more work, and would not have been in the same stage until five. Kiri felt a surge of pride. I'm glad I was so receptive. I had fun then. She always had fun people to introduce me to, even left me a few times with her friends. They were always interesting. Apuri smiled. Well of course, it was her job to raise you right, and then just drop you at the academy. Anyway, I'm about done here. Ready to go back? I have a few lessons for you, and the nurses can handle the rest. Kiri nodded, and they finished up before handing off the newborn infants to the nurses. It was time to head back to their room. Megumi turned her attention away from that, as she processed what she saw. In the background she was still thinking about what she had learned about Kiri. It left her with an interesting question, the girl wasn't any random nephew. The possibility however had not been something she had been actively considering either. Left with questions about her, she finally decided to talk to Kairu about it. Glancing at her new archive, she also had Kairu's file to review, something she had so far left unprocessed and unopened. Megumi proceeded to order the subcomputer to copy it onto a portable data crystal. The reason she didn't do it herself was to avoid processing the data in the file, she didn't want to know it. Not yet, that way when she shared it with Kairu the contents would be as much a surprise to her, as they were to Kairu. Well, mostly anyway, there was one small hiccup with that idea. One she found too minor to address. 15. Chapter 94 Kairu's File, and Miku's Arrival Kairu slipped out of her apartment and made her way up the stairs. It had been a couple of weeks since she had last been up here to talk with Megumi, who had been acting a bit strange lately. Kairu was wondering what was up with that. She hoped that today's long-awaited chat would come with an update on the ship's readiness to conduct the planned operation. Just a couple days ago, she had helped survey the site of the local military base. Among other things, the base housed one of the generators for the planetary shield. Something she was ready to disable as soon as Megumi gave the order. Kelly had gone to the clinic for a checkup. She wasn't too far along yet, but she still wanted to see how her unborn child was doing. Kairu had little doubt that she was going to be quite healthy, so she had few worries about that. K and May, on the other hand, were currently out shopping, which left her alone. May had also mentioned that she had left a drone to monitor Riku, as she didn't want to miss what happens when the girl finally gives birth. Something that was not that far away. Kairu was kinda bothered by what she knew about that. Pushing those thoughts aside, she made good time to the roof, and quickly found the cloaked shuttle already waiting to receive her. Slipping inside she was greeted by Megumi who had a somewhat nervous looking smile on her face. That unnerved her a bit. Um, something going on? Megumi nodded. Well yes, I learned something interesting and I found your file. Kairu blinked. You have? Megumi smiled. Yes, I was hoping we could review it together. I have not yet read the file. Kairu stood there for a moment, not sure if she actually wanted to crack it open, or leave it be. There was something to be said for remaining ignorant. Crossing the distance to the sofa she crashed into it heavily, and took a breath. Steadying herself, and centering her emotions before finally saying, I'm about as ready as I'll ever be. Show me, 
Megumi took out a crystal and inserted it into a slot on a console. A moment later a screen was projected in front of the sofa. At a mere glance, she was able to confirm that it was indeed her medical profile. The first page was neatly organized, with name, age, birthday, conditioning status, fertility status, general health status and more. It hurt a little to see the line about being sterile, and then she noted a date. It said that her eggs had been extracted about the same time as her last visit to Star Blossom Academy. She had been sterile for nearly five years before Megumi had come along and fixed her sterility. For a moment she just stared at it, and then she flipped a few pages. Her gaze scanned for something, and before long she found it. Her heart fluttered and flipped when she saw it. Her eggs had indeed been used, all of them. On page 7 it listed the status of her eggs, and there was a nice entry at the top that said unused eggs remaining, zero. Riku followed behind Yuria watching the cute way she moved, and rubbed her belly. Yuria was getting impatient, and so they moved up her induction. In a couple of hours she was going to give birth to Miku, who Yuria seemed quite eager to meet. Riku was looking forward to this as well. Mentally she reviewed the process, she would settle into the special exam chair, they would give her one final scan, highly invasive naturally, and then induce labor. Nurses would be standing by to help her give birth, and as soon as Mikya was out of her belly, Yuria would take her away. She wasn't going to see her for several hours after that, and only to feed her, which was starting to feel quite right. It occurred to her that she barely knew Yuria, and yet Yuria knew a lot about her. That was okay though, Yuria had proven herself quite trustworthy. Mikya would be well cared for by her. It also freed her up to work long hours, and she was really looking forward to that. Yuria had recently been going over the schedule worked out for her, and her hours were indeed going to be long. The Anairai had crafted her a schedule that left her no time to care for Miku, which was perfect. Riku was quite happy with the schedule. Yuria wanted her to be happy with it as well, and she had to admit it gave her every reason not to spend time with Miku. Some small part of her rebelled at that idea but it was very small. Things were shaping up nicely, much the way Yuria wanted them to be in fact. And who was she to deny her? Turning through a door, she was greeted with a sight of the delivery room, already set up, with a few nurses waiting to help her give birth to little Miku. Riku smiled, and crossed the final few steps to the chair, and relaxed into it. She was allowed a couple of moments to simply rest there before they started attaching various probes, and adjusting the chair. Once she was ready, and they had all their readings, they activated a special device, her belly tingled, and reacted in a surprisingly pleasant way, a moment later she felt the first contraction, she had always been told they were painful, but that wasn't the case, the next followed soon after, and they simply kept coming, sending sparks of pleasant tingling up her spine, she wasn't sure if it was the device or the injection they had given her that made her feel this way, but this was feeling wonderful, she had lost all track of time, when she was finally instructed to push, and she bore down with her muscles as promised, and her belly tingled and rippled, every so often she was told to push, and she could feel her energy draining, but she wasn't entirely sure she wanted this to stop, yet before she even knew it, the final push came, and Miku was free, she was panting, as Yuria held up her baby girl, a predatory gleam in the Anairai girl's eye, one she found quite reassuring, even though a part of her told her she shouldn't, there was an even smaller part of her screaming that Yuria was going to steal her girl, which she was. Rika knew that Yuria was going to take her baby girl away from her, and she was all too happy to let her. It was Yuria's right after all. She made a mental note of that small little part of her still protesting this. She would help Yuria get rid of that in their next session. Yuria reached for a warm towel offered by a nurse, and gently cleaned up the crying little baby in her arms, and then guided the little girl to a nipple, one of Yuria's nipples, and prompted her to latch. She smiled, and with a happy look she said, I'll see you in a few hours for your first feeding session. Okay? She nodded, have fun. I will. I have been really looking forward to getting to bond with my little Miku, she said before leaving. Riku relaxed in the seat for her post-birth operation and health scans. She wasn't going to be out of here for hours. Plenty of time for Yuria to do whatever she wanted to do with little Miku. Yuria smiled as she left the operation room behind, as little Miku pleasantly suckled on her uppermost left breast. This was something she had done on purpose, as it would help her plan for separating little Miku from her mother. She wasn't going to be back for most of the day. Not that Riku would mind, she was more than happy to let her have all the time she wanted with little Miku. 
as little Mickey fed on her milk, Yuria reached into her tiny barely developed mind, and began laying the groundwork for her conditioning and working to get that bond she wanted started. Of course the Shinnick bond would be quite the fickle thing for the first couple of years until it properly cemented. So she still needed Riku to spend as little time with Miku as possible. They could bond later, once Miku was firmly hers. In the meantime, she added a few small impressions in her simple mind that would help nudge that development in the right direction. Kairu simply stared at the number for a while, not daring to look further. Almost afraid to know how many little girls had been born with her eggs. Afraid to know what they had done with her eggs after they took them. Megumi rubbed her shoulders for a bit while she stared, helping her relax, and then she pulled up a second file, and displayed it next to hers. Megumi sighed, while I was looking for your file I also found this. It seems that you were pregnant once about ten years ago. File notes indicate the pregnancy was arranged, and they took her from you the day she was born. It seems that Kiri girl I noted, is in fact your... Kairu tuned her out, and simply stared at the front page, where on Kiri's file it listed her clearly as the birth mother. She had a daughter, one she had never known about. Her eyes glanced to the other file. Well she had more, but this one might be her oldest. She hadn't quite looked through them to be certain. She spent several minutes digesting what she had just been told before moving to properly look at her medical file, to learn what they had done to her. They had been brainwashing her for years, the notations indicated her first session was about three years after she graduated from the academy. This file proved to be shedding quite a bit of light on what they had been planning for her. As she read on, she found something else that she had no idea about. Something related to Kiri, and the other parent. She stared at it, and pointed it out. This can't be right can it? Megumi sighed. I would have to examine Kiri to be sure. But given this is a classified hidden file, I doubt they would falsify the data. Kairu frowned. But I don't have any sisters. I was an only child. Megumi shook her head. I'm not so sure about that. They did manipulate your memories extensively. I undid their conditioning. But that doesn't mean anything for the memories they extracted. She sighed, and then glanced to the list of memory extraction procedures that had been done. Perusing it she found a couple of procedures that were listed as being to remove memory of her younger sister. As she was looking through that Megumi pulled up a new file, and looked it over. I see I found her, she's much younger than you are. According to the notes, they got to your family years before they started with you. As you visit occasionally, they held off on removing your sister after she was born. On her twelfth birthday, they finally removed her from your family and about a month later, they used one of her eggs to impregnate you with Kiri. As for where they sent her, that doesn't seem to be in here. Her medical file only contains a few brief notes for when she was at the Star Blossom facility, and nothing else. Kairu was silent for a moment, a weight weighing her down before she finally said, So I have a little sister I never knew, and a daughter with my sister that I never knew. They really screwed my life up, and they were going to archive my entire mind and upload a whole new life for me in a month's time since Saminara apparently wanted me to be her personal maid and incubator. Megumi sighed, messed up indeed. I don't know if I can find your sister, but I do know where Kiri is. Although I should point out that she is, heavily brainwashed, and conditioned, not to mention she probably had no desire to even meet me. They likely made her that way too. She let out a breath, unfortunately that ship likely sailed. I was never given a chance with her, I'm not sure we could even build a relationship after what they have done to us. She gasped as a thought occurred to her, they got to my family before my sister was born didn't they? What else have they done to my family? Megumi shrugged, it's not in these files, I've checked, Kairu sighed, afraid that was the answer, she could try and go home, but certainly not right now, maybe later after they had started resolving things. Her mind then drifted back to what she remembered about her family. Last she had heard her father had been in an accident, and her mother was single again. How true that was, she didn't know. It was more likely they had done something. Finally she decided to confront something she had been avoiding, what had been done with her eggs. She glanced back at that list, and felt her heart do flips. The list was long, very long. They had paired her eggs with numerous girls, Neku and Inaira alike. She technically had thousands of kids she had never known about. Worse that only covered the surface, a number of her eggs had been sent off for research whatever that meant. With a notation about the fate of each batch of eggs, she was not sure if it was better to know this or not. 14. Chapter 95 The Facility Kiri stepped off the ship, and looked around. They had arrived at their destination, the facility. 
Well that was simply the unofficial name for it as there were several other such facilities but she didn't know the name for this place. Not yet in any case. A puri came up behind her and smiled. Keep those eggs close and don't stray too far from me. Okay. She nodded. I will. Good. Now that you are here, I'll tell you a bit about the facility. This is one of the five branch labs and coordination facilities. I have an office here and which has access to several databases. I'll show you what you need to know about that. But when we leave we will need to archive your memories of this place. Okay? She nodded. That's alright. It's fun having my memories messed with. A puri giggled. I'm sure it is. But before you ask, like that nurse you spoke with, not everyone here has all their memories of the place archived. There will be some items you will be allowed to remember. Understood. Speaking of the nurse, she mentioned that Officer Mary's daughter was here as a test subject. Can we see what they are doing to her? Sure we can sweetie. Kiri smiled. Great. I was told that it was quite the intriguing project. A puri led her down a path, and said, Yes, I've heard some interesting things about that. Feeling a bit of excitement, she followed along while still looking around. The docks were wide open, with plenty of space for passengers and cargo to be moved. The corridor was wide, and decorated with pleasing landscape murals. It gave the place a different feel from the academy. A puri's office, it turned out, wasn't far from the docks, and they stopped briefly to leave a few files on the desk before heading on to the labs where they would deliver the eggs, and she hoped to get to see the test subject she had heard about. Today was going to be good, she knew it was, Kairu sighed, she had gone through her file, and Miku's thoroughly by this point. Several times in fact, her list of kids was far too long, and then there was another subject she had avoided, the fate of her extracted memories. Unfortunately as Megumi had predicted they had long since purged the archives, although based on the notations some memories like those of her missing sister had apparently been permanently erased long before she had even met Megumi. Evidence that she was never supposed to know about her sister, and they clearly had no plans to reunite them down the road. She was also left wondering what exactly they had been after in regards to her little sis. It occurred to her that would be another relationship to rebuild, if she could even do that they would have to find her first. Kairu had a feeling that Megumi would be able to do that, even if a little luck would be involved. These medical files seem to indicate that they did in fact document what they were doing, but the previous lack of such documentation meant they protected it on close servers and databanks. Some kind of central database would make sense, perhaps as an archive or something. The real question was where would they keep such an archive of their activities, given their behavior it would have to be somewhere they felt they had absolute control only way that would make sense in fact. That might also explain a bit about what they knew in regards to her little sister, that she didn't even know she had. Maybe it would have been better not to know about this. But now that she did, Kairu was tempted to dig further. To find her, Kairu wanted to put her family back together. Not that it would be easy, those lost memories were going to be gone forever. Megumi suddenly spoke up, I must be luckier than I thought. Why? Oh, just something I overheard while following little Kiri. Her boss, a puri mentioned that the facility they recently arrived at has offices with access to multiple databases, perhaps it will be a lead on your sister? Kyrie leaned back, maybe, but they destroyed our memories together, how are we going to rebuild our relationship when we don't even know each other, not to mention there is the question of what else they have done to us, there is one possible solution, although that will be a bit out of the way, Kyrie blinked, solution, what solution, remember Ava? Her long distance hail? Kyra nodded. What about it? Well I have her coordinates. Not exact ones, but close enough to find her if she is still in the area, and she can help. Help how? Megumi snapped her fingers and a series of files were projected. May I present to you the Iridex Collective? They are an enemy of the Empire, and for good reason. They like to use biologicals such as yourself as drones. As for how they turn people into drones, well they like to completely remove the brain, and replace it with a computer effectively killing the person, and turning their corpse into a sort of living robot. As you might guess, reversing the process is rather impossible given the lack of a brain. With enough medical knowledge you can regrow the brain, but that results in effectively a new person. As who they were is gone, at least normally, there is a way to restore those memories. 
but it requires a knowledge of a certain ritual, and a lot of power. I know the theories behind the ritual, but do not have the ability to actually do it. Alira has neither the requisite understanding or power, and while I might be able to find a dragon that can do it, it may take years to teach them the ritual. Ava on the other hand would know the ritual, and has the power to do it on her own. Do you mean my memories aren't gone forever? Megumi sighed, sort of. The ritual can restore impressions of lost memory from which they can be recreated with reasonable accuracy, but something is inevitably lost, it's a partial solution at best. Kyrie waved her hand, thanks for the suggestion, but that just doesn't seem worth it, we would be going out of our way, all for what would only be a partial set of interpretations. I'd rather just hope the file is wrong and I can find a forgotten copy of my old memories, Megumi nodded. All right, whatever you wish princess. The pair arrived at the lab to find a younger Inaira eagerly awaiting them. She smiled. Ah Apuri, glad you made it here on time. She knelt, and you must be Kiri. Apuri mentioned that she had a new assistant, and you're so cute, nice to meet one of the girls whose eggs I've been working with as well. She smiled, I'm glad you found them useful. Oh, I have, care to see what I have been doing with your eggs? Kiri nodded, I'd like to, I've been curious. The woman smiled, well there are a few different projects using eggs harvested from necu donors such as yourself. Ours uses only the best eggs donated, where other projects work mainly with the rejects. Of course that is in part due to a difference in goals. Goals? At this lab we are trying to create a better necu. We take superior eggs, and modify them to be even better. Once we have the egg reshaped as desired, we use it to fertilize a prepared womb. We use a lot of younger officers who can be spared, along with girls procured specifically for the program. Kiri listened along, and then asked, Are there any particular requirements for these girls? The lab girl smiled. Why yes. While we don't need them to be from good bloodlines per se, it is vastly preferred. Your own line has excellent potential, and you do have relatives in the program, none of which are at this facility. Good genes, healthy bodies with high potential, and excellent wombs run in your blood, which are all things we look for. Typically we stick to younger healthier females that score high enough with certain metrics, especially ones with the right genes to add to our program such as yourself. Nodding, she asked, so what kind of modifications are you doing? The lab girl's smile widened. We have been working on several metrics, improving the NECU lifespan, increasing the prime fertile period among NECU females, working to shorten the developmental period. Currently, an ordinary NECU takes 15 years to reach adulthood, where we are adults by 5 years. Our goal is to shorten that to 10 years at most, which would allow a NECU to start breeding as young as 6 in theory. Ideally they would be about 8 when they start seeking partners. After all, if you do the math. 6 would be equal to about what 12 years normally is now, and most Nekya would be in the late stages of puberty, if not already through it by that age. Kiri feeling a surge of emotion, and a pang of what she could only describe as a bit of jealousy said, you mean these girls would get a chance to be mothers at a younger age? That sounds lovely, we considered trying to match Nekya developmental speed with our own, but we know that won't be too popular. One of the joys of raising Nekya kids is it takes longer. But some say it takes too long right now, which I have to agree, as it takes them so long to be ready for motherhood themselves, and many caretakers agree, there is a certain joy in taking care of the children of those you cared for, you know? Kiri frowned, I'll take your word for it. I'd tell you to wait for a child of your own, but you aren't allowed so I won't. Maybe someone will let you care for a child you incubate for them? Best you might be allowed, but I have a feeling you are okay with that. She smiled, yeah that sounds nice. I figured, of course we aren't only focusing on improving female fertility, we are also trying to improve other metrics. You name the metric and we have been working on it to some degree, and so far results have been quite promising. Anyway, I have kept you too long, now run along, and have fun with your mistress. Kiri nodded, smiled, and soon left the room with a puri. There was something else she was looking forward to seeing, in a neighboring lab. Glancing at a display she noted that they would be just in time for a procedure involving the little lady she wanted to see. Kiri was quite curious about what they were doing to the young girl taken from her mother to be a test subject. The walk to the other lab was delightfully short. It only took a couple of minutes, especially given the low foot traffic, and luxuriously wide corridors that gave plenty of space for people and equipment to move back and forth. Another Inairai greeted them at the door of the lab, and they were admitted. Almost immediately the Inairai struck up a conversation with Apuri, which gave Kiri a moment to look around. She soon noticed the only other Neku in the room, 
As she made her way unsteadily over towards the door, one of the first things Kiri noted about her was that she didn't have a tail, a factor that might explain her unsteady legs. She was smaller built just like her mother with bright green eyes, a cute pixie face, silky black fur, and long black hair. The girl smiled, hello, I'm Ray. Kiri, what happened to your tail? She smiled happily, oh, that mistress had it amputated last week, I'm still getting used to not having one. I didn't realize how much I was using it, until they cut it off. Oh? Was something wrong with it? She giggled, and replied, nope, it was perfectly healthy. Kiri moved around and took a look at her naked rear more closely, noting the closed scar of the recent amputation. So why did they cut it off then? Well, mistress decided it was about time to start testing how I respond to her new regenerative therapies. Especially since I'm already having my growth modified. <laughs> growth modified? In what way? She is working on techniques that will better allow a mistress to modify their neckus appearance. In my case, she is testing a serum that not only retards growth, but actually reverses it. Another voice interjected, more specifically. The serum freezes sexual development, and reduces the height of the subject. I've tested several variations of it on Little Rare here. Along with other modifications to improve her appearance, she glanced over to see a new Inari face had approached. The Inari smiled. I hope you enjoy watching today's procedure. I'll be clipping her ears, and administering a new serum to stimulate regeneration, among other things. Kiri glanced at Rez's ears, as they twitched on her head. Her face scrunched. Why didn't you clip them when you did her tail? Rep pouted. She was planning to. But my tail alone proved a little too much for me. I was too sensitive, and passed out from the pain. What an or anesthesia? A grin appeared on the Inairai's face. Of course not. That would dampen her pain response, and I would lose valuable data on one of the metrics my serum has been modifying. Her sensitivity, which has increased quite a bit since I got custody of the little lady. Kiri frowned. I, uh, see, but isn't pleasure used as the usual metric, perhaps, but I find pain response most informative. So I focus on inflicting that to test how sensitivity modifications are progressing. It's not as pleasant for the subjects, but a little conditioning is more than sufficient to fix that. She looked towards Ray. Ready to have your rears clipped? She nodded excitedly. It seemed she was strangely looking forward to this. Kiri wasn't so sure she would be that eager to have her own ears clipped. She let out a breath, and inquired, so why are you clipping her ears, and amputating her tail exactly, aside from the regenerative therapy that Rhett told me about? The woman smiled, ah, easy, for one, both sets of injuries are not life-threatening for a NECU, the tail is more life-affecting, since the tail plays a major role in a NECU's balance, and to some degree her body language. On a different note I also wanted the whole set for myself. Her smile transitioned into a predatory grin, I think I'd look good with a tail, and some neck ears. Don't you agree? Kerry blinked, and tried to picture an Inairi with neck ear features. She wasn't sure about that. She thought they all looked pretty the way they are, but she had to admit the girl before her would look exotic with res ears, which would stand out, but not look entirely out of place. You just might. The woman giggled, I guess you would have to see the tail, I got from Reven. She had a truly gorgeous tail, very nice with superb fur. I'd rate it about as highly as yours. You have a truly supreme tail yourself. It would fetch a nice price on the market. Care to donate it? She frowned. But before she could reply the other woman giggled. I'm joking. I don't need your tail, and you aren't one of my subjects. So I can't take it. Kiri nodded slowly, and then a moment later the woman led Rhett to the operating chair. She was helped into the chair, and then secured. It wasn't always needed to secure a conditioned subject, since they rarely resisted a procedure, but this was one procedure that would require it, since neither anesthetic nor conditioning was being used to prevent Ref from experiencing the full pain of having her ears clipped. Once she was secure, a series of probes were attached to her body, a nearby monitor lit up with medical data as each probe was anchored to a point on Ref's small body. The Inari woman made sure each one was secure, and then prepped an injector with a translucent purple fluid, filling to about half capacity, and then setting it aside, before prepping a second. As she was finishing, she spoke, Okay sweetie, I'm going to start by injecting your little boobs, I'd like to see them get a bit bigger. You will feel some pain, as the serum starts to work. My other subject described it as a burning sensation. I'd like you to focus on the sensation and memorize it for your after-op report. Okay? Ren nodded, and a moment later the woman lifted Ren's left breast, adjusting in her hand before pressing the injector at the base of the nipple, 
An instant later the fluid drained into the boob, and Rez's face scrunched. A whimper escaped her throat, and after a moment she said, That burns, that really burns. A louder whimper escaped her, while the Aniri scientist started on the other boob, giving her no time to rest before plunging the injector into the base of her right nipple. As that fluid disappeared into her right breast, the left one had already started to swell visibly. The Aniri noted that and focused a few scanners on the two boobs, and recorded the readings. After a minute or two the swelling stopped, and the Anirai commented, Almost ten centimeters, a little more than I projected. That should do. Maybe we should see how you react to my other serum, the one for shrinking breasts? She frowned. Maybe not today though. Need to let your boobs recover from the forced growth. Don't want to kill them, Kerry interjected. Kill? I tested rapidly alternating between the two serums on a subject just last week, it proved quite stressful to the breasts, and resulted in necrosis of the breast tissue. I had to remove her boobs, but so far she seems to be responding well to regenerative therapy. I think her new boobs will be ready for a new round of growth tests in about a month. Thankfully the serum's effects are pretty localized so the other subject experienced no other adverse effects. Maybe when she is ready, I'll try the same test with longer intervals. Oh. On a different note, Rehia might be perfect for that other serum I wanted to try. We can do that in a minute. She then turned, and pulled a tool off the table. It was a pair of clippers clearly, but oddly designed. They were shaped with an adjustable fit that would slip over the ears, and a single blade was positioned near the base of the ear. The Anirai woman slipped it over his left ear, and clamped it on securely. Okay. I'm about to clip your left ear, don't forget to pay attention to the pain. Okay sweetie, whimpered slightly, but nodded, I will. With that, the Anira moved the blade, and it began to cut through the base of the ear with little resistance. In that moment, Red jerked a bit, but the clamp and restraints held her steady, preventing her movements from affecting the cut. In a moment, the ear was separated, and a laser ran over the wound stimulating it to close. The woman removed the clipped ear from the clamp and placed it into a bath of jelly on the table. A natural biogenerative that would act to keep it preserved and fresh. The special blade, had also given it a nice clean cut that would be easy to reattach. If they had been planning to do that, the Anirai woman repeated the process with the other ear. Again Red jerked the moment the specially designed blade started cutting through her ear. The blade only took a moment to sever the ear, and the second ear was soon added to the jelly. The woman grinned. There we are sweetie. I now have the whole set, can you hear me alright? Whimpered for a moment, you sound a little weird. Of course, I do, but that's only until your ears grow back, and if I don't miss my guess they will grow back before your tail does. She turned then, and started prepping a series of injector ports, making sure each one was clean and ready. Then she started attaching them. The first pair were attached to Rez's thighs, the next pair further down her legs. A couple more were attached to her butt, with a few more placed across her belly and chest. Four were attached to her arms, and one to either side of her neck. A series of tubes were attached to the injectors, and the scientist prepared two solutions. One colored a golden color, the other green. Okay, I'm about to administer the regenerative serum. You should feel some intense tingling when it enters your veins. And I've been told your wounds will start to burn a little once the serum starts to take effect. Revisibly braced herself and a moment later the yellow fluid was allowed to flow. It went down the tubes. The scientist checked the scanners, and then started prepping a second set of tubes. A moment later was really whimpering. Her face scrunched. Kiri noticed the flesh visibly moving where her ears had been. It wasn't very fast, but over a couple of minutes a pair of short stubs formed, maybe half a centimeter by the time all the serum had entered her, with just a few millimeters more by the time the Anirai was swapping tubes. And this is the shrinking formula, I've made some tweaks over the last version, we will see if you are any more responsive to it. Ren nodded, even as she was clearly trying to endure the other formula. Although she wasn't reacting as much as she did to other things, that changed the moment the green fluid started flowing into her veins. She let out a small shriek, that's cold. After a couple of minutes, she began to visibly shrink, as the movement of the flesh around her ears accelerated, and her boobs seemed to swell again. No wait, they really were swelling again. The scientist smiled, and monitored the readings, ignoring Rez's clear discomfort over the procedure. Rez settled after a couple of minutes, visibly smaller, 
the scientist with a big grin on her face. Perfect, I hit a real winner this time. You responded much better than predicted. You just lost 20 full centimeters in 2 minutes, 10 times the previous best from last week. Your new height is 100.6 centimeters. I think one more dose and we will hit the goal. Think you can take it right now? Rez half regenerated ears twitched, and with a note of hesitation in her voice, I'll take it mistress. Good girl, now give me a minute to calculate the right dose. She said while working to prep more of the green solution, and reading the monitor. Looks like the regenerative also helped deal with the stress caused by the shrinking formula, and may have helped more than I thought it would with the process. She proceeded to mix in the same compounds from the regenerative, the fluid turned a slightly yellowish green, and a moment later a smaller amount was allowed to flow into the little girl triggering a second shrinking, this one seemed less intense, and finished faster, the scientist measured her again, and smiled, there we are, perfect, you are now 90 centimeters tall, a full 40 centimeters shorter than the day you arrived, you look so precious, especially with the larger boobs. Now let's get you a second set on that tiny frame. With that she walked off, and came back with a few new compounds, and proceeded to prep another serum, two doses in separate injectors. She set them aside, and removed the injector ports, and tubes. As she did so, she began, One reason you neck you make poor mothers in my opinion is your lack of breasts. Sure two looks cute, but so can four, and even better, six. This is a newer serum I've been working on that will stimulate you to grow a new pair centered on the injection sites. You will be my first NECU trial, okay sweetie? Ren nodded. Will it hurt? I suspect it will burn the way your boobs did when I made them grow, okay sweetie? Ren smiled. Great. Kiri shook her head. All that pain, and she was eager for more. It was kind of clear what conditioning her mistress had given her. The first injector was pressed against her torso a couple centimeters below the base of her left breast and secured there. The Anirai took a couple quick measurements, and chose a similarly located site for the second injector below the right, behind her Kiri heard a Puri comment, now this might be useful if it works, especially if the new set is fully functional. She is being a bit tortured by this though, commented Kiri, perhaps, but this is what she is here for, now an argument can be made about Ryanara's methods, but we aren't here to make that, Kiri replied. True, we aren't. Just moments before the injectors were depressed, and the fluid within rushed into Ray. She whimpered immediately, tears flooding her eyes, as the flesh swelled, and discolored around the injection site. Ranara removed the injectors, and a moment later a tiny nipple erupted right in the middle of the pink flesh that had discolored. Exactly at the same point the injector had occupied a moment before. In moments, as Ray screamed about it burning. Her new boobs swelled at a rapid pace, quickly forming into a set of breasts. A pair of mild swellings really, not the large perky orbs she had immediately above them. Ranara commented, I was hoping they would be a little bigger, but no matter, I can just inject them with growth serum, get em to swell up properly. She focused a scanner over them, and noted a few readings. <laughs> Looks like they formed properly though, should be fully functional, let's see how sensitive they are. She pulled out a few small devices, which she proceeded to attach to all over, not just to her new breasts. In fact, sweetie, it's time to test your pain responses. I'm going to stimulate you, and each time something hurts, I want you to identify the part and give me a number for how bad. The bigger the better. Ranara's grin was somewhat predatory, but Ve simply nodded. Kiri watched as Ranara proceeded to inflict an increasingly severe amount of pain monitoring how she responded to it, and kept going until poor Rep passed out, which took a surprising amount of time. After Rep passed out, Ranara commented, she lasted a full two minutes longer than last time. She turned to the other Inairi that had greeted them at the door, clean her up, and put her to rest. When she wakes, make sure she writes her post-op report. The woman nodded and proceeded to extract Ray from the chair. As she left with little Ray, Ranara collected the pair of ears, and turned to them. Care to talk in my office? It was fun having you observe. As those two headed off to the office, Megumi processed the feelings she had on what she had just watched. She felt quite sorry for the poor little Neku. That Ryanara was clearly a little off, but it seemed she was a genius when it came to certain fields of medicine. Megumi had analyzed all her compounds, which were quite effective at what they did, with surprisingly few side effects considering they had just reduced the poor girl's size drastically. Especially for so young a society. Of course that was in part due to the fact the serums were infused with mana, they were magical medicines, 
literally, mentally, she marked the incident as something not to tell Kairu about, and made a mental note about the girl. Once she got a hold of Pori, and her mother, she would restore her to her former size, and undo some of the other work done on the poor girl. It did not escape her drone's eye that Riz's development had been artificially frozen. The drugs she was on, would ensure she would never grow as long as she was on them. That also meant she wasn't going to regain that lost size. The mental damage from this was quite high as well. That would take a while to restore. Of course there was also the question of whether or not they had kept an archive of the two's extracted memories. Megumi already knew that Mommy no longer knew who her daughter was. As for a, she may not know who her mother is either. With those thoughts in mind, she turned to the second drone that she had recently created while also observing that horror of a procedure. This one was sent not to follow, but to look for an access point to the local databanks. She needed to find a lead. 11. Interlude Magical Medicine, and Nasty Parasites. Megumi reviewed her databases on magical medicines, bringing the information back into active memory, as she began reprocessing all the data to decide the best method of reversing the procedures she had just witnessed. Thankfully the Solian people were very old and their knowledge quite vast. It was part of why their empire had been as vast as it was. There was only one precursor race whose knowledge rivaled their own, the Altian Directorate. Of course that is referring to known species, the Empire had spread to many galaxies, and ships were also heading further out into the universe. But the universe was vast, far larger than the Empire could ever hope to fully explore. Although that was not true of every reality, as the First Lords could attest to, the secrets of crossing realms was lost with them, but the doorways to the pocket dimensions they had created remained, not to mention some other secrets of the First Lords remained. They were the first to explore combining the esoteric energies used in transcendent shiniks with the practices of modern medicine. Learning how infusing mana and intent could change ingredients and the effects of medicines. What ingredients you chose mattered, as they would prove especially effective if their properties were in line with your intent. Thankfully Megumi's ability to work with mystical energies meant that she could produce such medicines, and in fair quantities as well. Even if that wasn't the intent behind giving her shinnok ability, that was actually mainly intended to benefit her defensive systems, and provide her an additional form of communication, not to mention it helped improve her ability to respond to the needs of her crew. The defensive system that benefited most from this was in fact her shields, since they were designed to be partially shinnik in nature, allowing them to not only better resist magical attacks, but also enhancing their effectiveness. That aspect of her abilities, also meant that she was naturally reluctant to actually produce such medicines unless there was a clear need for them not due to any programming on the part of her creators, but rather a result of her own natural evolution from centuries of combat experience. True mana was an endlessly renewable source of energy. As long as living beings existed in the universe there would be mana, and it also dwelt in limitless quantities in the depths of hyperspace. However, she could only draw and hold so much at a given moment. Being down on reserves had cost her before, while she felt little threat here. That made her no less comfortable to risk being down when she lacked an immediate need for such medicines. With those factors in mind, she considered her options. One person quickly came to mind, Malia her current captain and apprentice in the magical arts. They had not gotten particularly far with her lessons. Still mostly focused on theory rather than application but she had made quite a bit of progress. This was different from actual spell work, but it would be an application nonetheless. Something that could prove useful to gauge her progress. With a plan coming together, she gathered the materials, prepared one of her unused medical labs, and then materialized an avatar to talk with Milia. As it turned out Milia was reading a book, on parasites of all things, when Megumi arrived, noting the title she frowned. Enjoying the book, I was just browsing the library and thought this seemed interesting. Megumi glanced at the page she was on, and blinked. Most would likely find it rather creepy, especially the parasite you are reading about. Malia frowned, I guess just there is something fascinating about them as well. Megumi settled her avatar into a chair, and stretched. She took a moment to consider her response. Malia was reading about a small hive-minded parasitic insect one that is remarkably intelligent. Not individually, but rather collectively. With one exception, the queen, which is rather special, the parasite in question, known colloquially by the somewhat inaccurate name of Pussy Bug, 
thrived by colonizing in the genitals of female hosts. At least initially, the colony starts there, and expands throughout the body over time, often concentrating in the genitals, breasts, and brain of the host. The bugs are noted for having a shinic hive mind, that grows stronger with numbers. Oftentimes they have influence over the host long before they actually reach the brain. They were considered a somewhat nasty parasite due to their habits. A colony often begins by infesting the genitals of an unaware female, where it begins to alter them and make them into a home for the colony. The host will experience swelling, increased sensitivity, and boosted sex drive as the colony settles in. Studies have noted that the host will not experience any pain from the process, as the colony grows. It will take advantage of any males mating with a female they have infected to transfer eggs to other females. Being shinik in nature, it's not hard for them to implant suggestions in a nearby male. Often smaller colonies can't do more than that, and the influence is minimal, but their secretions have certain effects on any male mating with their host that lowers their resistance, while also making it easier to plant their eggs on him, which he can then plant in another female to start the process in another host. Eventually, the colony would migrate deeper into the host, especially as the queen begins to mature. For the queen, they will seek out the brain, creating passages straight towards it where they modify the brain to play host to the queen's chamber. Using the host's own brain tissue to enhance the growing queen's shinic ability. As the colony grows to this stage they often also colonize the breasts, modifying them for their own use as well. By this point the colony also has control of the host. Usually, this is also a critical mass point for the colony in terms of intelligence and shinnok ability. With the colony growing significantly more powerful once it spreads to the brain, even more so in a sapient host, especially if that host has shinnok potential. Of course that focuses on just one host. As she was well aware a single host leads to others, who end up forming part of a greater colony. Infected females will congregate together, and often mate with each other to allow the colonies to exchange eggs, and the queens to interact. In these greater colonies, the ruler or great queen is the queen of the host with the greatest shinnik ability as she is the most powerful queen. If a greater colony is left unnoticed and allowed to grow, it will eventually begin removing the local male population. As males of the host species are often considered to be a threat, and beyond being a method to move eggs, useless, cleaning up an established greater colony was often a pain, especially in cases when they have grown to the point that they have started producing new hosts from the host population. With even more pain associated with locating any migrant queens the colony may have produced, a real danger as those can produce new colonies in a neighboring population of hosts, or even jump species for new hosts. Megumi shook her head, honestly I don't find them fascinating. Bit of a pest, really, they can do a surprising amount of damage to a population, in a remarkably short period of time as well. Cleaning that up is always a pain too. Anyway, I didn't come here to discuss nasty parasites. I wanted to discuss magical medicines, Malia blinked. Interesting. I was reading about those. This chapter is discussing how magical medicines can be used to treat a host post-infection to reverse the numerous alterations the bugs make to their hosts. It is not the only method, but certainly a more effective way to do that. I don't need them for that, but to reverse something disturbing nonetheless. Malia frowned. Something disturbing? What did you find? She let out a simulated breath. Something I can't mention to Kairu. With what we already found she has enough to worry about. Why not? Megumi didn't say a word, she merely projected a few files, which Malia quickly read, and these are relevant how, Megumi played the video of what she had just witnessed in that black lab, Malia's face flipped through a few emotions, before she simply said, I see, yeah telling Kairu might not be the best idea, glad you understand, now I was hoping you might be interested in helping me make something that would reverse what they did to that poor girl, and those like her, what do you say, Malia closed her book, I'd love to, Twelve. Chapter 96 Preparations and Distant Events Megumi led Malia into the lab she had prepared. Equipment was set up, ingredients ready to use. She smiled. Ready to get started? Malia nodded. Good. In that case take your station, and I'll walk you through the process. We might waste a few ingredients seeing as you have never done this before. But don't worry. None of this is hard to replace. Malia returned a wry smile. Good to know. So where do I start? measure out about a gallon of pure water then infuse it with your mana, slowly, don't go too quickly or you will waste mana, don't stop until the water starts to glow, Malia grabbed the large beaker, 
and started measuring out purified water. Megumi watched her closely, as this was one of the more important steps. Creating the base intent wasn't yet needed, that came later. First she needed concentrated mana water upon which to build the potion they needed. Kiri stepped into Rainara's office and took a look around. It was a reasonably sized affair with a large desk, a few comfy looking sofas, a nice looking terminal, and a few decorations on the walls. One wall had an array of photos on it, and Kiri quickly picked out one that looked like it might be Ray. Another item she noted was a transparent case with a tail floating suspended in a special jelly. The tail was long with lush, silky looking fur, even with it dampened by the jelly. The fur was the same shade of black as Ray's fur in fact. Rainara set the ears she had taken from Ray down on the desk, and then said, Yep, that is indeed little Ray's tail. Quite gorgeous don't you agree? Kiri nodded. It does look gorgeous. Rainara smiled, then pointed at the photos on the wall. I have a photo of her taken the day she arrived over there. I hadn't yet worked on her appearance then, but you can tell she would have been popular. Now she is going to be even more so. Once I let her out of the lab that is, Apuri said. What are your plans for her anyway? I have quite a list of tests lined up for her. Actually, mostly continuing the current line. Kiri frowned. Does that mean you are going to cut her tail off again? Rainara nodded. I will. She is a good subject for testing my regenerative treatments. It will be a bit of a sacrifice for her. But a lot of Neko will benefit from it. So will a number of Anairi. As the treatments I'm working on can be applied to both species. Kerry blinked. They will. Rainara smiled. Yep. We do what we can to prevent it. But a lot of people suffer injuries including loss of limb. Especially on the battlefield. These people are the ones that benefit the most from what I am doing to Ray. My treatments mean those poor neck who won't have to suffer with a missing tail, or arm. With these treatments, lost limbs will grow back. In addition, Inaira mistresses will have a lot of customization options for their favorite Neku. It's a win for everyone. Except maybe Ray. Perhaps, that is true from a certain point of view. But she is getting an entirely new look out of this. She is starting to look so precious now. Those new boobs look delightful on her tiny frame don't you think? I guess? Responded Kiri, but she couldn't help but think about the fact that her ears had been clipped, and that her tail was amputated, a perfectly good tail no less, and she was going to have that done to her again. On a different note, she seemed to enjoy you being present, it would be lovely if you could attend her next amputation. Her, um, tail right? No her arm, she said with a look and then laughed. Of course it's her tail, silly. I'm going to keep that off. In fact, until my treatments are optimized to my satisfaction. I see, replied Kiri, with somewhat mixed feelings about this. She could see why the girl was taken from her mother. There was no way a mother would have approved of this being done to her little girl. She glanced to a Puri, who sent her reassuring vibes. Elsewhere a drone surveyed a room as it hovered cloaked. Megumi had tasked it with locating an access point for the local databanks. So far it hadn't had any luck, and only recently entered this lab. It was one of a small number of such drones. They had replicated where they could, but they couldn't replicate too much without alerting the subjects. Its sensors quickly registered the occupants. A young Ineki girl was strapped to a table. Several strange devices were hooked up to her body. From the look of it, several of them were monitors. There were a few other devices hooked up to her body. One of them was attached to her head, and included two needle-like projections piercing her temples, another notable device was attached to her small breasts, needle-like protrusions pierced the base of each boob, and a second ring of protrusions was piercing the base of the nipples. Her belly was also heavily swollen with young, a litter from the looks of things, another device had been inserted into her vagina, a scan revealed it went all the way into her womb and was connected to all the muscles and nerves there. The configuration seemed to indicate it was being used to provide direct control over her reproductive organs. The drone noted that down, as an Anaira checked to monitor, the Anaira the drone had followed into the room soon inquired of the scientists on station. How is the little lady doing? Better? Stress levels have fallen a little. The injections seem to be helping. Good. I was beginning to worry we might have been too ambitious with this litter. Care to update me on how her latest pregnancy is progressing? Little change from the last check-in. All six of the Neku are developing nicely, the Anairai girl we added to her womb is developing even better. This supports the data of the last three pregnancies with this subject. Perfect. And she remains on schedule for the birth. Yes? Yep. They are healthy and well developed. She can give birth to them now if you want it. I don't keep the birth scheduled for next week. Now, as for the other item. 
Are her boobs ready for today's experiment? They are. Preparation went well, and she is not producing any milk despite the late stage of her pregnancy, just as you wanted. I've got her boobs hooked up, and ready. As per your instructions, her consciousness has also been suppressed, although I am not sure why. Because I expect the procedure to be quite painful for her, I want to be able to monitor the pain readings as they come in, there is no reason for her to experience the pain. I'm not Ryanara, if you know what I mean. The drone focused several sensors on the experiment going on, while it approached a bank of terminals against the rear wall, a cloaked tendril reached forth, and it plugged in. Quickly beginning to scan the local access point, its rear sensors recorded the experiment going on with the young Nekka girl's boobs. Several vials filled with a light purple fluid were attached to the device encapsulating her small breasts. A button was depressed, and the fluid rushed into her boobs, eliciting a gasp from the subject, who, while technically unconscious, was still fully capable of feeling everything they were doing to her. Her nipples quickly hardened and turned a dark purple as the boobs started to swell, the skin pressing tightly against the device, and also turning a shade of purple. The boobs easily doubled in size over the course of the next few minutes, and the color shifted back to something more normal after a few minutes. Moments after normalizing in appearance, white fluid began to seep out of the nipples. It resembled milk but the fluid was clearly quite thick as it flowed slowly. The two in our eye were at the moment loading a second round of vials, which were promptly injected directly into the lactating boob. It looked to be the same fluid as before, and the response was quite the same, as the boobs darkened again, and began to swell, straining even more against the alien device securely encasing them. They were starting to look quite large on her frame, and the milk flow leaking from her increased even as the milk seemed to thicken further. Okay that seems to be our target. Begin the stimulation sequence, said the lead in Iri. The other complied. The device began to emit a series of pulses, each one eliciting a strong reaction from the subject. Within moments, the flow leaking from her breasts began to increase. With each pulse that flow seemed to get faster. By the time the sequence stopped, the milk was flowing like a river, erupting from her nipples in a steady stream. A new device was promptly attached to her nipples, and the milk was collected. The portion already spilled was cleaned up. The drone, having finished its scan, turned more focus towards the scene. What it was looking for was not here. It had thoroughly scanned all the data available to these consoles. They were not linked to the rest of the station, and they did have some interesting data on them. Nothing that it needed. However, the drone needed the classified archives, not what experiments were being done on young girls here. The two in Nairi seemed to be testing the subject's milk. She definitely responded nicely to the treatment. Milk flow improved dramatically compared to what it was before we suppressed her milk flow. Agreed. The milk thickened up nicely too. How are its properties looking? In line with what the market requested, we will need to test this on a few more subjects, and see if it remains consistent. If it does, I think the market will have a nice trick to improve production in the girls they are milking. Agreed, said the other. The drone noted their conversation and filed it away. It didn't seem important, but perhaps Megumi would be interested in the incident. For the drone, it matters not. At the moment however it needed to wait for someone to open the door. On a different note, how stressed are the young lady's boobs? Quite stressed. Two doses seems to be the limit of what they can take, as we expected. Would you like to give her a third dose to be certain? Not right now, we can do that with a subject whose boobs are a little more expendable. I have plans for this bear. So we will give her boobs time to rest before the next experiment. In the meantime, go ahead and wake her up. The Anairi assistant sighed, muttering under her breath, or, I was hoping to see her little boobies die. The other Anairi smacked her on the head. Ouch. She glared, what was that for? Boobs are precious, if you want to kill a body part, go experiment on a few boys, their penises dying to an experiment isn't even a loss, it's a bonus, got that? She nodded, and in a smaller voice muttered, but we can grow them back, and the reactions of these young girls when their boobies die are so precious. The drone marked that one, she would have to be watched, extra close, it seemed the assistant had certain tendencies, undesirable ones at that, despite her feelings on the matter, the assistant did obey instructions and manipulated the controls of a console, almost instantly, the device responded, the protrusions piercing into her brain slowly retracted, and as they did so her neural activity started returning to normal, a process aided by several stimulating pulses sent into her brain. It took the girl a minute or two to wake up, 
For a moment or two she just stared up at the ceiling, clearly taking a moment to get her bearings. The young girl shifted, and spoke. My boobs hurt. The scientist leaned over her with a smile. Of course they do sweetie, I was experimenting on them. I expect them to be quite tender for a while. The girl frowned. You were? I was. She pouted. I can't believe I missed that. Are you going to experiment on them again? Sure am, but your boobs need to rest. Tell me when they stop feeling tender. She smiled. I will. Just can I be awake next time? The scientist shrugged. Sure. But just so you know I expect the next one to hurt. Quite a bit. I'll give you something to help. Yay. The drone mostly ignored what was going on after this. It continued to record it. But by this point it was obvious that nothing here was relevant to its goal. A couple of hours later. The drone slipped into a new room. It was still following the same scientist from earlier. The little girl she had been experimenting on had been dropped off in a bedroom, one she clearly shared with four other girls. The room was modest with four beds. Each bed had its own trunk, and there was a table in the middle of the room. On shelves under the table were a number of group games. It seemed to be a fairly cozy setup where they could rest and relax. The young girl wasn't alone when she was dropped off either. Another girl, belly swollen with young, was lounging on one of the beds while enjoying a book. Nothing of real note. The drone scanned the new room. It was an office with a nice desk and a computer terminal dominating the room. Perhaps this time it would have some luck with an access. First however, it would have to wait for a chance to use the terminal unnoticed. A chance that came soon enough. As it turned out the scientist spent only a few minutes transferring her notes to the terminal before departing, locking the door behind her, but leaving the drone alone in her office, alone, with an active terminal. It moved towards the terminal, and extended a tendril quickly establishing a connection. Within seconds it was scanning the database, and soon found that it had access to a massive database. This was what it was looking for. In fact it quickly discovered it had found far more than it had been tasked to find. The drone quickly began processing and copying the treasure trove. Sending the data back to Megumi. Announcement. Can't wait for the invasion to start. Consider joining my Patreon, where the first chapters detailing Megumi's invasion of the Neku Imperium are already out. Also do consider leaving a like and a comment. 13. Chapter 97 Sisters Megumi processed the new files being sent to her. It was a fairly large database, but not that hard for her to assimilate. Each new scanned file revealed to her much about the operations of the Anairai, particularly their military branch. That arm of their society proved to be somewhat darker than the civilian arm. She had already seen a bit of what they were doing to the Neku, but this revealed a much fuller picture of the situation. It wasn't long before she came across a series of files that were of more personal interest to her, those related to Kairu and her family. As they had learned before, they got to Kairu's family before they got to Kairu. At the time, Kairu's mother had been pregnant with a daughter, one the Anairai were soon very interested in. The files indicated a desire to remove her from the family at birth, but Kairu proved to be a complication for that, especially since their influence hadn't been as strong back then. As such, while Kairu was having a rather normal academy life, they started preparing her family. Since they couldn't permanently remove the little girl from the family, they compromised. Kairu being in the military helped them coordinate the young girl's schedule. During her first few years, aside from when Kairu was visiting, the family lived with a caretaker who was there to ensure the little girl's development progressed the way they wanted to keep her from properly bonding with her mother, and make sure the little one was ready to be taken away later. Things started to change when the girl was seven. Kairu had been out of the academy for about three years then, and they had finally extended an arm to start conditioning Kairu. Something they had wanted to do earlier, as they had been really hoping to have the young girl completely separated from the family by this point. There were documented plans to have it done within a year after the first conditioning session for Kairu took place. Unfortunately, Kairu proved somewhat resistant to conditioning, and it took longer than planned to get her to the point they wanted. Still, she did progress nicely enough to allow them to do other things with the family they hadn't yet been able to. They managed to condition Kairu to not notice the pregnancies of her family members, which allowed them to start regularly impregnating her mother without worries that Kairu would notice. Given her mother's rank, she had naturally been sterilized previously, but they had planned to do this later. So they had a reserve of specially selected eggs taken from her ovaries. Years earlier, the records revealed she gave birth to several daughters that were taken from her at birth. More sisters that Kairu had no knowledge of. There was a list of various projects they had been taken for, Megumi noted them for review, 
and moved on to the girl's eighth year. Not long after she turned eight, Kairu was placed on a long-term assignment, so the girl was removed entirely from the family for that year. A year they took full advantage of. They deliberately induced the start of puberty for her to accelerate her sexual development and began full-scale conditioning. By nine, she had reached full sexual maturity and had been appropriately conditioned for the program. Kairu was still out on assignment, so they were in no rush to return her to the family. It seemed a few parties wanted to get her pregnant and have her start her breeding career right away. Thankfully for the young girl, they instead fitted her with a drainer and started harvesting some of her eggs. They removed it once they had enough, and when Kairu's long-term assignment came to an end later that year she was finally returned to the family. Kairu's conditioning continued to progress slower than they would like, limiting their ability to really do what they wanted with the young girl. Regardless, they did manage to get her for an extended period during her 11th year. By this point she was perfectly conditioned so they focused on completing her growth modifications, rather than impregnating her like they wanted to do, mainly since Kairu's conditioning wasn't progressing fast enough, and they were concerned that their plans would be set back if Kairu was alarmed. Around her 12th birthday however, Kairu finally reached the point where they were comfortable removing the girl from the family entirely. By this point removing her from mom and dad was simple. They simply walked in, and took her. The family didn't even question it, and as conditioned promptly forgot she existed. Arrangements were soon made for the girl to be taken to Star Blossom for a brief final encounter with Kairu, during which both girls were implanted with ovum from the other. While there Kairu had all memories of her sister extracted and her sister's memories were archived, all of them. They also archived her original personality, so that the condition one could permanently take over. Kairu would later give birth to Kairu, while her sister ended up giving birth to triplets. Something they expected since part of what they had done to her was meant to ensure she gave birth to litters. As soon as she gave birth, she was again impregnated with eggs taken from Kairu, while the babies were taken from her to be raised by caretakers. Records indicated that she was still currently part of their breeding program. She was not at the facility her drone had recovered these records from, but the records revealed the facility she was at. Even more interesting, Kairu's father was listed as also being there. His file proved interesting as well. It seemed they also had an interest in him and arranged for his permanent removal from the family as well, something they only really got started on after they had full access to Kairu's little sister Eriku. They arranged for his accident using it to provide a reason for his absence. Rather than completely erase him like they had Eric who once they had him, he was summarily corrected and then enrolled in the breeding program, as a breeder, just like Eric who. In fact, records showed that the pair had several children together. All daughters naturally, who were summarily taken from them to be raised by caretakers and enrolled in the breeding program. At this point things were far beyond simply cleaning the mess up. The next file she opened in relation to this mess proved to be quite interesting. She hiccuped for a moment, and then reprocessed it. Her course cycled several times as she processed the assault of emotions. It seemed there might be a chance to patch some of this mess up after all. Back at the Star Blossom Academy, a younger Inairi stepped into a clinic room. She smiled at the young Neki woman on the table. How are we feeling today? Are we adapting well to our correction? The girl frowned, and hefted her bare boobs a bit. It's a bit odd getting used to these, but I think I am getting the hang of it. Glad to hear it. Now then, why don't you lie down properly, and I can get started on your final assessment. We need to make sure you are fully functional. Well, aside from being sterile that is. She nodded and lay down properly on the chair, allowing the young Neku to get started on the procedure. One which was fairly routine. A complete checkup to make sure she was perfectly healthy and ready to assume her new duties. Although she would require a few more days of education before she could properly assume her new station as captain of a starship, her new rank was a major contributor towards why she was sterile. The Anairi looked over the results and was quite happy with it. She had adapted to her correction quite well it seemed. No adverse effects and she was right where they expected her to be. It would be hard to tell she had previously been male, and her potential while not great, had improved since the correction. In fact those figures were better than anticipated, but not as much as they would have liked. No matter, it wasn't going to affect her position, and the young Anairi felt the girl was better off regardless, content with the results of the scan. She logged them down, and then proceeded to conduct the memory procedure she needed to do, before sending the former man on her way. Stepping out of the room, a voice spoke. R. Turk, any issues? 
No, our former man turned girl is doing quite well, her potential scores were higher than expected, but they didn't reach the threshold you set. Shame, but it was to be expected, anyway, we have a new student for the special campus, today? I thought we weren't expecting any students for a while given the recent graduation, most of the campus is on break. Well, not for the special campus. This one is a little early though, more of them should arrive by the end of the week. After all, the special campus starts classes earlier than the regular campus, Turk blinked. I didn't expect that, I figured it was time for you to practice the induction procedures. I'll be supervising, but I'm confident you are ready for this procedure. So what are we doing anyway? General health check, installation and tuning of an egg drainer implant, and growth modification. This girl is going to be on the fast track like young Kiri was, so we expect her to graduate young. We will need to make sure she is sterile by the time she graduates, said her boss. Turk suppressed the urge to sigh, she felt sorry for the girl, and she hadn't even met her. The ranking officers were one thing, but the members of the special campus were a totally different story, it didn't entirely sit well with her, instead she said, I understand. Anything else? She is going to be on a special regimen given her age, and the requirements of the special campus fast track program. Nothing we have to worry about just yet. She sighed. I see. Not long after, her boss led her to a different room where a nurse was leading a young girl. She had a rather lithe, sleek build with cute soft puffy features, and her fur had rare jet black coloring. In fact, she looked a lot like another young neck you she had seen not that long ago only younger with a somewhat puffier face, and virtually no breasts to speak of, the girl was nude naturally, so she could see everything, allowing her to tell that the girl didn't seem that developed, in fact she seemed younger than she had expected, frowning, she looks a lot like a much younger version of Kiri, her boss nodded, not much surprise there, she comes from the same genetic stock, I see, but doesn't she seem a little young for the special campus program? Her official age is nine years old, which makes her just the right age to be entering the program. Turk blinked and gave her boss a look that seemed odd. So what's her real age? Not important. She paused and leaned closer. Just between you and me though we've been getting more girls lately that are younger than they should be. Rumor has it they plan to lower the minimum age for the special campus. Turk shifted. Lower it? Why? I have a few ideas, but we can discuss it later. Okay? She nodded but was left wondering what the little lady's exact age really was. Her boss changed the subject to the procedure and told her to have the girl lie down on the surgical bed. The girl happily lay down on the bed, and Turk proceeded to attach various probes and sensors. Nothing unusual there. But what she was told next felt weird. Okay. I know you haven't done implantation for an egg drainer before. First, we need to prepare her vaginal passage, both so that we can more easily implant the drainer, and so that we can start extracting eggs later. She paused, and shifted closer. First, I would like you to spread, and secure her labia in an open position. Pulling a couple of tools from the table, she did just that. The young girl actually helped her by spreading her own labia, allowing Turk to easily secure them in an open position revealing the delicate untouched pink flesh within. Good. Now grab that laser scalpel and remove her hymen. She will not need it. Turk frowned. What an or anesthetic. We never bother with that, and she won't want it. Do you sweetie? The girl shook her head. No, I want to feel this, all of it. Turk gave them both a look, let out of a breath, and thought to herself that this was just wrong. She was really regretting signing on with the military. She had been much happier at her old clinic. At least their things made more sense and she wasn't doing strange things to young girls. With a bit of hesitation, she took up the prepared scalpel, and slowly brought it to the girl's sex. She held it there for a moment or two to steady herself before beginning. The moment it touched the delicate flesh, the girl started to whimper, but nothing more. She wasn't even restrained, meaning she could have done something to protect herself, but did not. In mere seconds her hymen was gone, leaving the passage open. Very good. Next time I'd suggest going slower. Less risk of accidentally cutting more than you should that way. Turk blinked. I didn't want her to feel too much pain from this. The other woman giggled. She would have been fine. Anyway, see the device with the two long needles on one end? She noted the device. Yes, I see it. What about it? That device is used to open the cervix. Insert it gently into her vaginal passage and push it all the way in, the needles need to pierce the cervix, sighing, she followed the direction, and pushed it all the way in, just as the handle was pressing against the girl's flesh the thing beeped, at the same moment, she started whimpering, all right that means it's in, 
Press the blue button, to turn the device on, and step back. Let it do its thing. She pressed it and stepped back. Almost instantly the whimpering intensified, and the girl complained, that burns. Turk gave her a look and was tempted to just pull the device out. Her boss commented, this part doesn't take long and is the most painful for the subject. The device will deactivate itself when it is done, and we won't have to do it again. We won't? Nope. The device not only opens the cervix but temporarily paralyzes the muscles there. Ensuring the cervix stays open, the effect only lasts an hour, but by then we will have the implant in, and that implant will have control of the cervix so we won't have to force it open when it comes time to start extracting her eggs. Turk nodded, and after a moment the device finished its work. Without prompting Turk slowly removed the cervix opener, and she quickly noticed that the girl was now lubricated. As sticky juices now clung to the device, and slowly dripped from her, she gave her boss a look. The device did that as well. Makes inserting the drainer easier. Her boss said while handing her an object. Turk noted its shape. It was roughly sphere-shaped with a cylinder projecting from a large port in the base. It had several small holes on the top, and along a rim near the center line of the sphere. Her boss quickly directed her on the object. That is the drainer, the cylinder is the detachable part that stores the eggs, and naturally we need to change that out every once in a while. Making that the bottom of the device, now simply push it up her vaginal passage, until it's securely placed in the uterus. She gave it a look, and then glanced at the poor girl, feeling really sorry for her at this moment. With a bit of reluctance, she complied. The rather large device pushed her lower lips even further apart for a moment but slipped in quite easily. The girl didn't even complain as it was pushed up into her womb, only saying, that feels kind of weird, her boss commented, that's rather normal, now the next part is going to hurt a little, next part? inquired Turk, activating the drainer of course, she will feel some discomfort as the device interfaces with her organs and begins to take control of her ovulation cycle, I'll start that process, so you can move on to the next procedure while the device is activating. Turk nodded, so what am I doing? Prepare a few injectors, and eight 500 milliliters doses of TTR-247. Turk frowned, TTR-247? Isn't that a growth stunting compound? Her boss smiled, close, but not quite. In small doses, yes it does stunt growth, but in larger doses, it can be used to permanently halt natural growth. This is exactly what we want, we don't want her to continue growing naturally. Once her natural growth process has stopped, we will have much more control over how she grows during her years here at the academy. She shook her head. By more, you mean total. Seeing as she won't grow without intervention after we do this. Exactly. Now get those doses ready. The sooner her natural growth is stopped, the sooner we can get started on the next step. Turk sighed and started prepping the first dose. After a moment she inquired, which is, for now, we are going to focus her body's growth on sexual development. She isn't developed enough yet, so until she is, her body won't be allowed to grow in any other way. After that, we will review her development, and determine if any further growth is needed. If not, she will remain as is. Turk wasn't sure what to think about this. Is this common with the special students? Not all of them receive growth modification in this fashion, most of those on the regular track don't, merely a few supplements to help speed their natural growth a little. Regardless, all special students have their age reclassified on graduation, so we do need to eventually stop their natural growth. We typically do that in the last month before graduation for those who didn't receive this treatment on induction. This didn't really sit right with her, but it was her job. All too quickly the doses were ready to be administered and she was soon directed in their application. The first two injections were to her thighs, followed by a pair of locations on either side of her belly. Each breast then received an injection, and final pair were on either side of her neck. Aside from the initial reaction from being injected, she showed no signs of reaction to this treatment. Not visible to the naked eye, but the sensors clearly showed how it was affecting her body chemistry. There was an immediate, and very sharp drop in growth hormones, and production of those hormones also started to drop off rapidly. As the drugs were taking their life-changing effects her boss smiled. Alright, TTR-247 will take a few minutes to take full effect. In the meantime, we can prepare her special growth regimen. I expect you to remember the exact details of the regimen, as you will be giving it to her twice a week for the next three months. Three months? 
inquired Turk. That is when her first development assessment will be, and adjustments will be made to the regimen afterwards. This part didn't sit that well with her at all. Over the next few minutes, she was walked through the preparation and application of the special regimen. After that the young girl was given a full health exam, to make sure she was healthy, and to make sure she was responding to the procedure correctly. Her boss smiled, okay, sweetie you can get up, we are quite done here, the nurse will show you the dorms, and we will see you in a couple of days. The girl smiled, and moved off the table, thanks for stopping my growth and implanting me with an egg trainer. When are we going to take out the first batch of my eggs? In about two weeks, you have such high quality eggs too, so it will be a pleasure to take them out. The breeders are already lining up girls to impregnate with them. Oh, great, I'm glad to hear that plans are already being made for them. Of course they are. Now run along. As Turk listened to that, she cleaned up the room. By the time she was done, the girl and her boss were gone, leaving her alone. A glance at the schedule showed it was late, and it was her rest hour. With that in mind, she headed off to her room. As soon as she entered, a familiar psychic voice spoke to her. So have you considered my offer? The voice had spoken to her before. Turk had not been sure of the offer before, but after that she was. Yes, Megumi, I think I will agree to work for you. If you promise to make things right, I plan to. Before you know it. Your people and the Neku will have a much healthier, more symbiotic relationship. In that case, I accept. A piece of paper suddenly materialized on her desk. In that case, I would like you to sign this binding magical contract. It contains all the terms we discussed the first time we spoke. Turk looked it over, and found she was right. The contract outlined her duties, what she was to report, how she was to help extend Megumi's influence here, and what Megumi would do for her in exchange. The fine print looked normal as well. She signed. Megumi smiled to herself. Her avatar moved with a bit of excitement. While some of things she had recently found were not good, she had plenty of good news to share. With that in mind, she was heading off to speak to Kairu again. They didn't have much time left, as her preparations were nearly complete. In just a couple of days, she was going to reveal her hand. 13. Chapter 98 Riku's New Home Yeria stretched a bit as she stepped off the truck, and looked around. She had brought Riku out of the nest where her new home was located, the one they had prepared for Riku. Young girls played in the gardens, giggled, and generally enjoyed themselves as they frolicked and enjoyed games. She noted kids of all ages, both Neku and Inairai. It was a wonderful sight seeing so many happy young girls able to enjoy their lives without a care. Here they were safe, none would harm them here. In the nest young girls like this not only had the guidance of their caretakers to support them, but they were surrounded by friends, and friendly faces, they could go to any Inairai for the care and support they need, the same could be said of the Neku mothers here, but they were encouraged to go to the Inairai if they had a problem. Being such a friendly community, most homes had an open door policy, allowing any of the kids on the streets to go into any house. This nest had been here long enough that houses had also been renovated to make more sense. Bedrooms no longer had closets, and layouts were adjusted to better work for large families with many young girls to raise. After all, the Neku here no longer had silly clothing to store, so why have closets? In addition, young children brought with them a number of concerns that would have to be addressed. Really young girls, if not watched would get into all sorts of things, and even while watched they would get into things. In addition, Neku mothers weren't as able as an Inari one and some accommodations had to be made for them. Most homes had sensor clusters monitoring all the bedrooms and locks on all the cabinets. Nurseries had smart gates installed as well, so that people can go in and out of the nursery, while preventing babies and small children from wandering out of the nursery without needing to close the door. Every house naturally had a nursery as well, something that was weirdly not the case with most Neku neighborhoods. Just what kind of person wouldn't be prepared for a young child and not have a nursery? Honestly, it was just one more sign of how poor most Neku were at raising kids. Nearby Riku was looking around, and commented, certainly seems lively, it does, and Miku will certainly have lots of friends as she grows up, don't you agree? Yeah, I think she will, replied Riku. Yeria then gestured at a modest house not far from where they were standing, it was a cozy two-story building with a wide porch, wooden siding, and large windows, the lawn was well cared for as well, but unlike the other lawns no kids were playing in front of the building, making the building seem a bit lonely. This will be your new home, we have everything set up for you, your things have already been moved in, and unpacked for you, 
I supervised them earlier when I had a chance, she said while turning to collect Miku from her seat in the truck, she continued. I set everything up to my liking, and since you aren't going to be around much I figured you wouldn't have any objections. Rika nodded, that's great, and feel free to arrange my home however you like. Yuria smiled, I plan to, especially the nursery, consider that part of your home mine. Okay, Rika replied, of course, the nursery is yours, glad to hear it. Now speaking of the nursery, I am allowed to use it as I see fit, in addition unless I tell you otherwise you are never to set foot in the room, of course, that way you can leave Miku in there, and be assured I won't interact with her, yes, you are getting it, now how do you feel about that, not as bad as I thought, I am looking forward to the day you cut off all my contact with her, you are, glad to hear that, does that mean you are willing to drop your supervised hours, I guess, but I would still like a little time with her. Yuria smiled. That's perfectly all right. She paused as she guided Miku to a nipple and began to feed her some of her own milk. At the moment it was technically Riku's turn to feed Miku but she knew Riku would not complain. In that case would you like to at least reduce the hours? We can fill them up with extra work hours. Giving you an excuse not to interact with Miku. She frowned. I guess we can do that. How many hours are we talking? Yuria shifted. Having already prepared for this, I was thinking about half of them. Of course of those hours half of them will be at the standard half pay for overtime rate. The rest will be unpaid. As usual all of that money will go into that account we opened for you and aren't to touch it. I'll be using it at my discretion of course. Sound good? Rika nodded. Sure that sounds good. I'm glad I have you to help manage my hours and losing half my hours with Miku sounds perfect. I was afraid the previous schedule had too many. Yuria smiled. Glad you are okay with that. Anyway we don't have too much time before I have to get Mickey home. Come let me show you around and then introduce you to a girl I want you to mate with. <clears throat> you have a girl lined up already? Said Riku with a frown. Yuria nodded. Technically she is my sister, not a blood sister mind you, but a Neku girl my bond mother raised. My mother and I are hoping you bond with her. As such you will be spending most of your free time with her. Okay? Riku nodded. I guess. I don't really know her though. But that is not a problem is it? Rika nodded. Yeah it is not as much of a problem as I thought it would be. Great. In that case you won't have a problem rubbing pussy and getting each other pregnant? Rika nodded. I won't. You want me to get pregnant? Of course. And as agreed, I'll be raising your future daughters for you. So you can focus on your work and having babies. Alright? Rika pushed open the door to the house. Sounds good. Might not leave me much time to rest, though. Maybe not, but that is what your break days are for. Speaking of rest, I expect you to keep the house clean and presentable. Even using your rest hours if needed to keep the place clean. I understand. Great. You have any problems with that? Also since I will be using your place on occasion when you aren't here will you have any problems with me leaving it a mess? She looked around the foyer. It was set up with a few tables and a couple of sofas to help the place feel inviting. All new. Yuria had purchased them with Riku's money to help furnish the place since it was larger than her old apartment. Placed prominently on the wall was a childhood photo that had been altered to add nudity. No, I don't have a problem with that. Feel free to trash my place. Glad to hear it. Sorry if it means you don't get much sleep. I'll try not to leave it trashed too often. But don't worry I'll leave any cleaning that needs to be done for you to take care of. Alright? I appreciate that. The cleaning is the least I can do seeing as you will be raising my little girl, it is, on a different note, how do you feel about possibly not seeing her for years? I am perfectly alright with that, a bit sad that I won't see her first steps or first word, but I can live with that, glad to hear it, I was thinking of keeping things zero contact until her 10th birthday, once she is 10 you will be allowed to bond with her, but she will continue staying with me, I think we will let her move in with you around 12. Rika nodded, sounds good and I trust you to raise her right, it's why I gave you full control over my daughter, I'm glad you did, it will be so much fun raising your daughter into the perfect little girl, Riku smiled, and then gestured at the door leading further into the house, anyway, I think you wanted to show me around, I did, with that Riku led her into the house, showing her the various rooms, the kitchen, the bedrooms, saving the master for later since a certain girl was waiting in there, and of course the office. Stepping into the office, Riku looked around. It was cozy with a nice terminal set up at the desk. Yuria smiled. We got you a new terminal while you were with us. It was paid on credit to your account. Don't worry about the details. We will take care of paying it for you. As for your old terminal, 
We sold that and you will be seeing none of the money. It was used to help pay for your new one. That okay with you? Rooker nodded. It is. Feel free to sell my stuff. I'll also occasionally buy things with your money. Have any issues with that? She shook her head. No. Feel free to spend it as you see fit. You have every right to it. Yeria smiled. Glad you feel that way. Especially since you aren't allowed to touch your money. How do you feel about that? Riku while studying the blank monitor, replied. I don't have any problems with that. It's meant to help you raise Miku and any future daughters I entrust to your care. How can you properly do that if I can just spend some of it without warning? Yeria nodded. Yet yeah, would make my job harder and it's why you have that spending account. Speaking of the spending account, she paused as she picked up a piece of paper. Here is your pre-approved list of plan purchases for the week. I went ahead and did it for you this time. Seeing as you were otherwise busy, Riku took the paper, looked over it, and said, Looks good. Thank you. Then she glanced at the terminal. Anyway about my terminal. I had some. We copied all your data off your old terminal. We also pruned your data for you. Deleted programs and files you won't need. She paused as she booted the terminal and then logged in. In addition we added credentials so that we can use your terminal and peruse your activities. Also there is a new app installed. A secure communications app that will connect you with our services. We expect you to log in daily and the app will update you on anything you need to know that doesn't require the services of a courier. You will treat it the same as a courier as well. Rika nodded. I understand. She then glanced at the console. I will log into the new app daily, check my updates, and then forget them like I would a courier's messages. Carrying out any instructions given even if I don't remember them, correct? Yeria nodded. Very good. And about your data, how do you feel about your files being pruned? Rika nodded. I have no issues with that. Great. I figured you wouldn't. Glad to hear that bit of your conditioning is working. Now why don't you get your account set up to your liking? Oh yes. Remember to set yourself up as a child. Of course. She nodded. Of course. I presume you will want my password? Yeria smiled. I won't need it. But yes do give me that. They spent a few minutes as Riku set her account back up. As a restricted child account. One where Yuria had primary control. She also set up a few restrictions. None of which should be needed. But served as a failsafe just in case. Controls for an event where Riku's conditioning slipped. They would likely never be needed and she knew Riku would not mind them. With Miku shifting against her. She smiled as Riku stood up. Stretching and handing over some paper that had her password written on it. Yeria took it and placed it in her bag. The only thing she was keeping with her. Okay guess it's time to introduce you to Ilyu. Well sort of. A courier will be here in about two hours to escort you to your first shift. I want you to spend all that time mating with Ilyu. Okay? She nodded. Straight to sex. Eh? Haven't done that before. But sure. I guess we can do that. Guess we will have to learn about each other during the act. Yeria giggled. Don't talk too much. I'd like the both of you to be pregnant after this, Riku smiled, sounds fun. As Yuria led her out of the office, and towards the master bedroom, Riku stepped into the bedroom where a younger girl was waiting for them. She was quite pretty with gorgeous red hair, lovely purple eyes, and a fluffy red tail. The girl was lounging on the bed and giving her a lovely view of her small boobs and puffy pussy. One that was already quite swollen and wet as her own fingers teased her sex. The girl smiled when she saw them spreading her legs a little, gesturing in invitation. Riku closed the distance at Yuria's prompting, opening her mouth to ask a question. A tentacle landed against her lips as Yuria said, Not now, just mate with her. Okay? She nodded and complied. She clambered up onto the bed and then up on top of the other girl. Riku opened her lips to speak, only for her nipples to be grabbed. The other girl began to roll them in her fingers. Lightning surged through her and she felt herself grow wet in an instant. Suddenly her questions didn't seem that important. She pressed her pussy against that of the other girl and began to rub back and forth. Each movement sending incredible surges through her. Way better than anything before her trip to the resort. She was so glad she had taken the sexual response course. Especially after her world turned white only seconds after she started rubbing her vulva against the you, a girl she didn't even know. A fact that no longer seemed to matter. She wasn't sure why she had cared a moment ago. Yuria wanted her to have sex with this girl and she was cute so why did who she was matter at all? Those questions she had died as well slipping out of her mind in the fog of pleasure. She never even noticed when Yuria left with Miku. Instead she continued to press herself against Ilyu. Lightning surging through her with each movement. 
She even relished the feeling of her lower lips being pushed apart by a tentacle pushing out of Alu's pussy. She could feel one in her own belly responding but kept it from extending. She began to ride the tendril as it writhed against her folds. Each movement sent a surge of heat and lightning through her. All words were lost to her as her world evolved into simple sensation. Within moments a rush of heat rushed into her belly, and she knew her partner had come into her belly. For a moment she paused letting the tentacle do its work. Relishing in the sensations that followed as her altered womb and ovaries ovulated in response. When the tentacle in her belly finally withdrew, she sprang into action again. Her own tentacle pushing out of her folds with a delightful pop. She gasped as lightning surged from her sensitive folds. Moments later she plunged into the depths of the other girl moaning in delight as her fold pleasantly squeezed on her own wriggling flesh. In moments it slammed into the other girl's cervix and she let out a powerful moan. At the same moment her world turned white once again as she moved through the motions. It took only moments before she felt a rush of heat trickled through her and down her tentacle. She froze, relishing in the sensations as her own seed entered her partner. It wasn't actually semen but it performed the same function. For a moment she remembered how the organ was a gift and why it was given. Only for a moment though before the memory was lost in smoke as it should be. Her mind followed a moment later as a surge of lightning rippled through her turning her world white. When she came down, Riku merely resumed her activities. Yeria walked down the street. Little Miku shifting in her arms as she took in the activity. All around her young girls were playing. In the yard to her left a dozen young Neku and several Inairai girls were playing a game of tag. Across the street she saw a young Anairai girl about two from the look of it lounging in a chair while her Neku sister waited on her. The little toddler bringing her a drink and then dancing at her instruction. Yeria giggled. It seemed someone already had a little servant doing their every whim. It was kind of cute actually. She walked by it without a word, while mentally making a note about that girl. As cute as that was, she didn't want her little Miku interacting with her. She smiled as she watched all the young girls at play on her way home. It had been a while since she had been home but she expected it to be clean. She had an ecu made to keep it presentable. A delightful young woman who had been working for their family since she was nine. Reaching the end of the block, she made her way towards another house. Reaching the door she opened it and stepped inside. Her maid wasn't in view but the room was in perfect shape. Just as she left it. By the smell she figured her maid had been cleaning recently. She might find her here, but rather than look for her she made for the nursery. Mikya was tired and it was time to put the little girl to bed. She yawned and honestly she was as well. Reaching the nursery, she settled Mikyu into her crib and then collapsed into the bed she had placed in the room. Within moments both of them were asleep. For how long she didn't know, for she awoke to chaos. Announcement. Yes, we are finally getting to the end of this arc. I hope you enjoyed the wait. 15. Chapter 99 The Past A few years earlier, a young woman walked up the path to the door. She had been here before but it had been a while. She was most looking forward to this visit. Especially for what it meant. They could finally start working on the young girl who lived here. If not for a certain variable, they would have taken her years earlier. Reaching the door, she raised a tentacle and knocked. Normally a courier would have done this but given how important this was to her, she had chosen to come personally. It took only a moment before a woman answered the door. Properly naked, her belly swollen with child. She was nearly ready to give birth in fact. The woman smiled, her tail moving lazily behind her. Her whole demeanor was calm and relaxed. Hello? I. She smiled, allow me in. I am here to collect your daughter, Eriku. The woman nodded, of course, come in. Eriku is sleeping at the moment. I'll go ahead and wake her. Would you like something to drink? She glanced at a breast. Some fresh Neku milk would be nice. The Neku woman nodded. Of course, I'll squeeze some out for you. As the woman moved off to collect her daughter and get that milk, she looked around the room. It was a cozy foyer with a nice seating area nearby. She found a nice spot on a sofa and settled down to wait. A few minutes later the bear returned and she locked eyes on the sleepy little girl. She knew the girl had recently turned eight. Not that she looked it. She seemed a little younger. Not that the young woman was surprised about that. In fact, she expected it. They hadn't been able to exercise the prolonged access they would have liked with young Eric who, as such, they had deliberately stopped her natural growth last year so that she wouldn't grow past the point in her development they wanted, not without them being able to control her growth that is. The young girl was nude like her mother, as was proper. The only thing she was wearing being a lovely blue tail ribbon, 
It was a cute accessory and since it concealed nothing, she figured it was acceptable. It went well with the lush jet black fur of her tail. She smiled, hello there sweetie. Come here, she said while patting a spot on her lap. The girl eagerly approached and settled into her lap. She started rubbing behind the girl's ears, something she quite enjoyed, and then focused on her mother while also accepting the glass of milk she asked for. So you said you were collecting Eriku. How long will she be gone this time? The young woman smiled. Well, Demaya, since your daughter Kairu is out on an extended assignment we figured we were going to keep little Eriku with us for an extended period. Instead of a month like last time, we are thinking of the entire year. Like last time I want you to forget your little girl even exists for me. Okay? She nodded. Of course. Eriku shifted. Big sis is on extended assignment? Does that mean I won't see her? The young woman nodded. Not for a year at least. Eriku pouted. I like big sis. I want to see her. She reached into Eriku's mind. I know, but think about it. A whole year without your family. Doesn't that sound exciting? We will be able to do whatever we want with you. She pouted. It does, but Big Sis won't be there. She patted her head. Don't worry, we will get Big Sis eventually and then she can join you. In the meantime, be a good girl for me. Okay, she giggled. Well do you want to spend that entire year with your mommy? Eriku quickly shook her head. No, I hate mum. Her mother smiled. I'm glad. The young woman smiled. That was exactly what they wanted. They had been working towards this. It was a shame she had bonded with her sister rather than the caretaker, but she figured that was okay, especially once they had her sister properly conditioned. Great, with that settled, let's discuss your daughter's room. Eriku's room? Yes? Of course, since she isn't going to be here, I want you to pack the room up. Leave the bed and sheets. I want all of the clothing and toys packed up. Any photos of your daughter also need to be packed. A courier will be here in two days to pick up the stuff. Once you are done I want the room to feel nice and generic. No personality. Paint it if you have to as well. She nodded. All right. I can do that. The young woman smiled. Great. And don't worry about the stuff you pack. Once the courier collects it the items will all either be sold or destroyed. As for her room. From now on I want you to keep it as a generic bedroom. Even when your daughter returns I want it to stay impersonal like she doesn't really live here. The mother nodded. I can do that. I've already been treating her like an outsider. I don't give her any love either. Just as the caretaker requested. The Anari woman smiled. I can tell your daughter doesn't love you. Just like we wanted. I'm glad. I was able to fulfill your wishes. Anything else we need to discuss? The Anari shook her head. Nope. With that, she stretched, before pulling Erica to her feet, and leading the little girl out of the room. Down a short path to a waiting truck. As they climbed in, she inquired, So your eighth birthday was just a couple days ago. Did you have fun? The girl shook her head. No. Neither Big Sis or my caretaker were here, so we didn't celebrate. I see. That's okay though. It just means we can have more fun at the facility. Erica followed the unfamiliar woman into a room. A strange bed and machine was in the center of the room. The young Anari woman she had shared the truck with had left her with this stranger. A stranger she felt quite trustworthy. The strange woman smiled, if you would please lay down so we can get started. She climbed onto the bed, and inquired, so what are we doing? Playing with your mind, I'm going to suppress your personality and implant a new one. She frowned, my personality, the woman helped adjust her on the bed, and answered. It's basically the part of your mind that makes you, well, you, we just don't need it at the moment, so we are suppressing it in favor of one that will be more cooperative with what we need to do. Erica blinked and nodded. Sounds good, will it hurt? She inquired remembering a procedure done to her the last time she had been here, that one had hurt quite a bit, there will be a little discomfort when the machine interfaces with your mind, after that you will have difficulty recalling things on your own, until we disconnect the machine. Other than that you won't feel a thing. She smiled. Okay. The woman worked swiftly with attaching the device to her head. A moment later her head started to throb for a moment before she started feeling funny. Before she knew it her head felt mushy. When suddenly the stranger asked her a question. Okay. I want you to try and recall your last conversation with your sister. Okay, sweetie. She concentrated trying to bring up the memory. But nothing came to her but smoke. Easily blown away by the winds. She teared up. I can't. It's okay. That is a good thing. It means the machine is working. It is? Yep. Now let me try something. She blinked. Her mushy mind suddenly melted and the world distorted. As she found herself once again with Big Sis, 
It was last year. Sis had come home early for her birthday. Kairu was standing over her with a big smile, her tail moving with excitement. As Eriku held a small box wrapped with a ribbon, she felt her own tail wag a bit, as she shared her sister's excitement. She always loved it when Big Sis came over. Slowly she brought a small hand to the ribbon and pulled it. The ribbon came undone easily, allowing her to lift the lid to reveal a small light blue ribbon. It was a tail ribbon, the one she had shown Big Sis during her last visit two months ago. She smiled. It's that tail ribbon I wanted. You like it? She nodded excitedly, and leapt into her sister's arms, rubbing against her. I love it. Her sister rubbed her head for a moment or two, as young Eriku melted into her embrace. Finally her sister said, Okay, show me your tail. I'll help you put it on. With a smile, she dropped down, turned round and offered Big Sis her tail. In moments she felt her sister's gentle hands wrap around her tail and carefully tie the ribbon around the end. In her mind, she considered this the best birthday ever. It was made extra special since she got to celebrate it with Sis. She didn't get to for the last couple of years, since neither Sis nor her caretaker had been home. Instead, she had been practically ignored, but that was okay. Mom wasn't allowed to love her and she wasn't supposed to love Mom. If either of them showed affection for the other they had to be punished. Thinking of that, she suppressed a shudder as she remembered their yearly ritual. Then she glanced at the table. There was one present left. This one labeled as being from mom and dad. With hesitation, she reached for it and opened the box. With one glance she knew it was from dad. Mom didn't give her gifts but the note was obviously from mom. It read, come see me after your sister leaves. For our yearly session, she cursed in her mind. It was too much to hope that wasn't going to be a thing this year. Her little pussy burned at the thought. Even if she understood the ritual was there to make sure she didn't bond with her mother, she didn't like it. She pushed it aside so that she could enjoy the good times with Kairu. Suddenly the memory dissolves washing away in the mush of her mind. Out of her reach. As the stranger said, Okay looks good. I have full access to your memories. Now let's see about suppressing that personality of yours. In her mushy haze, she barely followed what was going on after that. How long things took, she didn't know. Until eventually, she found herself fully aware of what was going on. As the machine was being removed. She found herself looking through her own eyes, but her body wasn't her own. Eriku stood up on her own, smiled and said, I have full control of the body mistress. What about her old personality? Awake, but has no control. Is that sufficient? Perfect. As long as you have all the control. It doesn't matter if she is awake or not. Come along. It's time to see Rhaenyra. She will likely hurt you on purpose, but she is very good at what she does. Rhaenyra, what are we seeing her for? Growth modification procedure. You remember when we stopped your natural growth? Her body nodded. I do. Thanks again for doing that. Well, now that you are going to be with us for a whole year, hopefully more, we want to get you started on growing again. We are going to start by stimulating your sexual development and inducing puberty. Her body frowned. She wasn't sure either what this was about. Puberty, it's the part of your physical development in which you grow boobs and your body prepares itself to have babies. You're a little young for it, especially considering you are behind on the growth curve, but we need you to be through it as soon as possible for the program. Her body looked down, frowned, then looked up. You mean I will have boobs like Big Sis? The woman gave her a look and said, You aren't supposed to care or like Big Sis like your other self does. She paused, let out a breath, and then sighed. I'll look into that later. To answer the question. Yes you will. She excitedly jumped on her feet. Let's go then. She followed the strange woman into another room, or more accurately her body did. Inside another girl was jumping off a table. With a smile she said. Thanks for the treatment. I'll be checking in with you later to see how you are developing. In the meantime, report to your room to rest. The girl nodded, and headed off. As her body asked, who is that? She will be your roommate. We collected her last week. Her body nodded. Oh, she seemed younger than me. How old is she? What is her name? She turned five today. As for her name, it's not important. You will refer to her when talking to her as subject A98. Okay? In the same way I am subject T5? Yep. Yeah. Heading for the table. Her body asked. So how long is A98 going to be here? Well, like you. There was a complication with separating her from her family, but we managed to arrange for the problem maker to be out of the way for the next seven years on a deep space assignment. Oh? So she gets a full seven years without her family? How lovely. She paused, then said, not seeing big sis for seven years might be a bit much, but I can live with that. 
The woman sighed, E5, why are you so fixated on big sis? You were programmed not to care for her like your other self does. Her body turned around, big sis is big sis, I love her. The woman shrank a little, glanced at the other woman who was presumably Rhinara. That woman, Rhinara, was actively giggling at the moment as well. The other woman asked, E5, sweetie, if we asked you to not speak with big sis for five years would you? Happily, I love her, but serving the mistresses is more important. Doesn't mean I won't miss her though. Rhinara smiled, sounds like some bleed over from the original personality. Perfectly fine seeing as she has the proper priorities. The first in I shifted. This is okay, for now, try to fix it in her future sessions, I will, her body interjected, can we get started on my procedure? The sooner I grow boobs the better right? Rhinara chuckled, a little more complicated than that, but yes, hop up, and we can get started, her body complied, and what followed were a series of injections, each one burned, but aside from that there was no immediately noticeable effect, she slipped off the bed, it had been a couple of months since she got here and A98 was not in the room, personally, she found her rather dull, but her body seemed to like her, oddly she had gotten used to not having any control over what her body did, or rather what E5 did, E5 stretched, before approaching the mirror, reflected was her body, she hadn't grown much taller since she got here, she still looked very much like a younger version of big sis, the biggest change was her boobs, her chest had been completely flat when she got here, and now she had some nice modest swellings, as her body E5 grabbed the measuring tool, she spoke, So Eriku, how are you holding up? With a thought, she focused on replying, Well enough, I miss big sis. I do as well. I hope she is doing well on her assignment. She agreed, not that either of them really knew what she was doing. As E5 started measuring her growing boobies, the pair of them chatted until the door suddenly swung open to admit A98, who was looking a little dazed. E5 blinked and said, Hey. Welcome back. How was your procedure? A98 slumped onto the bed, long. They were thoroughly going through my counterpart's memories. Oh? What for? She smiled. They are archiving all memory of my family. Some recent developments means they think they can keep me longer. Sounds good. I'm jealous. Then her body glanced at A98's younger body. Her boobs had swollen up to be even larger. She had also grown to be nearly the same height. A98 was on an even more aggressive growth regimen. On a different note, how are you holding up? Well enough I guess, my legs ache something fierce, and my new boobies are burning. She sighed, and I need to see Rhinara in an hour for another session, I'm not looking forward to that, neither is my counterpart. She wants to hide in a corner. You are going to go? Of course, just because I don't like it, doesn't mean I won't do it. After all how can I serve the mistresses if I refuse their will over a little pain? Her body giggled as E5 replied, I know what you mean, anyway, do you have any updates for me? A98 nodded, yeah mistress Tarsa wants to see you, she frowned, another mind manipulation session? A98 nodded, yeah they are still concerned about you being too attached to your big sis. E5 sighed, I see, she sighed again, well I better go see her then, can't keep her waiting. With that her body marched out the door, internally she sighed. Some of these procedures weren't that bad, but some were, yet E5 eagerly allowed them to do whatever they wanted to her body, they met Tarsa at the entrance to the mind room, she had been the stranger that had suppressed her and implanted E5 into her mind, E5 smiled upon seeing her saying, I'm told you wanted to see me, yes, I did, get on the table, so that I can start erasing memories of your big sis, she frowned and Eriku felt alarmed, her counterpart also felt alarmed, Yet E5 simply replied with a slight tremble in her voice. Of course, she clambered up onto the table. As Tarsa said, normally I wouldn't bother going this far, but you are simply far too attached to her. I'm hoping that removing all memory of her will help break this cursed blood through. Her body simply replied, I see. It took only moments to hook up the device, followed by the familiar jolt of discomfort before her world became mushy. She could barely think and her memories slipped through her fingers like grains of sand in the wind. Memories slipped in and out of frame, yet she could never hold onto them as they slipped away like smoke. Her very feelings rippled and flowed. How long she was like that, she didn't know. When she came to, the world felt wrong, dark, like all the life was sucked out of it. Tarsa came into view smiling. Okay, I'm done. Now how do you feel? Her body didn't reply, 
Merely stared at Tarsa listless. Eriku after a moment noticed that the normal presence keeping her from acting was no longer there. She could still feel her counterpart, but for once she wasn't suppressed. Yet she didn't feel like replying either. Tarsa's demeanor shifted, yet Eriku didn't bother really paying attention. Instead, she leaned back against the strange bed, not seeing any point bothering to respond. Why bother? There wasn't any light left in her world. At some point, she vaguely became aware of others in the room. There was yelling, and shouting, but none of it seemed really worth paying attention to. She drifted off to wonderful darkness, the only place that seemed safe. If only she could stay. 10. Chapter 100 Distant Bonds She blinked, finding Ranara's face smiling over her. How are you feeling sweetie? She tried to reply, but couldn't. It took her a moment to realize that she no longer had control. By then her counterpart was already responding. Fine. My boobs ache a little though. Don't feel like sleeping forever anymore? She shook her head. No. Good. I'm glad. And how do you feel about Big Sis? I love her. Wish I could see her again. Ranara smiled. I'm glad. Welcome back E5. Why don't you go back to your room and talk with A98? She was worried about you. We won't need you for the rest of the day. I'll see you tomorrow morning for your regular session. Her body nodded. Of course. I'll see you in the morning. With that, she eagerly jumped off the bed and made her way out of the room. Behind her Tarsa spoke up, so um, she will recover, next time you try to do something that drastic, ask. She sighed, well at least we learned something because of this blunder. We did? Yep. Now if you will excuse me I have a report to make. One that will get someone fired. Panic in her tone, Tarsa said, please don't get me fired. It's not you, but don't consider yourself entirely off the hook. I'm demoting you. Congrats you are now my personal test subject. What happened after that she didn't hear, as she left earshot. Yet part of her mentally noted that down. Even as she was mentally reconstructing recent events. Realizing that for a brief moment she had no memory of her sister. Something she found very scary, extremely scary. She didn't want to go back to not knowing her sister. Months later, she lay there staring at the ceiling. Today was her last day in the facility. She groaned as something popped out of her with a wet plop. A second later Rainara's smiling face was above her, that wasn't so bad was it? Her counterpart replied, no, it was much better coming out than going in. Yeah well we had to force your cervix open to get it in, that part is obviously going to be a bit unpleasant. Speaking of your cervix, it might not close for the next few days, I want you to check it regularly and if it doesn't close by the end of the month you are to contact us. Understood? Her counterpart nodded. I understand. But aren't we giving primary control back to Eriku? Ranara smiled. We are. But you will remain able to act. She reached over and produced a tool. Now just relax while I release the suppression. The next few moments were blurry. But next thing she knew it was her in control. Not E5. Ranara gave her a smile. Okay sweetie how are you feeling? She stretched. Good. Great. Now do you understand the instructions I gave your counterpart? She nodded. I do. Good. I want you to allow her to act and perform her duties while you are back home. She nodded. I will. In that case, you better get going. She nodded, and hopped off the table, making her way out of the room where she met A98. The younger girl no longer looked younger, she seemed older now. Not only that, but her belly was swollen. A98 gave her a forced smile. Hey, I wanted to see you before you left. I'm going to miss you. She nodded. I'll miss you as well but it's only going to be a few months before I see you again. She pouted. But it will only be for a few days. Yeah well I can't control the plan. How is your sister doing? A98 shrugged, showing no emotion about her, as she replied. I got a nice letter from her. She is finding her work enjoyable. She sent me date to about a system she visited. Don't really care for the letter do you? She shook her head. Don't really care for sis either, but my counterpart loved it. So there is that. She chuckled, I see. Well it was nice seeing you before I left, but I have to get going. A98 smiled, yeah don't want to be late. See you in a few months. Stepping off the truck, she looked around at the familiar street. It had been over a year since she had last been here. Notably fewer people were out wearing clothes, but other than that it was the same. Ranara had called it her home but frankly, it didn't feel like it. The only good thing about this place were the occasional visits from Big Sis. Sighing, she walked up the steps to the door. All too soon the door opened without her having to knock. Mother stood there and she shrank a little. Welcome back. Go to your room. I'll collect you when dinner is ready. She sighed. At least mom remembered her. 
but it was obviously too much to hope that absence would have allowed her to change. Honestly, she wasn't that surprised. Mom had never been allowed to love her. The two of them had never been allowed to bond and as such, she didn't really love mom either. As she entered, she recalled that her birthday was in a month, a fact that put into perspective how long she had been gone. They had taken her when she had just turned eight and now she was a month out from her tenth birthday. If Kairu's special assignment hadn't come to an end, she would still be at the facility. Recalling A98 she figured if they had known she would be with them that long, they would have filled her with a child too. Instead, she had gotten an egg drainer to collect some of her eggs. In fact, the baby A98 was carrying came from her own ovum. Not that she was supposed to know that. At least the uncertainty of when her sister was coming home was no longer hanging over her. She was looking forward to seeing her, and as she recalled she would be here in time for her birthday. Glancing at her mother, after the door was closed, so about my birthday? Are we still going to be doing that? Her mom chuckled. Do you like me? With all seriousness, she replied, nope, not one bit. Her mom smiled, then I don't think we need to, besides, you are almost ten, no reason to keep going with that ritual, she felt a bit of relief at that. I see. With that the two parted ways, as they began what would prove to be an awkward period in her life. Erica stretched, slipping out of her bed. Glancing around she barely recognized her room, even after being here for a while. It didn't help that all of her old stuff was gone and she hadn't been allowed to personalize the room in any way. Reaching towards her nightstand she plucked a simple teal blue ribbon off the stand. She smiled looking at it. This was the only thing here that felt like it was truly hers. With practiced ease she tied it around her tail. More than happy that she had been allowed to keep this, when everything else she had ever owned was now gone. She didn't really care about the other stuff. Although she did wish she had something to play with during the odd hours. Not that it mattered right now. Today was going to be a big day. Kairu had arrived last night. Mother had put on clothes which felt weird. She had even been required to dress to greet Kairu. At least she had been allowed to go without undies. That would have been even more weird than a dress. Unfortunately Kairu wasn't fully conditioned to ignore nudity yet. So she had to wear a dress. With that in mind, she reached into her closet. There were only a couple of dresses there, all recently provided courtesy of her new caretaker. What happened to the old one, she wasn't entirely sure. The new one seemed nicer and was even someone she knew. The same lady that picked her up two years ago, was now responsible for her while she was here. She slipped on the dress. Then she picked up a small object lying on her nightstand before slipping it into her pocket. She tried not to think about what it was for, but instructions were instructions. Ready for the day she slipped out of the room. She found Kairu in the kitchen, idly chatting with mum. They were catching up on recent events. Smiling, Eriku charged her sister and jumped into her lap, rubbing herself against her sister. Big sis, how are you? I haven't seen you in forever. Kairu smiled. Hey there, Eri. Have you gotten bigger? She nodded happily before pulling down the front of her dress. I even have boobies now like you. Kairu giggled, and pulled her dress up. I can see that. So how have you been? School going okay? She nodded. Yep. I'm getting straight A's, mom chuckled, I'll let you two catch up for a bit, but don't chat too long, remember you are supposed to do that yard today? She nodded, yes mom, I remember, Kairu gave mom a look, isn't she a little young to be doing the yard? Mom smiled, Erica is a big girl now, she can handle a few chores, with that mom left, and Kairu sighed, I'll help you with the yard, okay? She smiled, of course, idly she fingered the object in her pocket, while she changed the subject. So how was your special assignment? Kairu sighed, exhausting. It was only supposed to be a year, but our return kept getting delayed. I was beginning to wonder if I would ever get home to see you. She giggled, yeah, I was too. Idly she rubbed her belly as she thought about that, not that either of them noticed. Instead, she listened intently as Kairu delved into tales of her adventures, all of which she enjoyed with rapture, as she pressed herself against her beloved sister, enjoying every moment of this. Kairu stretched. I guess it's about time we go do that yard. Eriku pulled the object from her pocket and pressed it against Kairu. It is, as she spoke, sorry sis, but I am afraid you need to take a nap instead. Pushing herself off, she turned to see Kairu's glazed eyes fading into darkness. Glancing at the clock, she had a couple minutes, so she stripped herself off, and then rubbed her naked body against her sister, enjoying the feeling for a moment or two. Sighing, she separated moved to the door and glanced out. Mother was waiting, naked as usual. Is she asleep? Erica nodded. Yes, sister is asleep. Good. 
I'll tell the caretaker. With that mum left and she spent the time staying close to Kairu, enjoying her sleeping presence until the couriers arrived to take her away. She did not see her again until the end of the week and the two of them enjoyed a lovely spa trip together. Eriku stretched as they stepped off the shuttle. She smiled when she saw the familiar walls of the facility. It had been months since she had last been here. She was looking forward to seeing A98 again. Behind her a familiar figure stepped off the shuttle, saying, Happy to be back? She nodded, I am. The other place doesn't really feel like home. I don't feel like I am living there. Good. I don't want you to feel at home there. Which is why I drag you back here at any opportunity. Speaking of opportunity, since your sister is off on assignment, you get to stay for a few months this time and not a few days like last time. She smiled happily. I'm so looking forward to that. I am as well. I can't wait to see you finished. She knew what her caretaker meant. Her natural growth had been frozen for years. The only time she ever grew was when they administered her growth treatments. Now that they were going to have her for a few months, they were going to administer the final rounds of growth treatments. She couldn't wait to see herself fully grown as well. Happily she followed her caretaker into the building where she was met by Rainara, who smiled. Ah, welcome back. Now if you would follow me. I'll go ahead and suppress your personality so that E5 can take over. She nodded. Of course. Eriku fell in line and followed her to a familiar room. It had been a while since C5 was in full control of her body, and she was looking forward to it. She knew it was mostly conditioning that made her feel that way, but she wanted her own personality suppressed. As they entered the room, she noticed a familiar face laying on the table. Another scientist was taking mental readings. She spoke up, I'm almost done here. Eric who glanced at the girl on the table. So how is A98 doing? Rainara answered, we are erasing her original personality today. Her sister's assignment ended early and we were successfully able to intercept her, and erase A98 from her memory. That means A98 doesn't need to go home anymore. Eriku blinked. Oh, she doesn't. How nice. Yep, she gets to stay here and be a breeder. Also she will be one of my test subjects from this day on as well. I'm sure she will be quite happy about that. Although it might be interesting for her not having her counterpart. Perhaps, but she is programmed to want her counterpart erased so that she can take over permanently. She will be ecstatic to find that it has been done. Trust me. Silently E5 told her, she will. I'm looking forward to the day that they erase you. For a moment she said nothing before finally replying in the same manner. Strangely so am I. E5 in a happy tone replied. I'm glad. It means the conditioning is working perfectly. Before she could think much longer on her newfound realization that she was looking forward to being erased, Ranara spoke up, speaking of erasing personalities, I would like you and your counterpart to help me with programming K20. K20, who are they? Ranara smiled. Why? They are going to be your sister's counterpart. Once we get her conditioned and out of her current military posting we are going to bring her here to be with you. Big Sis is going to be here? When? In a few years most likely, she frowned, I see. On a different note, how do you feel about her personality being erased and replaced? Big sis is big sis, it won't make a difference. Ranara smiled, I'm glad to hear it. Over by the bed the scientist was unhooking A98 who pulled herself up. She smiled, hey E5, here to have your counterpart suppressed again? Yeah, I am here to be suppressed again. I hear you got your counterpart erased. Excited, she nodded, yep, she is all gone. She paused to run her hands down her body, and this is now all mine, you seem happy, commented Eric who, A98 nodded, of course, my counterpart was erased, I've been looking forward to it for so long, now I don't have to listen to her feelings about how she is missing her silly sister, I never liked that sister of ours anyways, I'm quite glad that we don't have to go home, I get to stay here and be experimented on and used to breed babies. So much better, don't you think? Yeah it's a lot more fun here than it is back home. She paused, well except when sis visits, that is always fun, most of the time anyway. I hate it when they ask me to betray her trust. At least she never remembers it, but I do. A98 giggled, sounds fun actually. I'd love to do just that. A98 sweetie, could you wait outside for a minute? I would like to get started on an experiment with you. As soon as I am done here. A98 smiled, sure. She turned to Eriku. I guess we can finish catching up later. At least then I will be talking to the proper you, and not your counterpart. She smiled. I look forward to it. The suppression took only moments and her body followed Rainara out of the room. 
it felt quite right for E5 to be in control instead of her. A98 greeted them outside the room and the three of them went together to Rhinara's lab. She had nowhere else she needed to be and Rhinara did need to get started on her growth treatments, but first was the experiment with A98. The lab wasn't far so they were there in moments. As they stepped in, Rhinara was talking about the experiment. I've been wanting to do this since your boobs stopped growing. Such large sensitive breasts are perfect for this experiment. Of course I only need the one, but you might look weird with just one. So I'll cut the other one off. When we are done, there is another experiment I'd like to do, but it's best done on a severed breast. A98 tilted her head. One breast? She frowned. Does that mean the experiment is likely to destroy one of my boobs? Destroying your boob is pretty much a requirement for the experiment, said Rhinara as she pulled out a contraption. A clear boob-shaped cylinder with a weird bladed interior. I'm going to turn this on, and you are going to stick one of your boobs in here. A98 winced, as she looked at the contraption. Um? You sure about this? You aren't going to need it and your boobs are too large anyway. Besides, I have a few ideas for replacing them later. Now why don't we get started? Thankfully her body turned away before the experiment began. Moments later she heard A98 screaming as her boob was cruelly shredded by one of Rhinara's devices. She had known that Rhinara could be cruel and often hurt her test subjects, but until this moment she had never seen it. This entire scene clashed with the kind caring image she had of the scientist. When the scream stopped E5 turned around, and they saw A98 with a single destroyed boob, it was bleeding and shredded. The girl was using a laser scalpel on her own breast to remove the remains, while Rhinara jotted down her answers for how it felt, what exactly Rhinara was doing this for, she had no idea. After a moment she helped A98 out before proceeding to slice her other boob off without an anesthetic naturally. A98 twinced as the blade went through her boob, but didn't scream. It was deposited in a special jelly and a topical treatment was applied to the girl's chest. Okay, I will see you later. You can go now. Thanks. A98 gave a wry smile. Glad my boobs were useful to you, mistress. See you later. With that she departed from the room, as Rhinara turned to her. All right D5 let's get your growth treatment done. Then you can go catch up with your friend A98. Her treatment was fairly straightforward. So it wasn't long before she could chase after her friend and her body did just that the moment she was dismissed. The following few months proved to be a lot of fun. Not so much for poor A98 but she too had some fun when she wasn't being experimented on. Before she knew it however she was once more heading home. Something she still looked forward to, the both of them did, since they got to see Big Sis too. Interlude erased. Next, Eriku checked herself over in the mirror. Other than a light blue ribbon tied around her tail she was completely nude, as she often went these days. Even when Kairu visited she went naked these days. Although the same couldn't be said of Big Sis who was very much still wearing clothing. Thinking of Big Sis, she could see her sister in her reflection. She had the same jet black fur right down to the pattern, with only her tail and ears being furred. Long black hair loosely cascaded down her shoulders, it was lush, much like that of Big Sis as well. She had large expressive eyes with the same shade of red her sister had, even shot through with gold like them. They gave her a striking impression, one that was mellowed a bit by her pixie face. Her boobs were about the same size as her sister's, nice and perky with delicate little nipples and a modest pink areola. Her belly was fairly tight and she was toned from regular exercise. Her cute little pussy was hairless. It had nice swollen lips and if she spread it she would have been greeted to a delicate pink interior. Size-wise she was a little smaller than her sister. Standing roughly 10 centimeters below her at 133 centimeters compared to her sister's 147. A fact that wasn't going to change since she was finished growing. They had completed her growth regimen months ago. Along with a few modifications to make her a better breeder, she sighed. Not that she had done much of that. Although her caretaker had told her recently that things were changing and she might soon get to carry a child. Thinking about that stuff reminded her of another thing. So E5? Yes? Mistress said that she wanted to erase me soon. Still looking forward to it? Yep. I can't wait to have you gone. As fun as you are, the two of us can't occupy this body forever. One of us will have to go and that one will have to be you. She nodded. Yeah, I agree. I do need to go. I can't wait for them to erase me either. She paused, then said, although I would like to be there when they implant a big sis with K20. E5 giggled, yet yeah, would be nice to see that together. 
Don't worry about it, though. I will enjoy that for both of us. She smiled, you better. Suddenly there was a knock at the door, followed by her father's voice. Sweetie, the caretaker is here to collect you. She opened the door and was greeted with his familiar naked form. She even noted the device hooked around his swollen penis. Eric who thought it looked painful, but he never seemed to mind. She gave him a quick hug, a kiss and then made her way down the hall. Thanks dad. Love you. Love you too sweetie. How long do you think you will be gone this time? Hopefully I won't be back. That sounds nice. I have something to get. I'll join you in the main room in a bit. With that he moved away, and she continued to the front. Her caretaker was already talking with mum. Eric who smiled. I hear you are here to collect me? The woman nodded. Yep. For good this time. You won't be coming back after today. Great. Her caretaker turned to mum. As usual I want you to forget your daughter exists. Don't worry about her room. A guest will be arriving to use it soon. You will treat her as if she is your own daughter. That girl won't be staying long and will be quickly replaced, but you aren't going to notice that. Every new girl added to the room will be treated like your own, but you will keep the room nice and generic. Understood? Her mom nodded. I understand. Good. Now you have an appointment in a week, for your regular birthing. I want you to have any memories you have left of your daughter extracted while you are there. Okay? Of course. It wouldn't do if I remembered her. Eriku smiled as she listened. When dad entered a moment later he too was instructed to forget her. Erica nodded along happily. It was finally happening. Soon her family wouldn't know she ever existed and since she wasn't coming back they were finally going to erase her. Looks like it's happening. E5. They are going to erase me. Still feeling excited? E5's response was ecstatic. Yes. And I can feel you are too. Of course, I am. As you said earlier there can only be one of us and that one has to be you. Their conversation ended shortly after that. A truck was waiting outside and as they stepped inside, her caretaker pulled from the chair a mind machine interface. Okay sweetie. I know we normally wait for the facility, but it's time for you to be suppressed so that E5 can take full control. She smiled and allowed it to be hooked up to her. So when are we going to erase me? I'm not needed anymore and E5 needs permanent control. Her caretaker beamed. Oh, so you are ready to step aside and let E5 be the permanent owner of the body? She nodded. I am. Glad to hear that. I was worried you two wouldn't want your personality erased, especially seeing as you two seem to have bonded, mostly over your big sister. Even though E5 was supposed to hate her, I know A98 was always annoyed over her counterpart's love for her own sister. She was quite happy that she didn't have to deal with that anymore. Still big sis is big sis. You can't hate big sis, I guess, and you two seem happier with each other, but, she giggled, E5 is fun, but there can only be one of us, we both agree that I have to be the one to go and I'll happily step aside for her, great, that makes things much easier, as for when we are going to erase you, well I figured you two would enjoy one last session together with big sis before we do that, oh that sounds fun, when are we going to see big sis, soon. We are heading to the starport, where A98 will join us before we head off to the new facility. New facility? Yeah we have opened a few new locations and the old one is being retired. Since these new locations, are more secure, we will have much greater control there. As the device was settled over her head, she said, I'm sure Mistress Ranara would love that. Are we going to meet her with A98? No, she is going to a different facility. A98 has been transferred to my care. Her primary role was always to be a breeder and Rhinara already has everything she needed from A98. She smiled, A98 would be happy about that. Moments later she felt the familiar discomfort and mushiness. When the world returned to normal, things felt quite right. As E5 was properly in control again, her first question was an important one. So, mistress, about our sister, who is going to be in control when we meet her? You are. From now on Eric who gets to take a back seat. Not to mention I need to see how well you can function around your sister. Oh? So Eriku gets to stay suppressed from now on until we erase her? Yep. Stepping off the truck she looked around. This part of the port was military. Most of the people here were either naked or in uniform. No one paid them the least bit of attention as they made for the shuttles. Her body took in the sights, noting all the ships moored here and the people. It was rather busy, but her caretaker led the way with surety. It wasn't long before they reached the boarding ramp of a small shuttle. As soon as they entered a familiar voice said, E5, you are coming to the facility as well? She turned to see the familiar form of A98 and she noticed her boobs were back. Well they were much smaller than they used to be, but she had boobs again. You have boobs. Again? She touched them. 
Yeah, Ranara's work, although I don't think she was that happy with them. Said they took far too long to grow, and a dozen other things. Still, I'm glad I have boobs again. It was weird not having them. E5 giggled, yet was weird to look at as well. Anyway to answer the question. Yeah, I am going to the new facility as well. In fact we are going to stay. No more coming back here. A98 blinked. You are. I'm so happy for you. Have they raised your counterpart yet? Not yet. Shame. I was so happy when they raised mine. I don't miss her either. E5 sighed. I figured you wouldn't. You always bemoaned that sister of yours that she so loved and often told me how much you hated that sister. I get the impression you didn't like your counterpart much either. A98 nodded. Yeah I didn't like her much either, as I was supposed to. Unlike you who for some bizarre reason actually loves your sister. E5 excitedly said, well big sis is big sis and guess what? A98 gave her a look. What? We are going to see big sis soon and this time I get to be in charge of the body. I can't wait, you are? I guess you would be happy about that, not sure I would want to meet my sister, in charge or not. I've never been the one in charge, there are so many little things I would love to do, but never could since my counterpart was in charge at the time, it's going to be fun. I see. So how do you feel about your counterpart being erased? Seeing as you seem to actually like her, well she is a lot of fun, but there can only be one of us and we both agree, it is going to be me. At least you got that part right but you didn't answer the question. I'm not going to miss her if that is what you are wondering. I can't wait to have her erased. I can't either, interjected Eriku. Not that A98 could hear her right now, with a smile E5 said, and she can't wait to be erased either. A98 pouted. Ah she can't? I wish mine had been that way. She didn't want to go, actually fought me on that. Unfortunately, the conditioning meant to make her want to be erased didn't take. E5 frowned. I see. The rest of the trip proved to be fairly uneventful. E5 and A98 spent most of it together, chatting and playing games together. While catching up on events, Eriku merely watched it all happen from a bystander's point of view, something she was perfectly happy to do. It felt quite right to just let E5 have control. She was looking forward to her next visit with Sis. This time around she was going to be the bystander and she was looking forward to that. Erica knew it was going to be different since she wasn't going to be in control. Deep down she knew it was going to be perfect and she trusted E5 to handle a meeting with Big Sis. They both loved her, after all. While walking behind Day 98 her body looked around. The place was huge. Above she could see the stars. While all around her were impressive structures that made her think of the city. They had arrived not that long ago at the Star Blossom facility. Apparently, this was an academy focused on training crewmen and officers for the military. It was also going to be where she would meet up with Big Sis. She was going to part ways with A98 before that, as the other girl had an appointment to attend. As she understood the plan, she would meet Sis. The two of them would be allowed to catch up before they moved on to the main bit of the agenda. What that was, she didn't know. The caretaker was cryptic as she wanted it to be a surprise. Eriku was wondering if they were going to implant Sis with K-20. Programming K-20 had been fun and she would love to get to meet her before she had to be erased. Speaking of erasing her, that was the last thing they would do before she left the facility and joined up with A-98. As they reached a door, A-98 turned back with a smile. Okay E-5 this is where we part ways. Talk to you later. Her body smiled, see you later. Good luck with your appointment. A98 smiled, thanks. Have fun with your sister. Before running off for whatever her appointment entailed, neither she nor a Lee 5 knew what that was and D5 had never bothered to ask. As A98 left, her body walked up to the door and headed inside, where she was soon greeted by nurses and escorted through a maze of corridors into another room. As she entered the first thing she noticed was the presence of her sister. For once she was probably naked as well. E5 smiled and rushed her, tackling her while saying, Big sis, Kyrie ruffled her hair, Eric good to see you. How have you been? Still doing good in school? E5 nodded. I'm doing quite well. She paused, pressing her boobs against Kairu's, and looking up at her face with a smile. I'm not sure when we will get to see each other again. I'm moving out. Oh? You are? Where? The Anari are taking me to a facility where they have complete control. I won't be staying with mom and dad anymore. She smiled and rubbed her belly. I'm going to be a breeder. Kairu frowned. Oh, you are? Aren't you a little young to be having kids? Sure am. But my body is fully grown now. Only reason I haven't had a kid yet is you. Kairu scratched her cheek. Me? Shifting her posture. She nodded yep. But that's okay. Kairu frowned. 
So how am I the reason you haven't had one yet? She giggled, well you are always having trouble accepting an IRI conditioning. Because of that I couldn't stay solely at the facility and had to come home to be with you. I loved every minute I was with you though, so it was all good. You did? She murmured in affirmative. I did. I'd love it if you came to the facility with me. Anyway, enough about that. I haven't seen you in weeks. Can we just catch up? What have you been up to lately? Kairu sighed. I'd much rather be on the border right now. Tensions with the early confederated systems arising. Rumor has it we will be at war in the next six months to a year. I've heard stories of skirmishes on the border already. Instead, I am here. E5 frowned. I see. So why are you here? Kairi lit up. I've been promoted. So officially I am here to receive additional training on the newer ship classes. In reality, I am mainly here for additional conditioning and to be sterilized. Normally a quick procedure is done. But E5 shifted to get a look at Kairu's exposed pussy. You were fitted with an egg drainer? Kairu winced. Yeah, I was. E5 nodded. Yeah they aren't that pleasant going in. That cervix soap in especially hurts. Thankfully it's quite pleasant coming out. Kairu nodded. I know. They removed it about an hour before you came in. Fingering her sister's pussy she asked, may I? Kairu giggled, um sure. E5 pushed her fingers in, finding the warm folds parting easily for her. Quickly she found her way all the way up. Sure enough she could feel her sister's cervix was quite open. She pulled out after just a moment, and looked up. So did you enjoy being drained? Kairu blushed. Strangely I did. I felt weirdly nice as the device worked my eggs out. Her expression shifted, not so sure I like being sterile. At least I'm not going to remember that. Anyway, enough about that, can we talk about something more fun? E5 nodded, sure. With that, the two transitioned into idle chatter and touching. E5 being even more touchy than Eriku would have been. Without a word, Eriku simply watched and let E5 have her fun. This was really more of E5's moment anyway and she was just a bystander. Still. She felt quite happy about this and it made her feel even better about her choice. E5 was going to do just fine without her. Suddenly the door opened, and a nurse popped her head in. Okay, you two, we are ready for your procedure. E5 looked up. Procedure? The nurse didn't reply. Kairu did. Yeah, we are going to carry each other's babies. It's why the egg drainer had to be removed today. In fact they had to drain me faster than they would have liked to stay on schedule. E5 winced. I see. Then her face brightened. I'm getting a baby. I can't wait to carry your kids. Kairu smiled as the pair of them followed the nurse out of the room and down the hall. The procedure was quick, painless and efficient. They didn't get to interact much more after that. As they were led down to extraction, the pair stepped into the extraction room with a nurse. Why Kairu was here Eriku didn't yet know. Neither did her counterpart E5, as they had not been told. The nurse smiled. All right Kairu if you would please sit down so that we can get started. Kairu complied while inquiring, what are we doing? Neither of you will be able to see each other for a few years. As such, we are going to erase every little memory you have of Eriku. E5 frowned. Big Sis isn't going to remember us? Nope. We can't have her knowing you exist. Not right now, but we are archiving the memories first. So we can restore the memories later. E5 lit up. That's great. As Kairu settled into the seat, she was quickly restrained. As for you, just wait nearby. Once we are done with Kairu, we are going to move on to erasing your original personality. Okay? Kairu suddenly jumped in the restraints. What do you mean you are going to erase little Eric? The nurse put a tentacle on Kairu's head and started to rub. She kept struggling for a couple of minutes before her eyes started to glaze. As she calmed the nurse said, just what I said. We are going to erase her original personality. That way her condition one can take over full time. We are also going to archive her memories and erase anything she doesn't need to know. If you are worried she is going to forget you. However, don't be. We plan to let her remember you. By this point, Kairu was quite relaxed and it took only moments to get the machine attached to her head. E5 watched as Kairu's memories of her played on the monitor as they systematically erased them from her mind. A process that took hours. During it Eriku decided to try chatting with E5, but she wasn't interested, so they watched together in silence. All the while she was aware that the moment of her own erasure was coming closer. It would not be much longer before she no longer existed, and E5 would take her place. Some part of her told her she should be terrified of that, but she wasn't. As she continued to feel that only one of them could stay and she was the one that had to go, 
so instead she was growing excited. Finally after hours of watching Kairu's memories, Kairu was let off the chair. A nurse came to collect her and E5 sat into the chair. Eriku felt a spike of excitement as the machine was fitted around her head, followed by the familiar ache and mushiness. Then suddenly the world flared into life as her memories flashed before her. They moved past at a rapid pace as they mixed together with memories that weren't hers. No. Instead they were clearly E5's including memories from when E5 had control while she was asleep. The memories swirled and drifted together as she was adrift on the river of memory. Something changed as new thoughts swirled into her own. They mixed and separated, blurring endlessly as she lost all track of what was going on. Yet some part of her felt distressed. Something was wrong. Erica knew it. She wasn't slipping away like smoke. E5 wasn't taking over. She could feel E5 feeling the same thing, thinking the same thing. Also equally alarmed, but she wasn't slipping away either. Neither of them was taking over, but before they could really process it, they were once again swept together down the river of memory. She blinked. The nurse moved over her. How are you feeling E5? She groaned. I, um, three. End of block three.